The coding question for this lecture is about symmetric pairs. First, I'm going to explain the problem. For our input, we have a tuple with integers 1 and 2. We have two numbers here. In our next tuple, now let's look at our next tuple. We have 3 and 5. And next we have 4 and 7, then 5 and 3. This 5 and 3 is symmetric to this 3 and 5. Looking at our input from the front, we have this 3 and 5. When we get to this 5 and 3, the symmetric pair, then we include this in our list for our output. That's what we want to be able to do. Next, we have 7 and 4. The symmetric pair is this 4 and 7. So when the 7 and 4 appear, we want the 7 and 4 tuple to appear in our output. And please note for the output, you don't have to put it as a list. For example, you could create a generator using yield. The answer just needs to identify the tuple when a symmetric pair appears. This problem is easy to solve, but you have to think about how to approach this problem. For example, in the input, we have 1 and 2 for our first tuple. Let's use 1 as our key and 2 as our value. Then, same with this 3 and 5. 3 is the key and 5 is the value. When we look at all of these using our for loop, we have 5 and 3 here. This 3 on the right side of our tuple we have to check if it's in our dictionary, and if so, is the value 5. If so, then that means that that is the symmetric pair. Now that we've discussed the approach, let's get to writing the code. We'll start with from typing import then list, and when we write our output, we want to use yield, so we'll say iterator this time, and we want to return tuple. That's how we'll import, and now we'll write def find pair, the input is pairs, and then list. We'll refer to the tuples inside this list. So we'll say tuple, and inside the tuple, we have two integers. We'll return iterator, which will contain tuples with two integers, so int and int. So that is our function. And now to our hash table. So we'll prepare our dictionary with the name cache, and first we'll use a for loop to identify each tuple. We'll say pair in pairs to pick up the tuples from the pairs. Once we do that, we'll refer to the first integer in the tuple as first, and then the second integer as second. We'll refer to the first as pair zero, meaning the first integer in the tuple, and the second as pair one. On to our next step. For example, we have one and two as our input here. We'll say cache get, and then second. This will check if what is the key for this tuple is included in our cache. At the beginning, we don't have anything, so the return value is none. In that case, we'll say if not value. Then our key will be this first in this cache, and we'll put the value as second. So going back to this cache, this cache includes the key as one and the value as two. That's what's included in the cache right now. We'll repeat the process, and now we're focusing on 3 and 5. So the second, we have to look at whether we have the key for this or not. This is 5, and there's nothing in our cache where the key is 5. So in that case, key is 3 and value is 5. Moving along, we have 4 and 7. We'll repeat the process and include 4 and 7. Next, we have tuple 5 and 3. Our second number here is 3. Let's look at this value equals cache get second. Key is 3 and value is 5. This will meet the condition, so for this value, 5 will be used. This if statement won't apply, so at this time, we have to check if the values are symmetrical or not. To do that, we'll write l if value and then see if it's the same as first. This first refers to this 5, this 5, and the cache value here of 5. If these two are the same, that means that it's symmetrical. So we'll write yield pair. Now our code is complete. And let's confirm if our code works by writing if name underscore underscore main underscore underscore. This is our list and we'll just copy and paste this here. Then save find pair and include L. This will return in generator, so we'll use for loop. R will be our output, and we'll print R and run the code. 
Now you see on the right side that we have the set of numbers 5, 3, 7, 4. We've just confirmed that we have symmetrical pairs as our results, which match the output here. We've just confirmed that our code here works fine. This coding question is one of the easier problems. Problems of this level can be solved using cache and hash tables. For problems where you look at the list from the beginning and try to find a symmetric pair, hash tables work very well. So this is one type of problem you may be asked during an interview question. So practice if needed so that you'll be able to answer problems similarly. First, let's go over the coding question. Here we have x and y for our input. We want to make our function where we input two lists, x and y. And about this x and y list, we have integers that have randomly been selected. These numbers can be in any order, but to make it easy to understand, I've ordered them from least to greatest. You see that the input and output results are different. For the output for x and y, we have these lists where certain numbers are eliminated from our input. The criteria for elimination requires comparing the input for x and y. For example, we have 1, 2, 3 as our input for x. This 1, 2, 3 isn't included in our list for y. No action is necessary. That's why 1, 2, 3 is included here. Then for the 4, we do have a 4 in our y list. We see that we have two 4s in our x list and one 4 in our y list. We want to eliminate the number that appears the least in our list. So for the output for y, this 4 is eliminated and we start off with 5, 5, 5. If the same numbers exist in both x and y, then we eliminate that number that appears the least. Think of it as a card game. The person who has more cards with 4s can keep holding on to these cards. The person with the fewer cards with 4s will lose these cards. So if you think about it this way, let's think about the 5. We have 5 here and 5 here on the other side too. We have 2 5s on the left side and 3 5s on the right side. So for this output for x, 5 does not appear. And we'll do the same for 8. We have only 1 8 in the x and for y we have 2 8s. There's more 8s in our y, so y keeps the 8s, but for our x, 8 is eliminated. Now looking at our 10, we have 1 10 and 1 10 here. In that case, no action is necessary. There's no elimination. Now let's get to writing the code. We'll start with from typing import, then list. Then we'll name our function min count remove. First, x contains a list with integers. Then y also contains a list with integers. For our output, we'll say none. We'll be rearranging the integers within x and y. So return value is zero. How do we approach this? First, we have to count the numbers of that particular integer that are included within our list here. We'll do this by referring to our dictionary and looking at the key value. For example, you want to know how many fours we have. We'll make our key four and make our value two. We'll write this quantity of a number we have as our value. Then after that, we look at the x and y and see which one has the lesser number for the value and eliminate the integer with the lesser number for the value. So let's get to writing the code for this. First, we'll write count x and create a dictionary. Same with count y, we'll create a dictionary. Then we'll use for loop and we want to get the integers inside the x list. Then we'll write count x. For example, we have at the very beginning this one. We want to put the value for when the key is 1, so we'll put that in here. And then we have count x, get, and get the 1, or if that's not possible, then 0, then plus 1. And this way we'll be able to count. We'll repeat the process for y. We'll change this to y and this also, and this part too. Now that we've gotten this far, we'll run the code and print. So we'll write if name underscore underscore main underscore underscore then our min count remove from above for example for x we'll copy and paste our list for x and for the y we'll do the same we'll just copy this and paste then we'll pass the x and y and going back up 
We have this count x and y. We'll print this for count x and also for count y. And we'll run the code now. Then we see on the right side the counts of our integers in our x list. For example, we see that we have one of one, two, three, and then two fours. We see here we have one one, two one, three one, and four two. It's counted properly. We have two fives and one eight, one ten. Back to our result, we have two fives, one eight, and one ten. We've counted the numbers properly. In this first step, we've successfully counted the number of times an integer is used in our dictionary. Regarding this approach for counting, you don't have to do it exactly this way. You can say from collections and import, then counter. I'm going to show you how to count using this counter now. We'll say counter x and then counter x, meaning you're going to put the entire x list here. Then repeat for y. We'll copy and paste and replace x with y. Then we'll print and say counter x and also counter y. When we run this code, we see in our counter object on the right two fours, two fives, and for the remaining integers, we counted one each. From our y list, we found three five, two eights, and one four, one six, one seven, and one ten. We were able to confirm that these numbers were counted correctly. So you see that if we insert the list directly into the counter, we'll easily see the counts for each number. This is just another option. Now we need to see if the numbers in counter x are also included in counter y. To do this, we'll use a for loop to pick out the key and value from our x. Key x and value x. We'll pick these out from our counter x, then items, then we'll look at counter y. We'll say get key x and pick out the value. This will be value y. So what does this all mean? Looking at the counter for x, the key is 4 and the value is 2. The key is currently this 4. Then in our y list, we need to see if we have a 4 as our key. If we do, then we need to pick up this value, which is 1. So for this value y, it should be 1 right now. Here to the right, we have key 1 and value 1. If we're searching with this key of 1, the key being 1 is not found in our y list, so in that case, this value y returns none. Next, we'll look at if we do have value y. So we'll say if value y, let's refer to our example. In this case, let's look at this 4. We also have a 4 in our y list. We have this 2 and 1, and we have to compare to see which one is greater. To do that, we'll compare value x and value y by saying if value x is smaller than value y, then we need to eliminate the key for this from the x list. We'll say x and we're going to rearrange the list. So we're going to use list comprehension and write i for i in x if and then include only if i is not the key for x. This may be difficult to understand, so let me explain further. For example, in our x list, we're going to eliminate the two fives since we have three fives in our y list. We need to eliminate these two, so we're going to use list comprehension to look at the numbers from the front of the list using our for loop. We're going to create a list containing the numbers where the key is in 5. We're going to skip these two 5s and take the remaining numbers using list comprehension. With this x, we're using slice and rewriting the content of our list. We are picking up the numbers all except for the 5. Now we're going to repeat the process but for the other side. So l if value x is greater than value y. I'm going to copy this top portion and replace this with y. Same here. And now let's run this. I'm going to make this easier to understand by writing print x equals x and then print y equals y. Then after this min count remove, we want to see our results for x and y, so we're copying and pasting the two lines. And now we're ready to run our code. We've run our code and we see the results on the right. We have our initial list for x and y. Here for x, we have two fours and for y, we have one four. The two fours for x will remain and the one for y has been eliminated. Now to the five. We have two fives and three fives for the y. In our x list here, we don't see any fives. In our y list, we see three fives. 
Now to our eight, we have one eight in our X and two eights in our Y. The eight here in our X list will be eliminated. So the eight doesn't appear in our X list. And then to 10, 10 appears once in both the X and Y. We see that in both lists here, 10 appears once. So we've confirmed that our code here does work. The key point here with this code is this section regarding count. If you know how to use counter collection, you can simply insert the list here and it'll quickly calculate the counts. You may be told that using counter isn't allowed in some cases. So in that case, you'll have to write the code the normal way like this to count. And also regarding this section right here, in order to eliminate the two fives, from our X list, we use list comprehension, but there is a Python method called remove. We'll say X remove and then five. This will remove a five, but it only removes the first five and not all the fives. So it would be this five in this case. If you want to remove all fives from the list in Python, it is common to use list comprehension like this to eliminate numbers. Knowing how to write this may be useful for answering coding questions, but just in general. First, let's go over our problem. This time, we're going to use cache function to implement decorator. Let's go over what this means. Python 3 already has decorators. For example, we can write from func tools import lru cache. There's already decorators like this, and for this problem, we want to create something like this. And this is just an example, but let's say we have a function called long func and input integers for our argument. For our return value, we'll also say int. Let's just simply store zero in R and run a loop with four I in range and run the loop, let's say 10 million times. Then we'll just take num and multiply I and add it. We'll return R. So this is a function that will take a long time to run. To get a better understanding of how long this takes, let's see what this code does. I'll write if name underscore underscore main and print long func one. We see our results on the right side with this very big number. To make this easier to understand, let's add four i in range and say to run the loop 10 times. We'll input i instead of one and run our code. And when we do, we see that our first value is zero, followed by other values that take time to be displayed. And now we finally have all our results displayed. And regarding this code, we aren't implementing the caching as a decorator function. So if you run this an additional 10 times, the time it takes to process the code doesn't change. To look at this further, let's import time up here and down here, store time, time, and start. We'll print time time minus start and then run our code and when we run our code the first time around just like before it takes time to process and display our results but also for the second time around which starts from this zero it takes time to process and display our results our processing time is displayed here as 7.2 so it takes a long time to run this code this time though, we want to use LRU cache and use this func tool as our decorator. We'll include LRU cache here and run our code one more time. As you see on the right, the first time around, it takes time to display our results. But the second time around, it's quick. Our processing time for this is 2.4. This shows that for the second time around, the code is run quite quickly. So getting back to the main problem here, the problem is to create a decorator that can run something like LRU cache. This LRU cache here, this caching strategy makes it possible to discard the least recently used items first. You can also specify the max size. But for this problem, we don't have to implement the detailed cache properties. The problem here is to simply implement caching and if that hits, quickly return results. Our goal is to create a cache decorator like this. Now that we've gone over the problem, let's start writing the actual code. Here we'll delete this LRU cache along with this import statement. First, we want to create a decorator. For this, we'll write def memoize f. Memoize is a term that Python users often use before, but now we have a way of caching like LRU cache, so this type of caching isn't that often used now. Here, let's write def wrapper and let's create a simple decorator. Here we'll include n as a variable 
and pass in to our function. We'll return this and then return wrapper. And for those of you who aren't familiar with decorators, let's make it easier to understand by writing def test n and then print test. As a decorator for our function, let's write memoize that we used above. This is all we have to do. Let's make this easier to understand by going above return wrapper and print before. Here we want to store our results in R and then print after. Then we'll return R. After completing this, we'll go down below and print test and let's say 10. Let's comment out the bottom section now and then we'll run our code. When we run our code now, we have before displayed followed by test, after, and this test here. There's no results returned, so that's why none is displayed. And now you see that we were able to implement wrapping. When you want to implement this function, but want to process data before or after that, you can use this type of decorator. If you use this memoize properly, you'll be able to implement caching. Now let me erase print before and also print after and also the test function. So the question is, how do we implement cache? In this function, we create a hash table using a dictionary. In this function, we want to run it, but want the results to be stored inside cache. Then we can just refer to that for the second time around. Now let's get to writing this. First, we'll say if n not in cache. This means if n isn't in cache, we'll run this function. Once we run it, then we take the results and store it in cache n. Then we'll return cache n. If our cache is empty, then we'll arrive at this cache n, run our long func, and the result of this will be returned here. This result will be stored in cache. For example, let's say we have a value 10. When we place the 10 here, the results of this will be stored in cache 10. We'll be returning the results of that cache 10. At this point with our if statement, if our cache isn't empty, we don't have to run this function again, but just return the results of the cache. So this is the solution to our problem for this lecture. It's pretty simple. We'll include memoize above our long func, and that's it. Now that we've gotten this far, let's just uncomment the selected lines and run our code. At first, we see the results are being displayed slowly, and before it took about 7 seconds to return our results without cache the second round. But this time, the results are quickly displayed and it says it took 2.69 seconds. The processing time for the second round is much faster. By using memoize, the runtime for the second round and on was much faster. This is just interesting information that may not be one of the key questions on an interview quiz, but just good to know in general. This tests you on whether you understand how to use a decorator and implement caching techniques. For those of you already familiar with decorators and caching, this content may have been very easy to understand. First, let's go over our problem. For example, we have for our input, this is a pen, this is an apple, apple pen. We want to achieve the character that is used the most often in our string and also count how many times that character appears. For our output, we have here p and 6, meaning that p appears the most number of times in our input and appears 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times. Compared to our other characters, p appears the most number of times, and that's why we have p and 6 as our output. Also, as you see here, we have lowercase a and uppercase a. Whether it's lowercase or uppercase doesn't matter for this problem. We'll recognize it as one character. We also have space here. The space isn't a letter, so we don't count it. Also, we have a period, which is a punctuation mark, so for this problem, we won't consider it as a character. This is also detailed too, but we have p and 6 here. Let's say a is also 6. All we care about is what the max number is, so we just want the letter that appears the most number of times to appear. There may be cases where there's multiple letters that appear the same number of times, but for this problem, we'll just ignore this. Please note that this problem isn't one that tests you on performance, but it's a problem to test whether you know data structures and libraries. Now that we've covered the basic information we need for our problem, let's get to writing our code. First, we'll say def count chars v1. 
Here we'll be introducing our first solution to the problem. We'll store strings for our input and our return value will be a tuple. So we'll say from typing import tuple. Our return value will contain string and we want to see the number of times a letter appears, so we'll say integer. For problems that involve counting, using dictionary and hash tables is the common method, but first let's come up with a solution without using dictionaries. Let's get started with this and first we'll say strings. This string contains both lower and uppercase, so we'll use lower method to make all letters lowercase. This is a simple line, but it tests you on whether you know this method or not. Next, we'll say for chart and strings to pick up each characters in our string. First, we'll focus on writing the statement regarding spaces. We'll say if not char, and here we'll introduce a method called isSpace. This means if a value is in a space, we'll count it. Being familiar with this isSpace method is also useful. For our first step, we're looking at each letter individually. So our first letter is this T. This T isn't a space, so we want to count how many times T appears in the string at this time. For this, we'll say strings count. There's already a method called count that will count the number of times a character appears. That's it. And all we have to do is pass in our results, so we'll create an empty list called L and use append. When we return, we want a tuple, so we'll make this a tuple. Our first letter is T, so we calculate how many times it appears and include that in our list. With what we've written so far, let's write print L and see what we have so far. We'll say if name underscore underscore main. Within this, first we focus on S for string. We'll copy and paste our input from above. We'll pass in our s to our function above and then run our code. And when we run it, we see that in our list, the letter t appears two times. h appears also two times. We see that each character is displayed along with a count. Once we've gotten this far, we want to look at this list and within this list, find the letter that appears the most number of times in our input. Looking at these results, we can already see our answer, p and 6 but we want to achieve this data using our code. So how will we do that? We'll do that by using a max function. So I'm going to say return max L. For our key, we want to count the right value in our tuple. So to do this, we'll use operator item getter. So above, we'll first import operator. Then down below, we return to our key and include operator, and a method called item getter. We're looking at the counts in our tuple, so we'll pass in 1. Let's see how this code will run. So we'll go down and we'll print, and when we run our code, we see on the right P6. This is the solution for our V1, and this tests you on whether you know how to use item getter and max. That may be one of the key points for this problem. And regarding this operator item getter, some people may not be familiar with this, so let me open up my terminal here and explain a little more. We'll import operator and then write operator item getter one. Think of this as a function. We have this function and for the argument, we include a tuple. For example, let's put p and six. When we run this, then six is returned. Now this time, let's use zero for our operator item getter. So let's rewrite this one to zero. Just like before, we pass in our tuple as our argument and this time we return the results p. Regarding this max and as to what key we look at to compare the values, we pass in the function for operator item getter as our key and inside standard libraries max, we use this function's result to see which character appears the most number of times and return results accordingly. Being familiar with these methods here are useful too. Another thing to note is that we have these four lines. You may be asked to write these four lines using list comprehension during an interview. And let's work on this from now. For our list comprehension, we want to create a tuple inside our list. We'll do this by saying C, then strings count C. Then for C in strings to retrieve our characters, and if not C is space, 
Let's run our code with this. And when we do, we see on the right side, our results, P and 6. We see that what we did in these four lines is possible to do with just this one line. So this is another approach you can take. And next, let's use a dictionary. We'll copy this. And this time, we'll name our function as v2 for version 2. First, this line regarding lower cases can stay as is. And next, onto our hash for dictionary. We can declare our dictionary in this way. Or you could say d equals dict and declare dictionary like so. As an example of an incorrect way, if you write 2 and then 2, if you write numbers like so, we'll rewrite the bottom print to v2 and include print d. We'll also include type d. When we run our code with this, we see on the right side the number 2 and then the word set. There are cases where our sets are created. If using this dictionary, then we need to place a colon in between the two numbers. When we run the code, we now see 2 and 2 and class dict. There may be times where instead of a colon, maybe a comma is used just by accident. And in this case, you'll end up with a set being returned. So just be careful of this. Now returning to how to declare a dictionary. There are some who write it this way and heavy Python users may tend to write it this way with an empty dictionary. So when you're declaring a dictionary, please be careful to not create a set. And now continue on. Now we're going to say for char in strings and retrieve each character. Then we'll say if not char is space to note that we want to run the code if the character is in a space. And continuing on, we'll store our character in key in our dictionary. And then we need to count. And at first, there's nothing inside it. So first, we want to confirm if our character is already in our dictionary. If it's not included in our dictionary yet, we'll return none. So as a default, we want to include 0. We include 0 and then add 1. Let's see how this works by writing print d. When we run our code with this, we see on the right hand side, t is 2, h is 2, i is 4. This plus 1 here is counting how many characters we have. When we look at this, we have p and 6, so we can say that this code is working properly. We also want to count what's included in d here. This time, for this we'll say max key. We want to use our max and pass in our dictionary. What does key do? This is saying that this dictionary's value can be obtained by this key's dget. So refer to this to count for our key. And our results are passed to this max key. This section for key is returned in this max. Now all we have to do is return max key and d max key to return our tuple. Now we're going to run our code. And when we do, we see on the right, p and 6. So writing the code like this also works. During an actual coding interview question like this, using dictionaries and hash tables can make the code process quicker. So using this version is more common. And regarding this code, this d get char 0 plus 1 section, does it look that organized? In Python, there's another way to write this. You could say from collections, import, counter. Using counter will make your code look cleaner. I'll copy this v2, and then down below, I'll create a v3 for this. This will be our version 3. After declaring an empty dictionary, we want to say counter and use the collection counter. This, as a default, 0 is already included by default, as our value for key. So all we need to do is say plus equals 1 here. And down below, we'll rewrite v2 to v3 and run our code. On the right, we see the same results printed as before. An interview question like this can also test you on whether you know how to use library. If you can write your code like this, that's great. There are also many other possible solutions. So the purpose of this question is not whether you know how to write it a specific way, but it's a test on whether you're familiar with this or is space lower and max. And up here, we have item getter. The purpose of other interview questions 
Two, may be to see how familiar you are with Python codes. Questions like these are easy to answer, but it does provide the interview with an assessment of your Python skills. First, let's go over our problem. We have an integer value inside our list. When we add one to this integer, we get the result two. This is a value inside our list, so we want to return value as an integer. That's our problem. When we look down below, we have two and three listed. Please think of this as the number 23. When we add one to 23, we get this two and four, meaning 24. We want to think of these numbers as one value. So two is the tens digit, and then this four is in the ones digit. We want to think of the values in this way and return value of 24. In our next list, we have eight and nine. When we add one to 89, we get 90. So that's why we have nine in the tens digit and a zero in the ones digit. We're working with a list here. So this number corresponds to index number zero and this zero corresponds to index number one. We'll rewrite this as an integer and return value of 90. Now looking at this nine and nine, so this refers to 99. We add one to this and get the result one, zero, zero. And that's why our output is 100. The concept is the same for when we have three digits. We have one, two, three, add one, we get one, two, four. With seven, eight, nine, we get 790, returning value of 790. When we have 999, we add one and get 1000, returning value of 1000. When we have 9999, we add one and get 10000, returning value of 10,000. And now if we have zero as the leading values in our list, followed by 9999, when we add one to 9999, we get the result 10,000, which is 10000, returning value of 10,000. And please note the leading zeros are removed. And now that we've covered the problem, let's get to writing our code. One condition I want to add on to this is for this problem, please don't try to write the code by first converting integers into a string. For example, let's say we have a list containing one, two, three. I want to show you this with a print statement using list comprehension. These are integers and we want to change them into a string. Then we say for i and l. Let's run our code and our results are shown as a string. This results in a string, so we use the join method to join the numbers. We'll write join here and return our code. We get the value one, two, three. So our elements are joined. Now one more step. We want to convert this into an integer. When we do, we get the result 123. And to this integer, we want to add one. Let's run our code and we get the value 124. So as you see here, it's possible to solve the problem by converting the integers with this one line. But for this problem, please don't try to solve it this way. For this, please refer to the list and here, our last integer is nine. We add one to this, then add another one here. You could use a while or a for loop, but please refer to the contents inside this list to add values. So the idea is to write a code as if you're actually going to be doing the calculation by hand. So the solution here, we're going to comment out since we're not going to use this. Let's start by writing from typing import and we want to import list. Now we want to name our function list to int plus one. For our parameters, we'll have a list containing integers. So we'll say numbers, then list int. And then for our return value, we want an integer, so we'll write int. Now, how would we approach this problem? For example, let's say we have a list with six, eight, three. The index number for this would be zero, one, and two. We need to look at the last index number, so think of this as simple addition. The last number in our list is three, so we add one and get four. That means we get six, eight, four. There's no carrying over the one to the next digit, so this is fine as is. Next, let's say we have the integer seven, eight, nine. Our index number for this is zero, one, two. When we add one to nine, we get 10. When we get 10, then we make this zero and we add one to index number one. So eight plus one is nine, so this will be nine. The idea behind this addition is the same as when you add by hand. We'll solve our problem like this and let's say we have the numbers nine, nine, and nine. When we add one to this nine, we get 10. So we'll write a zero here. 
Then to this 9, we add 1, and we get 0 again. We add 1 again, and we get 10. When our first index number results in 10, then only at this time, we need to return 1 here. So let me write 1, and then at the end, add a 0. This would result in 1, 0, 0, 0. And this is the same as when you do normal addition by hand. The key point here is first we're looking from the back of the list. When doing this, we can use a while loop and start looking from the back. Now that we've covered the approach for this, let's get back to writing. We want to achieve the last index number, so we'll say len numbers, and then subtract 1 to get our last index number. And then to our numbers i. Numbers i is the last index number, so we'll add 1 to this. Then we'll work our way until the first index number, so we'll run the loop while this index number is greater than 0. We'll say i minus equals 1, and then be able to run our loop from the back to the front. First we'll say if numbers i, which refers to the last number. We want to check on this number, and if it isn't 10, we'll be done, so we can break. At this time, we can return numbers. This time, we want to return list and not integers. We want to check what we have so far. So let's write if name underscore underscore main, and our function name is list to int plus one. Here, let's include the number one. When we do and include print to run our code. Let's run our code, and when we do, we get two as our result. We have break here. But let's see what happens when we have a zero as the leading number. When we run our code, we get the result zero two. So before breaking, we need to remove this zero. To remove the zero, let's add another function right above our list to int plus one. And for this, let's name this remove zero. We'll pass in list with integers as numbers and output is going to be none. So no return value. If our numbers isn't an empty list, then we check to see if our leading value is zero. If it is zero, then we remove it by using pop. This can be used to remove the leading zero. The rest will use recursion and look at numbers to remove zero. And going down below, in our list to int plus one, we'll include a line for remove zero numbers here. And now that we've gotten this far, we'll run our code again. And down below, we have 0, 1. Our result is now showing 2. And this time, let's try adding another 0. So we have 0, 0, 1. And when we run our code, we get the result 2, which is exactly what we want. And before writing more codes, we're going to bring what we've written so far towards the top. And this time, we'll need to address the situation where our last index number results in a 10. For example, if we have 7, 8, 9, and then we add 1, we get 7, 9, 10. At this time, what do we do? In this situation, we are going to say numbers i, the last index number, and store 0. We say numbers i minus 1, and then add 1 to this. Let's confirm what this does. We'll include the numbers 7, 8, 9 into our list here, and then run our code. And when we do, we get the result 7, 9, 0. So this is properly working. Now let's change our 10's digit to 9. When we run our code, we get the result 8, 0, 0. This is also correctly displayed. Now let's change our first digit to 9. Now when we run our code, we get the results 10, 0, 0. This is because we specified in our while loop that we'll run this until we reach index number 0. In this case of 999, the first index number will change to 10 and we finished at that point. We have to focus on this situation now. For this, we're going to be using a while else statement. We'll write else here. And when we don't break from this while loop, meaning when we reach index number zero with this, at this time, we'll say if numbers. If the leading number zero has a value of 10, then our leading numbers will return value of 1. And using numbers append, we just add on 0. That's all we have to do. And we'll run our code with this. When we do, we get the results 1000. We are able to confirm that our result is displayed properly. 
this section where we're calculating is working properly and all we have to do is focus on these numbers. Right now, we're returning a list, so we want to convert this list into a number. For this, we'll add this section with a new function called list to int, and for our argument for numbers, we'll pass in a list with integers and return integers. We'll want to do this too without converting the integers into a string. So what does this mean? For example, we'll again write str for string for i in numbers. Then we'll use the join method to join and make it into an integer. So we'll include int and then return. We have our function name here and at the bottom of our return statement, we'll rewrite this to list to int numbers and run our code. And when we do, we get the results 1000 and it's properly displayed but we want to write a code that doesn't use a string to solve this problem. This section isn't that difficult either. For example, we have, let's say, one, two, three, and these are the numbers inside our list. We want to take the total. So for the ones digit, we simply add three. For the tens digit, it's two times 10. And the hundreds digit, it's one times 100. We just add the total of those numbers. So for this, we'll say some numbers and initialize with zero. Then using a for loop, we want to take the index number and retrieve the number from the back of our list. So we'll say num in enumerate reversed the numbers. We'll run this loop and then some numbers plus equals, then num times 10 to the ith power. Then we'll return some numbers. So what does this mean? First, let's look at this 10 to the ith power. At first, i is 0. 10 to the 0th power is 1. For example, we have 3 in our 1's digit, and we multiply that by 1 and get the answer 3 for some numbers. Next, let's look at i equals 1. 10 to the 1st power is 10. Our num is 2, so 2 times 10 is 20. Next, we have 1 as our value for index number 2. 10 to the second power or 10 squared is 100. So 1 times 100 is 100 and we get 100. We do this calculation and return as an integer. We're calling list to int here, so let's run our code. When we do run our code, we see 1000 properly displayed. If you're able to write your codes like this, that's great. In our example here, we use 999 but play around with this and change the numbers. Let's try with the number one, two, three. When we run the code, we get 124, which is correct. You can also add more digits and run the code. In any situation, you'll see that this code will work properly. We have our input as a list and we add one and the result is shown on the right side. Let's try including next zeros in the front of our list. Now, how about 9999. Even with integers like these, you'll see that the results are properly displayed. This problem was a problem where you had to think about how you would solve the problem by hand. Thinking of how you would solve it manually, you had to write codes representing your mathematical thinking. Being able to write codes that represent your thinking is an important skill. And for this problem, if you're able to write your codes like this, then great job. First, let's go over our problem. For this lecture, we're going to be working on solving two problems. The first problem is this. We have numbers 0 through 9 printed in a zigzag pattern, also known as snake pattern. After 9, we start from 0 again and the numbers are listed in ascending order. Another key point here is that the number of rows are fixed. We have three rows here. The position of the rows are fixed and the rows display a zigzag pattern. And regarding where we start from, this zero will start from the middle row. Then moving on to our one, it is not printed below the zero, it's printed above the zero. Then we have two and three moving down towards the bottom. And this is how we create our zigzag pattern. This is our first problem. Now the second problem is one that involves letters. We have A up to Z, then we repeat the pattern from A. For this second problem, we have 10 rows printed. We want to create a flexible function where it's possible to adjust the height of the rows. We want to be able to freely change the height. This is what's unique about the second problem. 
Both functions will be similar, so if you want, you could start off by trying to write the function for the second problem. That's fine too. The first problem is where the rows can be fixed, so it may be easier to understand by working on the first problem and then the second problem, which requires flexibility. I'll first show you how to solve the first problem since it involves fixed settings for the pattern. So first, let's discuss about how to approach this problem. When you want to print in a zigzag pattern, it's best to place the numbers in lists. For example, let's say we have three lists. The first number in our pattern will place this in the middle list. Then for the remaining list, we'll input a blank text. This will make it easier later on when we print this out. The next number is one and we place that in the top list. For the remaining list, we place blank text. At the end, we'll use join to print out each list and this will result in a zigzag pattern that looks like the one on the right here. So now we'll enclose these lists inside a list, and this will make it easier to manage the codes. This is the approach that we'll take, and we'll write the code for this from now to see how this all works out. First, we'll do from typing and import list. We'll write the function for our first problem, and we'll name the function snake string v1. Our input will be chars, which will contain a string. Our output will be a list that contains, if you recall from my visual, three lists in rows containing strings. This is what we want for our output, and this is the function we want to create. First, we'll write result, and we'll prepare three empty lists, like so. And then we'll write result indexes, and we'll refer to values in our first list as zero, then 1, then 2 for the other list. When we recognize these as a set, it's easier to manage. And let's continue on for now. Next, we'll have insert index as 1. This 1 is referring to this middle list. We'll use append on this middle list. And this insert index is a variable that's used to manage these numbers. Next, we have our chars here as our input but we'll use a for loop and place them in our results here. How will we do this? For example, let's say that the index number that is referred to in our loop is this number 0, 1, 2. Let's just look at the numbers from 0 up to this 9. Our middle row contains all even numbers in ascending order. And then the top list is 1, 5, 9, so it's increasing by 4. 1 plus 4 is 5, and 5 plus 4 is 9. Now looking at our bottom row, it starts with 3. 3 plus 4 is 7, so we have 7. This is how our index numbers increase, and by recognizing these rules and patterns, we can easily write the code for this. Now let's get back to writing. When we're going to take chars and run our loop, we'll need i for index number, and then s for the character used. We'll retrieve these by saying enumerate and pass in chars. And now we need to focus on how to place our first value inside the first list. To do this, we'll take the index number and divide by 4. If we get 1 as the remainder, we'll store that in our top list. We'll insert index and set that to 0. What does this mean? Looking at our pattern to the right, we have 1, 5, 9. If we divide 1 by 4, we get remainder 1. 5 divided by 4 is also remainder 1. For a value like these, we need to insert the values here in the first list. Next, we'll work on the middle list. And this time, we'll use elif and i divided by 2 as set to 0. If remainder is 0, we want to take the value and insert that in the index number 1 list. Looking at the middle row, we have 0, 2, 4. If we divide 2 by these numbers, we get remainder 0. That's why these values we place in the middle list. And with the same idea, we look at the bottom row now with elif. When we do i divided by 4 and get remainder 3, then the value that meets this condition we place in insert index 2. In this case, this refers to this 3 and 7. When we divide by 4, we get remainder 3. With values like these, we place them in this last list. At the end, we'll store our values in result, so we'll append s for insert index. We also need to place blank text. So looking at the section above, we have result indexes. Our index numbers are stored here. So for example, let's say our loop results in 0. Then this 1 and 2 needs to have a blank text inserted. If i is 1 for our for loop, we need blanks for 0 and 2. That's all we need to do. 
So let's work on this section now. We'll write result indexes, and this is a set, so we subtract insert index. If we do this, we can figure out the remaining set. We'll say for rest index in, and then say result rest index, append, and insert the blank text. This is how we'll insert the blank text, and then all we need to do is write return result. Now let's see how this all works out by running our code with if name underscore underscore main. We're going to call our snake string v1 function, and for now, let's use the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we're going to print. Running our code, we see on the right, this is going to be our first list, this is our second list, and this is our third list. We have three lists created. And now we'll add for line in and include a print statement using the join method to join the lines. Let's see what this will do. And we'll run our code again. And we see on the right, the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and they're displayed in a zigzag pattern. Let's do one more thing. We want to say numbers and insert numbers. We'll use list comprehension for this by saying str i for i in range, and let's say 10. We'll write strings and use join numbers. After writing these lines, we'll pass in strings here and run our code again. Now we see on the right our numbers 0 through 9 displayed. We want to have more numbers displayed, so we'll use list comprehension and say for j in range, and let's say we want to have five sets of these numbers. When we run the code with this, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and we have five sets of these numbers displayed in a zigzag pattern or snake pattern. This section with list comprehension may be difficult to understand, so let's write it without it. We can prepare an empty list for this and write 4j in range and run this five times. For our inner loop, we'll write 4i in range 10, then l append i. What we've written here is the same thing as our list comprehension below. This 4j in range 5 is the same as this section here below. And then we're going to run it another time so we have our nested loop. This is equivalent to this section. This i is what we want to pass into our list, so that's what we're doing. These lines up above that we just wrote is the same as this one line here. This isn't the key point of our first problem, so we'll erase the section that we just wrote and continue on. And this is the solution to the first problem. Now let's work on the second problem. I'm going to copy from above and then rewrite our v1 function name to v2. For this problem, the main point is the width of our zigzag pattern. For our input, we'll write depth and refer to it with integers. We want to initialize our list using depth. So we'll erase these empty lists and say for underscore in range depth. This will make it possible to initialize our initial list for result. Then we'll write result indexes. This too, for our set, we can just use comprehensions. So we'll say i for i in range and include numbers equivalent to the length of our depth. Next is insert index. This refers to the one which we used at the very beginning. And this is going to be depth divided by two. For example, let's say depth is 10. 10 divided by 2 is 5. 5 means we want to start from the middle list. We'll make this an integer and decide on the number. Next is the section. For the first problem, we are dealing with three fixed rows. For example, we divided the index by 4 and then got remainder 1. But managing the code this way is difficult to understand and read. So let's make this easy to understand. So how will we make this a better and cleaner code? Let's say we have three lists here, and we have numbers 0, 1, 2. We have these numbers corresponding to our list, and at the very beginning, we have our first value here in index number 1. The next number is 1, and that's placed in our list that's one less from our previous list. We reach the 0, which is our leading list, and when we add 1 to this, we can place our next number in the list below. 
That's how two can be placed here. We have this pattern of 0, 1, 2, 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2. We refer to these numbers and increase and decrease to control where to place our values inside our lists. This approach may be easier than trying to control the position of our values than these codes that we wrote in V1. So let's work on the code for this section from now. Let's make some space here and bring what we have written so far up to the top. We'll write def pause for positive. This is a function within a function. Let's define this function here. This is a function where we return i plus 1. In our next function, we'll say def neg for negative, and we return i minus 1 for this one. Now that we've created these functions, we'll write op for operator, and at the very beginning, we store a negative. Referring to our example to the right, we have the very first zero that we placed here. If we think of these numbers as being stored in the index number 1, if we subtract 1, we can store numbers in the top list. That's why we put negative. Then we'll write for s in chars to run our loop and then result. We have our insert index that was defined at the very beginning, and we store s using a pen. Then for our remaining list, we need to just include blank text. So just like before, we'll say for rest index in result indexes, and this is a set, so we'll subtract insert index from it. Then result rest index, and include our blank text using append. This is how we'll include the blank text. And now let's focus on this insert index. We'll pass an insert index to our operator and can determine whether to add or subtract. But when we're running this insert index, we have to think about when it's already zero. If insert index is already zero, then we need to change the operator to positive. Program-wise, after reaching zero, it's not possible to go below zero, but we'll include less than to account for when it does go below zero. Then we change the operation to positive. If insert index is greater than depth minus one, we don't want it to be bigger than this. So we'll change the operator to negative. Then all we have to do is return result. And this is another way of solving this problem. For this V2, we want to include alphabet letters. So instead of numbers, we'll use letters. We'll import string and write alphabet. We'll write S4 and again, use list comprehension. And you want to run it twice. And then for s in string, ASCII lowercase. We want to insert this and take a to z, and also run this twice. Then we'll say strings and use join method on our alphabet. I'll copy the above two lines and paste them at the bottom. And this time we're working on v2 and not v1, so we'll rewrite this to v2. And for our depth, let's set it to 10 and also comment out this top section. Let's run our code with this, and we see on the right our alphabets displayed in a zigzag pattern. Let's change this 10 to a 6 now. And when we run our code with this, we see that the length of our zigzag pattern has changed. So if you're able to write your code like this, that's great. This pause and neg, we created these using a function within a function, but you could write this pause as a lambda. For example, we'll write lambda i, then i plus 1. Then for our negative, we'll say neg equals lambda i, then i minus 1. We'll comment out these lines, and then we'll run our code again to see what we get. When we run our code, we get the same result with the letters displayed properly. So as you see here, you don't have to write a function. You can do the same thing with just these lines. And another thing to note is here I use lambda, but instead of using lambda, you could use operators in Python. For this, we'll write import operator, and this is how we'll import operator, and going back down to our lines contain lambda, there's already a function similar to lambda. So we'll erase these two lines, and there's an operator called operator neg. We'll include this in our code, and then going down below to our line for positive, we'll change this to operator pause. And going down below to neg, we'll change this to operator neg. Then for this line containing insert index, 
we'll write plus equals, and we want to specify how much we want to be negative or positive. This time it'll be 1, so we store 1 in op. This is another way of approaching this problem. We'll run our code again, and we see that the results are properly displayed. For this too, let's change this 6 to a 10, and we see that our results are properly displayed. As you see here, using operator is another option. Then the code will look organized, and by using operator's library with negative and positive, it's easy to figure out what you're doing just by taking a quick look at the code. So please review what we covered, and you should feel ready to answer problems similar to this if you're able to write a code like this. First, let's go over our problems. Our first problem is to create an algorithm for finding the maximum subarray sum. So what does this mean? For example, we have for our input a list with random numbers that contain both positive and negative numbers. We want to figure out the maximum value for the sum of a subarray. For this example, we have as our output 14. Let's look at the first two numbers for our input, and they are 1 and negative 2. When we add these two together, we get negative 1. This may not be the greatest starting point. So how about when we start from 3? 3 plus 6 is 9, and 9 minus 1 is 8, 8 plus 2 is 10, 10 plus 4 is 14. So this is the subarray that will result in the largest sum. When we take this 14 and subtract 5, we get 9, and even if we add 2 to it, we get 11. It's not bigger than 14, so the sum that results in the maximum subarray sum is this 3, 6, negative 1, 2, 4 subarray. Our first problem is one where we have to display the value of the maximum sum of the subarray, which in this case is 14. Next, we're going to go one step further and compute the maximum circular subarray sum. What does this mean? This means our subarray can start and stop prior to reaching a certain number, like this negative 1. For example, we can start from 2, 4, negative 5, 2, and continue on to the beginning of the array. We can look at circular subarrays to figure out the maximum sum. In this case, if we start from the last number of 2 here, and then look at the sum to include 1, negative 2, 3, 6, negative 1, 2, 4, and we stop prior to looking at negative 5, our output will be 15, and this will result in the maximum sum. So these are our two problems for this lecture. The first problem is straightforward, and the second problem is a little complicated. Let's begin with writing the code for the first problem. We'll start with from typing import list, and after importing, we'll say def get max sequence sum. This will be our function name, since we want to figure out the max value that can result from our subarray. We'll pass in a list of integers for our input. For our output, we want a sum to be displayed as an integer. This is our parameter for this function, and first we'll say result sequence. This is the value we'll be returning with our code at the end. Then we want to also include a variable that will be used while we run our code, so we'll name this sum sequence. We'll initialize these two by storing 0 and 0. Then we'll say for num in numbers and retrieve the contents of our list. First we'll write temp sum sequence. Then we'll write sum sequence, and our first sum sequence is 0. We add the first num to this. Let me explain this a little more. I'll bring our list from above, and first we have 1 as our first value in our list. Our sum sequence is 0, and we add 1, so the sum is 1. Next we compare num and temp sum sequence. We compare these two. The first loop isn't a good example, so for now I'm going to just write the code. In this situation, we'll store temp sum sequence in sum sequence, and if it doesn't meet this criteria, we store num directly in sum sequence. What are we doing here? First, temp sum sequence in this line became 1. Num is 1, and if temp sum sequence is bigger, then we store this temp sum sequence in sum sequence. If num, in this case, is 1, and if that's bigger, then we store the num in some sequence. Let me explain using the second loop as an example. We have negative 2 as our input. We look at some sequence plus num. So in this case, it'll be 1 minus 2, which will result in temp sum sequence being negative 1. Looking at this if statement next, 
Negative 2 is less than our temp sum sequence of negative 1, so that's why our sum sequence will be negative 1. We continue and look at our next value of 3. Negative 1 plus 3 is now 2, so this will become 2. When we compare 3 and 2, 3 is bigger, so our sum sequence this time will be our num, which is 3. Starting from 3 will result in a larger sum, so we set the sum sequence to 3. And on to our next condition, if our result sequence is less than our sum sequence, then we store our sum sequence in our result sequence. That's all we have to do. At first, our result sequence is 0, so when our sum sequence becomes bigger than 0, our result sequence will be updated with our sum sequence. And let's say we're looking at these numbers here, and our sum sequence is bigger than the result sequence that we calculated with the beginning values of our list. Then all we have to do is rewrite it. Let's see what this code will do. So we'll return result sequence, and we'll say if name underscore underscore main and include our print statement with our function name of get max sequence sum and include our list from above and paste it here and we'll run our code and when we do we get the result 14. It matches our output here of 14 so we just confirm that this code works properly. This code here is a little long and can be simplified so let's work on this now. I'll comment out these lines and we'll write sum sequence. We'll use max method and include num and sum sequence and adding num to it. We're comparing the sum sequence and num and just the num and taking the bigger value as our sum sequence. And also for our section down below, I'm going to comment out these lines. We'll say result sequence and take the max of the result sequence and sum sequence. We compare the two and take the bigger value. Let's run our code with this. When we do, we get the result 14. So this confirms that our code is working properly. All we did here is determine which two values are bigger to figure out the value for our sum sequence and for result sequence. I'm going to delete the lines that we used initially since it's a long code and use a shorter one since it looks more organized this way. We're now done with the first problem, so on to our second. Our function name for this is going to be find max circular sequence. And just like with our first problem, our input will be list with integers, and for our output, it will be int. I'm going to close this on the right and create some space in the middle here. And let's start writing from here. But first, let's discuss about how we're going to approach this. For example, let's say we have a list with 1, 2, 3, then negative 1, 3, 2, 1. If this is our list, then it's obvious we should take the sum of 3, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 3. But how will we retrieve these numbers? We can take the sum of all the numbers here and take the smallest number, so this negative 1. When we remove this negative 1, then this results in the max value for our circular sequence sum. For example, let's add negative 2 and negative 3 to our list here. These numbers will result in the smallest sum. We'll remove these from the sum of all numbers, and then we can figure out the sum of 3, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 3, which will result in the max circular sequence sum. Even if you have, let's say, 1 in between the negative numbers, the sum of these numbers will result in the smallest value. So we remove these numbers and then compute the sum of 3, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 3. The consecutive numbers that will result in the smallest value will need to be removed in order to solve this problem. Let's look at a different situation. We're going to copy our first list, and now instead of 1, we'll start with negative 100, and we'll also end with a negative 100. There's no reason to look at this in a circular way, so we'll take these numbers to compute the max sum. In this situation, we can just use the get max sequence sum function. We can compare the max sum calculated by get max sequence sum function and the function that takes account for circular sequences, and whichever results in the bigger value should be returned for our output. All this explaining in words is probably not the easiest to understand, so I'm going to write out the code for this from now. First, we'll refer to our list as pattern 1 and pattern 2. And regarding pattern 2, we can include our numbers in the function above of get max sequence sum and store that in max sequence sum. That's all we need to do for pattern number 2. Now we want to look at pattern 1. 
if we're going to use the function above, we can take the positive numbers and make them negative, and take the negative numbers and make them positive. For example, this will be plus 1, plus 2, negative 1, plus 3, and so on. We can reverse the minus and plus signs. By doing this and plugging it into our function, we can figure out the sequence that will result in the smallest sum. For this, we'll invert numbers and create an empty list to store our numbers. We'll do that from now and start out with all sum. We want to create a variable for the sum of all values and set that to zero. Then for num in numbers for our loop and all sum is a sum value, so we'll add the nums. For invert numbers, we'll use append and include minus num. Let's say our num is 2, then minus num means negative 2. Then next, we'll write get max sequence sum. We'll place our invert numbers, and here the max value of our sum of inverted numbers will be used, and all we need to do is subtract that from all sum. So we'll say all sum minus, and then this is our inverted number, so we need to reverse the sign again. We'll subtract this, and the result of this is the value for max wrap sequence. Now that we've gotten this far, all we need to do is compare the max sequence sum and max wrap sequence and take the bigger value. We'll return max of max sequence sum and max wrap sequence. We'll compare these two and return the bigger value. Let's see what this code will do. This time, the function name is not get max sequence sum, but find max circular sequence sum. We'll include our numbers list and run the code. And when we run our code, we get the result 15. Looking at our problem, yes, we've confirmed that this is also 15, so our code is working properly. But let's look at the code that we just wrote. It does look a little complicated, so let's rewrite it and make it look more organized. How will we simplify this code? We have this get max sequence sum. We're comparing the max here. So instead of reversing the sign using invert numbers and reversing the sign, we can just make this max to min. To do this in our argument, we can use operator and include max. This will be our default argument. Next, we'll change this max to operator. We'll include operator and make it possible to pass in min. So these lines below will just comment out and here we'll include max wrap sequence. And for this, we'll say sum numbers minus get max sequence sum. We'll pass in numbers and operator min. We can retrieve the minimum value of the sum of the sequences. And this one line is all we need. This function name of max is misleading, so let's change this to max min. And let's replace all the names for this with max min. So I'll replace all of these. If you write your codes this way, then you don't have to reverse the plus and minus signs like we did here. And now let's run our code and we get the same result of 15, which is correct. This is our final answer and let me remove the unnecessary lines. This is a short and easy to understand code as you see here. So please review and practice so that you're able to write your codes like this. First, let's go over our problem. Let's say we have a list containing numbers in ascending order. We have some numbers like this 3 and 5 and 7 that have duplicates. We want to print a list with all the duplicates removed. And we want to print a list like this one with all the duplicates removed. For this problem, while we're writing the code, I'm planning on adding on some more conditions. First, let's start with the easiest solution. For example, we'll store this list in L. And next, all we have to do is print. We'll print list set L. This is all there is to it. And when we run the code, we get the result 1, 3, 5, 7, 10, 12, 15. We use set to remove duplicates and then created a list for these numbers. This is a simple line. Another way to write this is to say print list dict from keys L. You could pass in the list this way and also get the same results. When we run our code, we get the same results. So these codes aren't incorrect, but the point here of this question is to create your own function to remove the duplicates and print a list without the duplicates. 
There may be some of you who aren't familiar with this from keys, so I'm going to explain with my terminal. For example, let's say we have a list containing one, two, three. This is what's included in our list. Then we'll write dict from keys L. Based on these keys, a dictionary is created, and what we created, one none, two none, three none, are displayed. For example, let's say in our list we have some duplicates of threes. Then once again, we'll use dict from keys L. Our key for a dictionary will be unique, and we have one, two, three. And all we have to do is make this into a list. For this, we'll say dict from keys L, then keys to make this easy to understand. When we return, we get dict keys one, two, three. In closing now with list, we get one, two, three returned as a list. You don't have to enter key, so if you remove key, you still get the same result. And that was a quick explanation regarding from keys. We won't be using it for our solution in this lecture, but it's just good to know. And if you wanted to use it, you could use it. And continuing on, an interviewer might say, can you solve this problem by using list comprehension? Let's work on that from now. First, we'll say print, and we'll be doing list comprehension. So first, we store n for numbers. We'll store numbers in our list. At this time, we'll take i and n and use enumerate. We'll use enumerate in a loop for our list, and if n is not in L, and we'll work on this up to i. If the number isn't found, then we place it in our list. We can write it this way too. When we run our code with this, we get the same results. Because of enumerate, from the beginning, this i is index number, and we're retrieving the numbers. Our index number is 0, 1, 2, and it's increasing. In this section of if n not in l here, this i refers to index number, and if prior to this section, if there's no n, then we put it in our list. The numbers here are listed from smallest to biggest, so this code will also work. This time, we want to solve this problem by writing a function without using these lines. I'll comment out these lines for now. Our task now is to create a function without using these lines, so we'll name our function delete duplicate v1. We're working with a list, so it'll be numbers here, and up at the top, we'll write from typing import list. And then going back to our argument, our input will be a list containing integers. For our output, we don't want to return a list, but let's say we want to call by reference and rewrite the list itself. Our output for this case will be none. The easiest way to solve this problem is to create a temp list. Maybe you also came up with this way. We'll say temp here. Then for num in numbers to retrieve each number, and if num is not in temp, we'll do temp append and include num. And also, we want to rewrite the list that was called by reference. So for this, we'll take the contents of numbers and store in temp. This is a very easy way to solve this problem. This is where we're creating a new list with temp and storing the numbers in there. And if a value already exists in the list, we don't include that number. Let's see how this code works out. We'll write, as usual, if name underscore underscore main and copy our list from above and then we'll paste it down below and include our function name and pass in our L. We're calling by reference, so we'll print L and run our code. And when we do, we get the same results. We've confirmed that our function delete duplicate v1 is working properly. So this is a fairly easy approach. Here we have if not num and temp. We're checking if num is included in our entire list. But this list has numbers in ascending order from smallest to biggest. So instead of looking at this entire list from temp, you could run a for loop to see if this 1 and 3, for example, are different numbers. They are different numbers and are unique, so in this case, you could say to include them in temp. That might be a better approach. So our next function name will be v2, and we'll take this approach. I'll rewrite v1 to v2, and first create a temp. We already know that the first number in our list is unique, so we'll include 0. We initialize our index number i and the length of our list. We'll do this from 0 up to len numbers minus 1. We want to use a while loop for this with while i is less than len num. So we're running the loop from 0 up to the end. Then if numbers i. 
If this value and numbers i plus 1 are different numbers, then it is unique. So we'll do append numbers i plus 1 and include it in our list. That's all we have to do. And then we add 1 to i and store our temp into numbers. This code should also return the same results. And now let's scroll down to copy our list and rewrite our function name from v1 to v2. Let's run our code with this and when we do, we get the same results printed. This function is working properly, so it's fine. But next, let's say that the interviewer asks you to not create a temp, but instead simply rewrite the content of numbers. We'll write a code for this and name it as v3. I'm going to create some space here and going back to the top, rename our function to v3. First, I'm going to show you a bad example. It's a code that won't work that well. We'll write i len numbers and set our i, our index, to 0. Our len numbers is len numbers minus 1. We're going to use a while loop for this starting from the start of the list. We'll write while i and while is less than len numbers. You might think we can take each number and run a loop. So we'll write if numbers i and numbers i plus 1, if these two are the same, we can write numbers remove and numbers i to remove this number. Then we'll write i plus equals 1. If we write it this way, this code won't work properly. Let's confirm what this does. We'll copy from above and rewrite our function name to v3. And we'll run our code with this, and when we do, we see the result list index out of range. When we use remove, the length of our list changes, which results in our index number getting shifted. This is a problem. And for example, let's look at our list below. If we remove this 3, when we remove the 3, our list contains one less number than before. If we run our loop with this condition, then that means we won't have our last index number, but we're still trying to access it. So that's why we get this index error, list index out of range. This code doesn't work as you see, but if you do want to take this kind of approach, it is possible. To do that, after remove, we can move back one for i. And also, this len numbers here. It contains a value from len numbers minus one that we calculated at the very beginning. This means each time we run a while loop, we need to recalculate it. For this, we'll write len numbers minus one here and run this for each while loop. I'll remove this top section here and just initialize i. Let's run our code with this and when we do, we get the correct results displayed. So you could write your code like this, but it's not the greatest code. And just by first glance, the code itself is not that easy to read. And what else? We're adding and subtracting with i and we're also checking the length of our list each time we run our while loop. These are some problems with this code. Let's make this a better, simpler code, and we'll name this function as v4. First, let's discuss how we'll approach this. If we search from the start of our list, then our index changes. We can solve this problem by looking at index from the back of our list using a while loop. We'll say numbers minus 1 and get the length of our list. Then we'll write while i. While that is bigger than 0, we start looking for the back. Then we'll write if numbers i and numbers i minus 1. If these are different, then we use pop to remove the last one. Then we're looking at i from the back of our list, so we'll do i minus 1. That's all we need to do. And now once again, let's see what our code will do. We'll copy our list from above and rewrite it to v4 and run our code. When we run our code, we see that v4 is also displaying the correct results. So as you see here, v3 is not that easy to read. And for v4 that we just created, we search from the back and we use pop. And therefore, the code is much easier to read. For this problem, if you're able to write your code like v4 from the very beginning, that would be great. But please note that it is possible to write the code a different way. But being able to write your code like v4 is something that you should aim for. And these simple one-line codes are also useful to know. So please review this and be able to use them if needed. First, let's go over our problem. This time, our problem is to display permutations. 
Python already has a library where you can display permutations. For this, we can just import iterTools package to implement the permutations method in Python. This is all there is to it. For example, we'll write permutations, then include a list with one, two, three. Then iterator will be returned. So we can run this using a for loop and print our results with print r. When we run the code, we see all our possible combinations. For example, we see one, two, three on this line. When we rearrange this two and three, we get one, three, two. Next, we brought the two forward. We rearrange the one and three and our result is the two, three, one. As you can see, all the possible orderings of this three number set is displayed using this function. So our problem for this lecture is to display all the possible permutations. And please note, the result is displayed as a tuple here, but it doesn't have to be a tuple. Lists are fine too. And for this time, let's use a list. We're gonna say list and typing import. Now to our function, our function will be all perms. And now to our input, our argument will be elements, and we're going to pass in a list with integers. For example, one, two, three, and four. Our output will also be a list with these kinds of combinations you see to the right. So within our list, we'll have a list containing integers like one, two, three, and four. So how do we approach this? For example, let's say we have a list with one, two, three, and four. This one can be the first number at first, but later we want to bring the one between this two and three. Then we get the combination two, one, three, four. We then move the one between the three and four. That results in two, three, one, four. And last, we move the one to the end. So when we do that, our result is two, three, four, one. With this, we created four possible permutations. We only want to focus on this first line here. This one moves to different positions, but the remaining numbers, so this two, three, and four, will also need to move in the same way as the one. This might be confusing, so let me rewrite this to the right. Now we want to bring the two between this three and four, and also bring it to the back. When we do that, we get the combinations one, three, two, and four, and also one, three, four, and two. Getting back to our first list here, the remaining two, three, four will each need to change positions. We move the two to different positions. After displaying the combinations created by moving the twos, next we focus on three and four. Repeating the same process, this three, four becomes four, three. So our first step was with this first number one. It was placed in all possible positions. And then with the remaining numbers, two, three, and four, we did the same. And then with three and four, we repeated the process. And last, we only have one number, but in this case, we don't have to move the number around. These steps can be implemented well with the use of recursion. This visual is probably now not visually easy to understand. So let's get to writing the code. First, we'll say first, and then store our first element. So this will be zero to one. This and the rest of the elements can be defined as the one up to the back of the list. Then we'll say for i in range and run our loop up to the length of our elements. So we'll say len elements. Let's confirm this by printing to see what is displayed when we reposition the one. We'll do this by saying rest colon and we're looking at the elements from the beginning up to i. The first element is zero. So we have nothing plus first plus the rest, which is from i up to the last element. Let's run this code now. So we'll say if name underscore underscore main, and then write our function name, all perms, and we'll input one, two, three. Let's run our code. And when we do, we see one, two, three, two, one, three, two, three, one. As you can see, the one starts at the beginning, then moves to the middle, then moves to the end. The one moves to different positions, and this is easy to understand. Now the next step is to take this two and three and repeat the moves we took for the one. This is when we want to use recursion. In between these lines, I want to add another for loop. We're going to say for perm in all perms. We're calling all perms a second time. And at this time, 
elements from one to the rest is passed in. On the right, we have this two and three, but we want to return results where a list with two and three and also three and two is created. Using our numbers to the right as an example for this perm, we want a list containing, I'm gonna write here, two and three, and also three and two. This is what we want to see for our results. With this in mind, we're going to move our two lines here inside this for loop. Then this rest is going to be perm, and we're looking at perm's first number up to i. At first, this is zero. This first refers to this element, zero up to one. I'm going to rewrite first to elements, and then to the right of elements, we have rest. We'll take this rest, and we're going to rewrite it to perm, and refer to i up to the last element. So if in this for loop, we return a list with two and three, our first element, zero to one, is one. So we're able to create lists with one, two, three, two, one, three, and two, three, one. Now, if in this for loop, we return three and two, that means three comes first, then one comes in between. So we get one, three, two, three, one, two, three, two, one. Those are the combinations that can be made. But in this all perms, before we return two and three, we're recursively calling all perms. So for example, if our first list is one, two, three, the remaining elements here, which would be two and three, we're passing in this two and three to call this all perms. This may be difficult to understand, so let me remove three and two. This two and three is passed in with all perms using recursion. Then we look again at this elements one up to the end. So that will mean we'll only pass in this three. Then with only three, all perms is called upon. At the end of our recursion, this elements one up to the end refers to a list with only this one element and all perms is called. We'll write the code for what to do at that time. We'll say if len elements is less or equal to one, then at this time we'll return elements. And regarding when we return, we want to put it in a list and then return a list with the number three. So what does this mean? All perms is expecting a specified iterable. So there's an assumption that all perms contains a couple of lists. So this elements, once we call the elements with this all perms, with the use of this perm, this three will only be included in perms. We're using this list and using slice to process the number. We're using a list inside a list. And we have to return our results this way in order to process the data in all perms. This is how we return our results. And our code for this problem is complete. And this may have been difficult to understand. But for now, let me run our code. I'll write results and prepare an empty list. And here we'll write not print but result append and insert our result here. Then at the end, we'll write return result. And at the bottom, this is a list. So we'll say for P and this P stands for permutation and then print P. Let's run our code with this. And when we do, we see the results to the right. Our results are properly displayed. And for example, instead of one, two, three, we can add a four. This time we have four numbers, and when we run the code, we see all the possible combinations printed properly. The code that we needed for this is just this. This looks simple, but this all perms section using recursion may be confusing. So if that is the case, please use debugger and review your code. This is a great way to review your codes. Right now we have our results in the list, but let's use yield. We'll include iterator after import list, and also for our output, we'll also include the word iterator. And about from typing, we could use a generator instead of an iterator, but iterator may be easier to understand. So that's what I'm going to use for this lecture. We want to return an iterator, so we'll replace return with yield. With this yield, it's already iterable, so we don't need to include it in a list. We can retrieve the content to pass into all perms with just the iterator. So when using yield elements, there's no need to place it inside a list. Now onto where we're using result append. We'll replace this with yield, and we don't need a return statement at the end. 
so we'll remove this. Let's look at this yield elements. Since we're using yield, we can't use return. So when we have one yield, then two, we have two yields. So as a code, it won't work properly. We'll use if else, and then this will include this for loop below our else. When we had return, we could return to this all perms right here. With yield, if len elements is less or equal to one, then we yield elements and don't want to run this bottom code. So that's why we use if else. Let's run our code again, and we see on the right our results display correctly. And instead of four numbers, let's just work with three numbers. So one, two, three, and we see on the right our results. All possible combinations are displayed correctly. So if you're able to use this yield statement, that's great. Using a list may be easier, but knowing how to write using yield can be useful. When you do use yield, remember to use if else. And another thing to note is that yield is iterable, so we don't need to use parentheses. These are some things to watch out for when using iterator. This may have been difficult to understand, but after running perm's leading number up to i, and element's leading number, and perm i up to the last number, we have perms here, but we'll use recursion here, and these perms will be updated. Then it's possible to display all the combinations. Please keep this in mind when writing the code using recursion for this. And like always, please review and practice so that you can write your code like this. Let's get started with our next problem. This problem is one that involves palindrome. Palindrome is a sequence of words that reads the same backward as forward, and if that is the case, we want to return true. For example, we have ABA. This reads the same going forward and backwards. In this case, return true. Then we have ABC. Reading from the back, we don't get ABC, so we return false. Next, we have race car. Reading from the front and back, it's race car. So in that case, we return true. Our first problem is to write a code that will check this. Then to our second problem. Let's say we have a string with letters like this. The problem is to find the palindrome within this string. For the answer, we have CEC, which reads as CEC, both going forward and backward. We have CC here. We have ACECA. -E we can find this in the string too. And we also have this race car inside our string as well. Our problem is to return all the palindromes contained within this string. So let's start off with our first problem. For example, if we use the reverse function, it's easy to implement this, but during an interview, you may be asked to not use reverse function. So let's begin writing our code now, first using the reverse function. First, we'll store test and s. Then we'll say reverse s and include print. This is a reversed object. So when we print and run, we see on the right side, reversed object. In order to make this a string, we'll use a join method to take each letter and join them together. When we run our code, we get the result TSET, which are the letters test in backwards format. We'll include S equals, and if the results return with this join is the same as our string, then that makes the string a palindrome. That's how we can check if the string reads same backward as forward. Let's run our code, and our string is test. Reading backwards would not be test, so our results say false. Now let's input race car as our string. When we run our code on the right side, we return true. So if you use the reverse function, this problem is pretty simple to solve. Let's make this a little more challenging by saying you can't use the reverse function. You might also be asked to write the code using list slicing. So let's try that out from now. We'll comment out this section and we'll write s colon colon minus one. We can reverse the string with this. This may be new to some of you, so I'll add a print statement and run the code. We see that our string race car returns race car with this. Now let's include s equals to confirm if our string and our reverse string return the same sequence of letters. And we get true. Next, let's change race car back to test and run the code. We get false again. This is one way you can solve the problem by using slice. And regarding how to use slicing in Python, let's go over this feature. For example, let's say you have x, and we'll use list comprehension, and let's say include 10 numbers. We input x and confirm that the numbers 0 through 9 are included. Now let's insert a colon. We return the same list. Now we'll add one more colon, and we get the same output. 
Now let's add one. We get the same output. How about when we rewrite the one to two? In this case, our output shows multiples of twos. If you're familiar with Python, this may be easy to understand. But with x and one colon, we're outputting the entire list. When we have two colons and two colons and a one, that means to skip over to the next number for the string. Then when we have two, that means to skip over a number. So that's why we have multiples of two. Now when we change this to three, we return zero three six nine. With this same concept in mind. When we change the number to negative one, now we have a reverse list from nine to zero. With negative two, we get nine seven five three one. Then negative three, we return nine six three zero. As you can see from these examples, it's possible to use list slicing to reverse the order. So that's why writing the code like this will also work. We're able to solve the problem with our code, but this time let's say that you're asked to solve the problem without using reverse or list slicing. Let's try to write the code for this from now. Before we start writing, I'm going to delete some of these lines here, and then we'll write our function name is palindrome. Our input will be a string, and our output will be bool. First, let's think about how we'll approach this problem. The easiest way is probably this. For example, let's look at race car. The first letter is R, and if the last letter is also R, then there's a possibility it's a palindrome. We compare the first and last letter, and if it's the same, we look at the next letters within the string. The next letter from the front would be A, and the letter from the back would also be A. If this A and A are the same, then we look at C and C. Then we reach E in the middle. We would keep comparing until we hit halfway through the string. So basically, we keep checking whether the corresponding letters from the front and back match. And if we find a pair that doesn't match, we can confirm that it's not a palindrome. So let's start putting this into code. In len strings, we first store the length of our string, and if there's nothing inside our string, then we return false, since that wouldn't be a palindrome. And next, if len strings is one, so the string consists of one letter, like a, b, c, or any letter. If the string consists of one letter, In that case, we return true and classify it as a palindrome. So, what does this mean? For example, if a string like a or b are inputted, we classify it as a palindrome. Dictionaries and websites have debated over whether one-letter strings should be classified as a palindrome or not. But for this time, we're just going to say that it is. These four lines aren't the main parts of our function, so you could just negotiate with the interviewer about these small details. So let's begin writing the main part of our code. Let's set up the variables start and end. Start would have an index number of zero, and end would have an index of len strings minus one, or our last index. Our while loop would iterate until start surpasses end. And what we are checking here is if the first letter of the string inputted into strings, which would have an index of zero, did not match the last letter of the string. Which would have an index of end here. If the two letters don't match, we just return false, and it wouldn't be a palindrome. If the two letters do match, we increase start by one and decrease end by one. And if the two letters don't trigger the return false until the end of the while loop, then we return true, and it would be a palindrome. Now that we've written this. Let's test out our code to see if it runs correctly. Set up main inside the print statement, and we call our function is palindrome, passing in race car. Now running our code, we see that true is returned to the console. Now let's pass in test instead, and now running the code, false is returned. So that's the basic run through of our new function. This function is pretty simple, so hopefully it went smoothly for you too. We just completed our first prompt regarding our palindrome, and even if you were able to solve number one smoothly, this next prompt finding all the palindromes instead of a string may be a little more difficult. For this problem, there are palindromes inside the string, and we need to find all the palindromes. So this requires a little more thinking. So how do we approach this problem? Let me explain a little to make it easier to understand. Let's say we have race car as our string. From the index number of this middle e, 
when you look at the index number that's to the left and to the right of this E. Unlike last time, we're going from the center out. From our index number 0, 1, 2, 3, we take this E from index 3. And within this string, we look at the left and right of this E. And if these two are the same letter, then it is a palindrome. At this point, CEC is recognized as a palindrome. And that's what we have here. When we check the next letter on both sides, we look at this A and this A. Since they match up, we just confirm that ACECA is also a palindrome. So it's added here. And finally, we have the full string race car. So all three palindromes are retrieved. Now, if you check this first B, we take the index number of B and look at the left and right letters and see if they match. And if they don't match, we can just move to the next letter. We move our focus to C, check its left and right letters, and since it's not a match, we move to the next letter. We keep moving down the string, and when we get to the C and C, it's a match, so CEC is a palindrome. And extending outward, here would be another palindrome, and we continue on. This function looked at strings outward to inward, but this time our approach would be starting from the center, moving outward, to find the matches for each letter in our string. That's our approach. We shift and look at each index number. Now let's get to writing the code for this. For this, let's open up some space below and start our new code right up here. We're going to set up our function name with def find palindrome, passing in strings of type str, our left index number, our right index number, so the index of both sides that shift outward. Put a while loop and the iteration of left stops when its index becomes less than zero. So while left is greater than zero, and in the same way, right should be less than len strings minus one. So our loop runs until the very last index. Inside, we put if strings left does not match strings right. We exit the while loop. If they do match, in that case, we would have a palindrome. So that would be our basic approach through the string. Now we put strings left to right plus one, which would be the palindrome we just found. To elaborate here, we have the string ABA. Our left index would be zero, and let's say our right index would be two. If this becomes indexes zero to two, only AB will be retrieved, so we wouldn't have the full ABA here, which is why we have this plus one. Let's try it in the terminal here, inserting Python 3. In S, we will store ABA. S zero to two would result in AB. Now let's try s0 to 3, and this will result in aba. This 0 would be before this a. So imagine there's a dot located before a. From 0, 1, 2, 3, let's imagine a dot located after this a, and this function would print everything in between these dots, which is why we would need this right plus 1. So this code here would be our full palindrome. And for example, let's say result and make an empty list. And in result, we want to append our palindrome. Once we find the first palindrome, we want to shift outward to find more, so we decrease left by one, and increase right by one. We previously had ABA as an example, but let's change our string to race car. Let's say that there's a string like this, and we just found CEC to be a palindrome, and we want to go outwards to check these A's. For this, we're going to decrease left by one and increase right by one, and run another iteration of the loop. Ultimately, we return our result to finish off the function. That's all there is to it, and let's call this function to check if it works too. Our function for this time is find palindrome, so we'll rewrite this to find palindrome, passing in a, b, a, the two bounding indexes being zero and Two. Now running the code, we see that ABA is returned on the right. Let's add C to both sides of the string. The indexes we are starting from this time will be 1 and 3 instead of 0 and 2. Now running our code, what do we get? We get ABA and CABAC as our return values. So this function seems to be working properly. And now regarding this C, A, B, A, C. 
Let's say that the center of our palindrome becomes B, B instead. Our input indexes wouldn't be one number apart in this case. It would be this 2 and 3. We'll pass in 2 and 3, and let's run the code. Below, we get B, B, A, B, B, A, C, A, B, B, A, C, retrieving the correct palindromes. This upper string and lower string are examples of two different types of palindromes. So when this function is getting a string passed in, we either have indexes one number apart, like this 1 and 3, or side-by-side -side numbers, like this 2 and 3. There's a possibility that two letters could be at the center, so we have to consider these two cases when calling the function. Now that we understand this, let's create our next function accounting for these two cases. Again, we're going to create some space here, and then starting off, we're going to create our new function as def find all palindrome. We pass in strings, str, into our new function. In our result, let's store an empty list for now. And in lang strings, let's store len strings, so the number of letters in our string. If an empty string is passed in, we just return the result. If len strings is 1. In this case, in result, we append our strings. If that is not the case, we put 4i in range. And let's say our string was a, b, a. We would skip a and start from b. So our index can start from 1. We end with len strings minus 1. So after we take the index number, inside we call find palindrome with strings and i minus 1. i is 1 right now, so i minus 1 would be 0. Then i plus 1 would be passed in, so we would be passing in the indexes 0 and 2 of a, b, a. Now for the second case, our string can also be structured like a, b, b, a. To account for this, we put i minus 1 and i by itself. Now since i is 1, the first index would be 0 and the second would be 1. Using this, First, we would know AB isn't a palindrome, so an empty list will be returned. In our next iteration, our index number will be 2. The indexes down here will be 2 minus 1 equals 1 and 2, which would be these Bs. So by putting these indexes in find palindrome, we can find all of the palindromes in the string. Now we can add for S in at the front and append s into result. You can make it work this way, but you might find that making a for loop is just too much work. So instead, you can use list comprehension, and in that case, we can put result append s for s to directly add into the list. Now we're going to copy paste this line. We'll change this to i, and finally, we return the result. This code here is a bit messy, so we'll reformat it later. Now that we've gotten this far, we want to try out the code that we have so far. So we'll erase the previous codes down here, and now this time we'll call find all palindrome without the index numbers, only our string. And now running our code, when we pass in cbabc, we get aba and cabac returned correctly. Now let's add some random letters in front to test it further. Rerunning our code, we get the following results. We get AA, ABA, CABAC, FAF, DFAFD, returning the right palindromes. We can now confirm our function finds all the palindromes existing in the inputted string. Instead of returning results with a list inside, it is possible to directly return the palindromes using yield. For example, after you're done writing this code here, you might be asked during an interview to not return results with a list inside, but use yield instead. You'll be asked to make necessary changes to your current code. So let's work on a code that uses yield now. For that, first we'll need to remove the unnecessary sections here, and we can't use result anymore, so we remove the list entirely. We can't append values anymore, so we use yield to directly return the value instead. So now we don't need this return statement either, so we'll delete this, and when calling find palindrome, the palindrome values will be returned each time through this yield here. Now that we've gotten this far, let's try running our new version. 
Running the code, we get the same correct results. For the result here, what if we are asked to use yield for this as well? For this, we'll erase this result here. And for this return, we just replace it with yield to return none. In this if statement, we use yield to return the string itself. For example, it could be a, b, and etc. And about this line here, for this portion, if we tried using yield here, we get an error. We're still going to try it out, but the syntax error when we run the code shows up as a syntax error for yield. This yield is unable to return s using list comprehension. We can't use list comprehension, so we could use a for loop instead. But in that case, that still gets a bit messy, and you can often be asked to keep this as one line. So let's think about how we can do this. In that case, we can use something called yield from passing in find palindrome. For our code below, we do the same and we add yield from as well. We will erase our return statement and that's about it. Now running our new code, we get a generator object. So this is showing up as a generator. We'll change this to a for loop, putting 4s in and then printing s. And we'll run our code. Now all the strings are printed properly. And you can see the revision we just made to the format makes our code look much cleaner. Regarding this yield from, this is often used in Python 3's async IO coroutines. So those that are very strong in Python may be very comfortable with yield from statements. For those not as experienced in async IO may have not been too familiar with these yield froms. Let's review this concept with a Python document. Here's a document on coroutines and tasks with documentation 3.8.2. Using this, when we search yield from, this directly returns async IO as a coroutine back to the caller, which is what yield from does. We can use yield from in this way, but this might be confusing for those unfamiliar with async IO. So let's try it back in our terminal. We'll put Python 3, starting with def g, and for i in range, we'll put in 10, and simply yielding i. And next, we'll write def g2. Then it is possible to directly return g. So that's what we're going to do, and let's see if this will work. We're going to print i for i in g2. Now, running the code, we see all of them are correctly returned. However, if we put def g2 again and return g, and let's say after that, we have more generators, then writing return g wouldn't work. That's because we already returned values in this first line. So let's make this function another generator and return the value of another generator. Here, we put yield from g and yield from g again then pulling up our previous print statement. Now running the code, we get the numbers returned twice. So as you see here, this yield from allows us to treat G as a generator. In async IO, this becomes a coroutine doing some very complex data processing. So yield from is one of the statements we use there. So it might be a good idea to have that in mind. And on to my last point, here is another documentation explaining typing, focusing on generators. For example, we have from typing import and coroutine. We look at this generator, and when we look at it, we see class typing generator, and we see the generic type such as yield type, send type, and return type. And looking at the examples below, this was generator int, so it's yielding zero, an integer. Other values are also being sent in the form of yields, which are these floats. Returning done here would be this str here. This might have been confusing since this is a pretty complicated generator, but in this case, the yield type was an int, and the send type was a float, and the return type was an str. So as you see here, you can specify the typing. In this lecture, the code I use is like this example below which consists of just yielding a string. In this example, this start is the string, and the generator's yield type is an int, and no send type or return type is needed in this case.
Now that we've reviewed how generators can be imported in Typing, let's go back and reformat our code. We'll start off with from Typing, and we import generator. And let's input our return value. And our return value is a generator of str, none, and none. Now it's much clearer that this is a generator, not a function. And we change this portion to return a generator as well with str, none, and none to make our code clear. Now let's run our revised code and we get no errors. And not only that, our code is neat and organized. So in this lecture, we covered example problems using palindromes. I'm sure there are many other ways to solve this as well. So I would recommend trying to find other ways to solve this on your own as well. Let's get right to our problem. Our problem is we have a list like this that contains both even and odd numbers that are randomly placed. As you see here, we have even and odd numbers in no particular order. Also, this time, we don't have any negative numbers. We want to rearrange the numbers, as you see on the right here, so that the even numbers are listed first, followed by the odd. Another requirement for the solution is that when we're reordering the numbers, we don't want to prepare a new list in the code. So that's our problem. And before we get into our solution for this problem, let me write the code for when we solve this problem with a new list. We'll name our function order even first because even numbers come first and on last. Later on, we want to solve the problem in a different way. So we'll name this as v1. So this will be our function name. We'll say numbers and then pass a list for our argument. We're rewriting our list, so our output will be none. The idea is that we're using this list, but just rewriting it. Now on to how we approach this. The easiest way is to take the first number, and if it's even, then put it in a list for even numbers. If it's an odd number, then put it in a list for odd numbers. Then we'll connect the two lists and reorder it. To do this, we'll create an even list, an odd list, and for now, create empty lists. Then we'll run a for loop using our numbers above with num in numbers. If num can be divided by two, then that means it's an even number. So we'll place it in our even number list. And if it's not an even number, then that means it's an odd number. So we'll place that in our odd number list using append. Then at the end, we'll rewrite our list with numbers. We'll take out our even list and on list and combine the two together. This will mean that our numbers list will contain even numbers at the beginning, followed by odd numbers. So let's test our code. We'll write if name underscore underscore main. And regarding this list, we'll copy from above and paste. We'll pass in our L to order even first odd last v1. Then at the end, we'll print L to see if it's been reordered. When we run our code, we see on the right side that even numbers are printed first, followed by odd numbers. This is a very simple and easy way to reorder our numbers. With our v1, we prepared an even list and odd list. But if you recall, we don't want to prepare a list now, but still want our even numbers to be displayed first, followed by odd numbers. This is what we're going to be working on from now. We'll make some space here and copy paste from above and start writing our code for our v2. So we'll rewrite this to v2. And this is an extra step, but we can include int for our list here. If we do this, we'll get an error. So if we want to include the type name for our list, we need to enter from typing import list. We'll need to write this and then we'll go down below to our function name. We'll make this capital L. And when we do this, we won't get an error anymore. We'll make this list int, and this will mean that this is a list containing integers. Typing is optional, but it does make it easier to read the code. And in this case, you could write it like this. Now let's get back to writing our code. So how should we come up with a solution? If you remember the requirements for this problem, we can't use this list this time. So within the original list itself, we have to rearrange the numbers. Before writing the code, let's discuss how to approach this. First, I'm going to erase the section 
And let's say that this is our initial list. Then in our next step, so we'll name this number two, zero is an even number, so we'll move to the next number. The rule is if our first number is the even number, we move to the next number. Next, we have one. We look at this one and also the last number in our list. I'm going to write number three for this. If this one is an odd number, we want to swap with the last number in our list, which is this eight. So we'll make this one and swap with this eight. Now we see that our even number came to the front. When swapping, we know that the last number, this one, is an odd number. Now instead of the one, we move forward one position and look at this nine. We'll be comparing this nine and this three will be next. When we look at this three and nine, we know they're both odd numbers. And when we're looking at odd numbers, we know we need to swap. So we'll write number four for this. We'll change this to nine and this to three now. We swap the two around here. And in the case of odd numbers, we have to look at the number one before it. That means we'll look at the six. We compare this six and nine. Nine is an odd number, so we swap these two around and now create a number five. This nine will become six, and then our six will become nine. Once we've done this, we see that the even numbers are listed first, followed by the odd numbers. This is the solution for when we want to write the code without creating a new list. Just looking at what we've written here may be difficult to really grasp the concept, so let's get to writing the code. Let's start writing then. First, we'll have i and j. The first index number is zero, so this is i. Our last index number is len numbers minus one. The last index number in our list is our j. The first index number is going to be our i. This time we're not going to use a for loop, but instead use the beginning and end of our list to determine if a number is an odd number or even number. So we'll be using while. While i is less than j, we'll be looking at the content of our list. Then if numbers i and our i is zero now, so the first number, if this number is zero, there's no need to rearrange this. We'll just do i plus equals one and just go to the next index number. The first number is zero and it meets this condition. So now we look at index number one. This looks good for even numbers. Next, we look at the odd numbers. If it's an odd number, we need to swap. For this, we'll say numbers i and numbers j, so our last index number in our list. We'll swap these two, so it'll be numbers j, then numbers i. In other programming languages, you'll see numbers i stored in temp and numbers j stored in numbers i, then followed by temp stored in numbers j. You might see this in other programming languages, but in Python, we don't need to place them in temp. All we need is just this one line, and these other lines of placing them in temp is not necessary. So back to Python. When we encounter an odd number, we need to move it to the back. For this, we'll do minus one for j. This should work now, so let's change this v1 down below to v2 and run our code. We've run our code now and to the right we have in the beginning half 0, 8, 6, 4, 2, 4, which are all even numbers. And to the right we have 1, 5, 9, 3, 1, which are all odd numbers. For those who want to see the process of the swaps, it's possible by writing print numbers. We'll run our code again and we'll see the process of the swaps. Reviewing each step and how one step has changed from the next may be good in understanding the code better. So the key point of this problem is that we can write the code even without preparing a new list. Python has a garbage collector, so it can automatically free blocks of memory that are no longer used. In other languages, you may have to keep in mind about not wasting memory and an interviewer may want to see if you're conscious about not wasting memory. But in Python, that's not really an issue. The key point with this problem is to write a code without preparing a new list. And also being able to swap the numbers around using this code.
This is a very basic code for swapping position of two items, so this is important. Other than that, we have type hints, and this is available from Python 3.5. So this isn't that important, but if you want to be a Python expert for 3.5, this may be good to know. This problem is pretty simple, but if you're asked this kind of problem during an interview, you should practice so that you'll be able to quickly write the code for it. First, let's go over our problem. This problem is also easy, so we'll write the solution, but make changes and variations along the way. And this is our problem. Our input is this. It's a list with these numbers. And on the right, we have numbers here, and these are index numbers. We want to refer to these numbers to rearrange the letters. And for our output, we want to be able to return the word Python. Let me get into more details. For example, this zero. In Python, we start off with the number zero in our list. And this zero corresponds with this P. So this P is the first letter. Then we look at one. One corresponds to this Y. And Y is the next letter. Next, we look at two. And this corresponds to this T. So this T comes next in our output. So the idea is we look at these letters and the corresponding index number. We look at the numbers to rearrange and arrive at our output of Python. That's our problem, and let's get started with writing the code for this. We'll begin by writing from typing import list. Then we'll define our function as order change by indexes, then v1 for version 1. This will be our easiest solution. Our input will be a list containing a string in chars and list of integers in indexes. Output will be a string. So how will we approach this? We'll first prepare an empty list. So in order to do this, we'll write temp and store none for now. Then multiply it by the length of the characters. Let's see what this does. So in order to see our result, we'll print temp and write if name underscore underscore main. We'll write w for word and copy from our input from above. And then for i, which is indexes, we'll copy from above and paste. These will be our inputs, and we want to pass these into our function. We'll enter order change by indexes v1, and we'll pass in our w and i. When we run our code, we see none, printed a total of six times. So this is a list with six nuns. The easiest way to solve this problem is to include the six letters ordered by their index numbers into this list. We'll do that from now by first saying for i, then index and enumerate. Along with the index number, we'll run our for loop and retrieve the number in our index. How will we do this? We'll do this by saying temp index, and in this, chars i will be stored. So what does this mean? This means that in this enumerate, i is zero. So chars zero will point to this h. This h here, when we look to the right, it's this three. At this enumerate indexes, index is 3. So we're saying h should be placed in the 10th index number 3 position. And we'll repeat the same process by using our loop and then for our temp. Let's look at our temp. So we'll print temp to see our results. We see on the right the letters python in our list. This confirms that our letters are in the correct order. Now all we have to do is say return then use a join function for a temp to return our results as a string. We'll say print and run our results. And to the right, we see the word Python. This confirms that our code is running properly. This is v1, and it's pretty simple. Let's say now that an interviewer asks you to write the solution without creating a temp list. We have this original list with characters. You may be asked to reorder the letters and don't create a new list like this, and display the string. Let's try to solve this problem, and for this, let's name our solution as v2. I'm going to copy and paste from above, and this will be v2, so I'm going to rewrite this to v2. First, how will we approach this? I'm going to explain by writing like so. We have these letters, and then down below, I'll write the corresponding numbers, 315024. When we run our for loop, we start with i equals 0. So here we have 
H, and 3, meaning 0 isn't coming in first. In this situation, to bring this index number 3 to the correct position, we have to swap this 3 with the number in the index number 3 position, which will be this 0. We'll need to swap, so counting from this 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. 0 is in the third position. That means we'll swap this 0 and 3. At this time, we change the corresponding letter along with it, meaning we'll swap this H and P. This index number 0 and 0 matches. So then we'll run our next loop and look at this. Next, I will be 1. 1 and 1 matches, so this Y is fine as is. Next, we look at I equals 2. When we look at I equals 2, we don't have a 2 here, but have a 5. This should be listed in our fifth position. So we'll bring these values to our index number 5 position and swap. That will point to this 4, so this 5 and 4 will swap places. And at the same time, we'll swap the letters along with it. Next, we look at this 2 and 4. These values still don't match. In this case, we need to bring this 4 to the correct position. Index number 4 position is this 2. So we'll swap the 2 around. So this will be 2 and this will be 4. At the same time, we'll also swap the letters. Now we've reached the end and we see that the index numbers are listed in the correct order from 0 to 5. And looking at the corresponding letters, they've been reordered and we see that they're in the correct order now. Now that we're done going over the steps with this visual, but let's get to writing the code. First, we want to start with i as 0 and also write len indexes to identify the length of our indexes to run our loop. And now, how will we write our loop? We'll say while i is less than len indexes, we'll run our loop. This part is probably not that difficult to understand. And next, we move on i is 0 at first, but we look at whether this i is the same value as the indexes i. Again, i is at first 0. Indexes 0 points to this 3. 0 and 3 are two different numbers, and that means we have to start rearranging. We need to rearrange or swap places until i equals indexes i. We'll do this by saying that the indexes i is the index you want to swap. How we swap is by first taking the chars index and chars i. We'll swap these two around, so we'll write chars i, then chars index. The letters here coming in at index number 0 and 3 will swap. We also need to look at our list for index and swap this 3 and 0 around. We'll do that by writing indexes index, then indexes i, and then write those two in the reverse order, and include a comma to separate out the two. We need to repeat this process until this i matches indexes i. This means while i's value is different from indexes i's value, we'll keep on repeating. Once i matches indexes i, we can exit the loop. And regarding this, we don't have to add 1 to i. After we exit the loop, we need to look at the next character, so we'll say i plus equals 1. Now all we have to do is say return, then use a join function, and make chars a string. We'll rewrite this print statement to v2, and run our code. When we do, we see on the right the word python. This code works properly, and if you can write your code like this, that's great. And this is v1, and this is simple. It's easy to understand, but it's not that uncommon for interviewers to ask you to write a code without creating a new list like this. In case you're asked to do this, it may be a good idea to practice jotting down your approach on a whiteboard and then writing your code like this, like the one you see in v2. First, let's go over our problem. This time, our problem is about phone number mnemonics in Python. In the US, phone number displays are often in this format, where we have the numbers and also alphabets. This 1 contains a voice message symbol. This 2 contains A, B, C, meaning that this 2 button can be pressed in place of A, B, and C. With the same concept, 3 can be D, E, F, and 4 can represent G, H, I. We see that there are alphabet letters assigned to the numbers. We use these alphabets to create a telephone number that can be easily read. As an example, I have on the left this telephone number here. 
On the right side, we have the letters spelling love python, which is a group of letters that can be easily remembered. When we want to display these letters in numbers, first we figure out where L is located on the right. L is this 5. That's why our first number is this 5. But if we input 5, it could be recognized as L, but it can also mean J or K, since those are also associated with the number 5. The next letter is O. This O on our keypad to the right would be this 6. So that's why we have 6 as the second number here. When we repeat the process for all letters in Love Python, we get this telephone number. Now let's look at our next example of Hello World. The first letter in this word is H. Looking to the right, H is 4 on the keypad. That's why the first number in our telephone number here is 4. So Hello World will result in this telephone number. This time when we have this telephone number as our input, there are many letter combinations that are possible. For example, with this 5, we have L here, but this 5 could stand for J, so it would be J-O-V-E Python. That's one possibility. That's why in our output, we have dot 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 dot, since there are many possibilities other than Love Python. For the solution to our problem, we want our code to display all the outputs possible for a numerical telephone number. Now that we've gone over the problem and know what to do, let's get to writing the code. Our output is a list, so we'll first write from typing import list. Then we'll say num alphabet mapping. We'll associate a number with its corresponding letter or symbol here. So what does this mean? On the right, we have zero. We'll write zero here. And when we have zero, what letter or symbol is on the keypad? We have a plus. For one, we see on the right a symbol for voice message. In other terminals, sometimes the at mark is assigned to one. So let's write at mark. And repeating this process for two, it's A, B, C that are assigned. And for three, it's D, E, and F. Next is four, which has G, H, I, and 5 is JKL, and 6 is MNO, 7 is PQRS, and 8 is TUV, and 9 is WXYZ. We've mapped out the number along with the alphabetical symbols now. Next, moving on to our function, we'll define it as phone mnemonic v1 for version 1, and we'll work on another version later. First, we'll say phone number, and for our input, it'll be a string. And our output will be a string, including all possible letter combinations, like this. So we'll say a list that includes strings. And that's going to be our output for this function. Now, let's think about how to approach this question. When we have as our input a telephone number like this with hyphens, First, we need to remove the hyphens, and then make it into a string, and store it in a list. For example, we'll have 5, 6, and 8, and so on. We'll store these in a list first. This will make it easier to manage. And another thing, this number is very long. We'll use 2 and 3 as our input to make it easier to understand. So let's say we're working with a telephone number that's two digits long. And when we look at 2 and 3, 2 is associated with A, B, C and 3 is D, E, F. So what are the possible combinations? The first letter for 2 is A. A and the bottom first letter, D. So A, D is one possibility. Next, we take the second number for the 3. So we have E. So we have the combination A, E. And next, we have A, F. We'll repeat the same, but start with B. That means we'll have B, D, B, E, then B, F. And same with our C, our combination C, D, C, E, and C, F. This time, we only have two letters, but even if we have more digits, the process of coming up with the combinations will be the same. So first, we'll pick up the first digit in order to figure out the alphabetical values for it. So we'll take this A, B, C, and use a for loop to look at all the possibilities for A, B, C. When calling on A, we recursively call out the same function, 
but this time we look at this three and run it with a loop. We'll list D, E, and F, and then say that we come up with the combo A, D. We'll store this A, D in temp and store the letters A and D. When we store this, this A and D's length is two. Then we know that the length of this phone number is also two. So if this AD also has a length of two, it becomes a candidate for our solution. And therefore, we can store it in our list. So here I'll draw a list and also say add, meaning we'll add AD into our list. After we're done adding, the next one we call A, we run the loop recursively and we now have the combination AE. We'll store this A and E in temp. This A is still going to be the first letter here, and next is going to be E. This AE is also two digits long, so we'll add this as a candidate. After we're done looking at all the combinations for A, then we move on to B. We repeat the same process and look at D, E, and F. For this code, we're going to use recursion. So instead of me trying to explain everything with this, it may be easier to understand by writing the actual code. So let's get to writing it now. As I mentioned earlier, this phone number includes hyphens. So the first step is to remove them. We'll replace the hyphen with a space. Then we want to make each value an integer. And to do this, we'll use this comprehension and write int s for s in. With this, we made all values into an integer. We'll store this in phone number. Then we'll prepare an empty list for our candidate. And for our temp, we'll first prepare an empty space, then multiply it by len phone number, so the length of our phone number. Then we're going to create an inner function, and the name of this function is going to be find candidate alphabet. We'll start off with digit and use zero as our default. And we'll increase this digit one by one and increase until we reach the same number of digits as our phone number by using recursion. And our output will be none. And here we'll write phone number, then digit. The digit at first will be this zero. This refers to the digit that's in the zero position. Let me explain a little more. Let's say for our phone number, we have the number two and three. In this case, digit zero will refer to this two. We want to run our for loop using the digit that refers to this two. So we'll say num alphabet mapping. Here we mapped our two as being ABC. So we'll run this using our for loop. So we'll write for char n, and we're now looking at A. After we take this A, we'll say temp digit. And for now, for our very first letter for our temp, we're going to place char. And this will mean that we have a and temp. Then we'll go down below and we'll find candidate alphabet and pass in using recursion. We'll pass in our current digit plus one. This digit plus one will call our find candidate alphabet here. So in our next loop, this phone number's index number will change to one. Then this three, which is the second digit of this number, this will be index number one, so digit plus one. The index number for our digit plus one is three, and the key for this is DEF. This DEF will be called with our for loop. Then down below in for chart in num alphabet mapping, we'll pick up this D. So for this temp digit, the digit is currently one. So in the ones place for the temp, D will be stored. Then we'll call find candidate alphabet. Right now our digit is one, and when we add one to that, it'll be two. We don't have index number two for our output. So at this time, we'll store the contents of our temp into candidate. Before calling our next statement, we'll write a if statement. If our digit is the same length as our phone number, then we'll say candidate append, then use a join statement and say join temp. And this ad is currently stored in temp, 
So we'll include this AD into candidate now. This is just an example, so I'm going to delete what I just wrote and also write AD as a memo on the side. Now that we've gone this far, we don't need to look at the next alphabet. Here we'll say if else, and we don't need to call the next for loop. All we have to do is include for inside of else. That means that when we append candidate at this point, we don't need to call on find candidate alphabet. And at this point regarding A and D, we're done. Now going back to our previous recursion, when we go back, our next alphabet here will be E. And that means right now in our temp, as you can see from above, A and D are included, but at this char, we're replacing this A and D now with A and E. And again, we'll call using find candidate alphabet, and next we'll meet the criteria for the digit being the same as the length of the phone number. And that means we now include this A and E into our candidate. Continuing on, we'll get A and F next is our candidate. And this for loop, once it's all completed, we'll go back to the previous recursive. But at the very beginning, what was A? We're now calling on B here. And we'll repeat the same steps that were performed for A. We currently have A and F stored in candidate here. But at this time, the starting letter will be B. And then for our second letter, we'll start from D this time. We call on this using recursion. So this inner function, we have to call find candidate alphabet. And at the end, all our possible combinations are stored in candidate, so we'll return candidate. And now I'm going to remove the unnecessary parts and get ready to run our code. So last part, we'll say if name, then underscore underscore main. Our function name is phone mnemonic v1, and to make it easier to understand, let's just input 2, 3. We'll print the results and run our code. When we do, we see on the right side our results. AD, AE, AF, BD, BE, BF, CDC, CF. We're able to confirm that these answers are correct. Now let's change this two-digit number to a three-digit number. When we run our code, we see all the possible three-digit solutions to our right, and this confirms that our code is working properly. This does work correctly, and now let's use the phone number we listed as our input at the top and see if it works. When we do, we see all the possible solutions. This list of possible solutions is very long, as you can see. Let's see if LovePython is actually included in this list. Let's run a for loop to find out. So we'll say for s in and if love python in s, meaning if love python is actually in our results, then we'll print s. When we run our code, we see love python is included in the list of possible candidates. We've completed this v1 using temp, and now we want to create v2 not using temp, but instead using stack. We'll copy and paste from v1 and we write v1 to v2. What we do for v2 is really similar to v1. Regarding how we approach this, we use recursion here for v1. But for v2, we won't use recursion, but instead we'll use stack. So first, let's discuss how this is going to be done. Let's say we have 2 and 3 as our input for our telephone number. This 2 is associated with a, B, C and the 3 is associated with D, E, F. We take this A, B, C and run a loop. We first include A, B, C in stack. So I'm going to draw a picture here with A, B, C in our stack. Then we have our second digit, which is 3. For this loop, we have D, E, F. Instead of stacking D, E, F on top of this stack, we have this top element C and we remove this and create a set using C. That means when we run a loop with D, E, F, we are creating C, D, C, E, and C, F. Then these letter combos are added to the stack. Now, instead of C, we'll have C, D, then C, E, then C, F in our stack. After this is processed, then we go to our next for loop. At this time, we remove our top element, so cf, and after confirming that our input is two digits, 
We then store this in our list in candidate. So the CF is two digits and meets the criteria. So we'll remove it from our stack and use a pen to add it to our candidate. We'll do the same for CE. We'll take it out and add. Same with CD. We'll take it out and add it to our candidate. Then what's left in our stack is A and B. When we're going to take out B, and when we do, B is just the first letter. So in this case, we run the loop using the letters associated with the second digit, which is D, E, and F. So just like before, we'll have the letter combos. In this case, it'll be B, D, B, E, and B, F. We'll create these letter combos and add them in stack. This B will be removed and then B, D, B, E, and B, F will be added to our stack. Then in our next loop, B, D, B, E, B, F are two letters each. So we take these out and add them in candidate. We repeat the same process for A and we'll create the letter combos A, D, A, E, and A, F. We'll remove A and add these into our stack. Then we'll take the sets out and add to our candidate. This visually doesn't look great with all the lines and scribbles, so let's continue writing our code. This is v2, and the first two lines are fine. This temp we used in v1, but we'll replace this with stack, and don't need to specify as the length of the phone number. This section where we used recursion, we'll replace with while len stack. And we'll continue running this until our stack becomes empty. We'll say alphabets and use pop to take out the contents of stack. Right now, stack is empty, as you can see here. When we take out the contents of stack, the length of the letters, so we'll write if len alphabets, and if that is the same length as the length of our phone number, then we'll use append to add our alphabets into candidate. Now down below, we have num alphabet mapping, and we'll change this to say len alphabets. This alphabets that we picked out with the use of pop here. At first, our stack is empty right now, so this is zero. So our phone number, for example, let's say our phone number includes two and three. The letter associated with two is ABC. So this part is where we take out A, then we erase this and the bottom two. And at the same time, we'll say stack append alphabets plus char. Alphabets is empty right now and adding our char A results in A. We just added this A in our stack. So the contents of this stack is currently A. And in this loop here, we're running A, B, C. So in our stack, A, B, and C, these three letters are included. We currently have three letters in stack. After completing this, we move on to the next loop. We take out the alphabets from pop, and now we're taking out C. This time we take C and look at this for loop. The length of our alphabet is currently one. The index number one for our phone number is three. So this time, D, E, F will be taken out from this for loop. Currently, our alphabet stores C, so we get C, D, C, E, and C, F. We'll stack this, and now we're adding C, D, C, E, and C, F into our stack. After we've added this to stack, we go to the next loop, and we take out C, F in our alphabet stack pop. When we take it out, C, F is removed, and next, if len alphabets will be two digits, so we'll add this to candidate append alphabets. Next, we'll return to our while loop and we'll run the code from this section and repeat the process for CE. CE is removed and then added to our candidate. We repeat the process for CD. Now we're only left with A and B. B is the one that's gonna be removed next. B is removed here and B is going to be removed from stack. Next, we look at our phone number len alphabets. Three is associated with D, E, F. So at this stack append, B, D, B, E, 
and BF are added. So I'll include these combos into our stack, BD, BE, and BF. This is the code for V2, and this is V2 and not V1. So we'll rewrite this to V2. We'll run our code, and we see the word love Python. We'll comment out this if statement, and let's confirm that all our results are being returned. So we'll print S. Let's see our results. So we see that we have all results. Now let's see if love Python is printed. And yes, we do see love Python. Regarding this v2, when we're using stack, we can write the code without using recursion. For v1, as you recall, we used recursion. During an actual interview, you may be asked specifically to write the code using recursion or write the code using stack. Knowing how to write these two different codes may be useful. And this last part of the lecture is just an extra activity. Let's say for our phone number here, we want to write the code using new type. What does this mean? So with from typing, we'll import list and then write new type. Down below, we'll write phone alphabet and use new type function to say that our phone number alphabet is all letters. So we'll write phone alphabet, and these are all letters, so we'll write str for string. Then in our num alphabet mapping, we'll enclose the symbol with phone alphabet. For example, this add symbol is saying that no other symbol or letter will be included in phone alphabet. This makes it easier to understand and read the code. We'll do the same with the at mark for our number one. And we'll continue down our list and include phone alphabet. By doing this, it makes it easier to understand what type of string it is. And as a result, it'll make it easier to read the code. But one thing to remember is that if you're not used to this typing, then it may actually make it more confusing to read the code. So please just remember, this is just personal preference as to whether you want to use typing or not. We're done typing here, and down below, we have our function phone mnemonic v1. Regarding this phone number, it would be nice to know what type phone number is, right? To make this easier to read, you can also say that it's a list with integers. Then down below, we have this candidate here. For candidate, you can write that it's a list that contains phone alphabet. For temp, we can say it's also a list with phone alphabet. I'm going to copy these two lines here and remove these bottom lines. But regarding this stack too, we can state that it's a list containing phone alphabet. And also with this char, what type is this? The type is phone alphabet. So we can include phone alphabet here and same goes for this stack append. It's a phone alphabet string. Now we'll run our code again. I'm going to run our v2 and we don't get any errors and we get the word love python. Let's run our code for v1 now. What we do, love python is also displayed. So what we did is created a new type and we stated what phone alphabet is. Then we noted how our list contains our values in phone alphabet. We also stated how when added to our list, we use the letters in phone alphabet. This new type helper function makes it easier to see what type it is. And this new type is something that's just interesting to know and not a requirement. But if your team is active in using this, it may be good for you to be able to use it too. And in this problem, we are dealing with a group of letters like A, B, C, and we looked at each letter to create a list of possible combinations. This kind of question is commonly asked during interviews. So please make sure you're able to answer it. はい、ということで問題確認していきたいんですけども、今回は素数を生成する関数を作ってくださいということですね。なので、インプットで例えば50という数値を与えたら、50までの中にある素数をアウトプットで出力するという風になりますので、2とか3とか5というのは、1か自分自身でしか割り切れない素数になりますので、50までに存在する素数をこのようにリストにして、表示する関数を作ってくださいと。というのが、はい、ということでやっていきたいんですけども、まずはタイピングのインポートでリストを返すということなので、こちらで、えー、ジェネレイト、えー、プライムズということで、今回もですね、まあ、とりあえずバージョン1ということで、まずは簡単なやり方からやっていきたいんですけども、インプットとしてこちらインテージャーです
ね。で、帰りはリストで、こちらイントを返してやるというふうにします。で、どのようにアプローチするかなんですけども、例えばインプットはこちら50ということであれば、まあ1から50まで一つ一つそれが素数かどうかということをですね、まあ、ホーループで回してやって確かめていけばいいですよね。なので、こちら F の X のインのレンジとやって、1は飛ばして2からですね。で、これでナンバーの、例えばこれが50だとしたら、これレンジなのでこれプラス1してやれば全部50まで拾えますよね。と、このようにまずはホーループで回すんですね。で、プライムズということで、まあ、素数を入れられるリストの空のものを用意しておいて、で、ここでですね、法の今度は y にするんですけども、in のレンジで2から x まで取り出してやると。まあ、例えばこの x というのは50であれば、まあ、2から50までですので、2とか3とか4とか5とか増えてきますよね。で、例えばこの x が10になりますよね。で、これが10だとしたら、2から10までので、if の x で割ることの y、こちらの余りが0ということであれば、これは素数ではないですよね。例えば、まあ、x が10で、こちら y が2になれば、10割る2は5で余りが0ですよね。ってことは10は2で割り切れるので、もうその時点でこれ素数じゃないということなので、このフォーループはこれブレイクで抜けてしまうんですね。で、例えばこちらの x が11だとしますよね。で、その際にはこちらレンジで2から試すんですけども、この11を2で割っても余りが出ますので、割り切れないですよね。で、次にこれ3で試して、4で試して、5で試してということで、この y を増やしていって、すべてこれ割り切れないので、まあそうするとこの if ブレイク文に引っかからないですよね。で、その際にはこちら 4else 構文で、プライムズにアペンドで x を入れてあればこれが素数になるということですね。まあ、この 4else 構文なんですけども、4else 構文はこの4がすべて完了したら最後にこちらをやりますので、途中でこのブレイクが行われた場合はこちら引っかからないですよね。なので、次のループに行くというふうになります。はい、ということで、えー、こちらもですね、えー、実際に表示してやってみたいので、こちらプライムズをリターンで返してやって、あとは、えー、実際にですね、えー、こちらから、えー、やってみたいと思います。ということで、ジェネレートプライムズ v1 ですね。こちらに、まあ、例えば50というふうにしますよね。これで、えー、プリントで表示させてみるということをまずはやってみたいと思います。はい。ということで、私右手にこれ実行した結果を表示させたんですけども、このようにですね、2357111、13、13ということで、素数がリストに入って表示されたというふうになりました。はい。ということで、これはですね、まあ、非常に簡単で、一つ一つこれ、フォーループで、まあ、全部の数を引っ張ってきて、それが2から徐々に増やしていって割り切れるかどうかということを確認している単純なものですよね。ただこのソースコードはですね、非常にこれ、フォーループが1回あって、その中にまたさらにこれ、フォーループがあってですね、まあ、非常にこれ、時間かかるということになりますので、まあ、これをもうちょっと早くなるように、これ、パフォーマンスを上げるようなやり方で書いてくださいというふうに言われると思うんですね。なので、その部分をですね、次にやりたいと思います。はい、ということで、こちら V1 とあるんですけども、今度はこちら V2 ですね。V2 というような形にして、今からやっていきたいと思います。はい、そうしましたら、まずは、えー、プライムズのカラーのリストを用意しておいて、で、あとはですね、こちらにキャッシュということで、ディクショナリーのキャッシュを用意。で、まずは4の x の in のレンジの2のナンバーのプラス1という、ここのホーループの部分は一緒で、まずはホーループで一つ一つ数値を取り出すんですね。で、今回はこちらインプットが50ということであれば、これ2、3、4、5ということで、えー、これどんどんと、えー、50までですね。まずはフォーループでこれ数値取ってきますよね。で、一番初めのこの2を調べた後なんですけども、この2というのはこれ偶数なので、まあ、例えば2を、えー、調べますよね。その時に4、6、8というのはこれも素数じゃないので、後々これ調べなくていいですよね。なのでこういった情報をキャッシュに入れておくわけですね。で、これ2は素数なので、これ丸ということですよね。で、その次にこの3を調べるんですけども、この3が素数だということであれば、この倍数は3、6、次9ですよね。9が×で、12もこれ×ですよね。ということであれば、まあ、後々この数を増やしていった時に、この4とか6とか8とか9、まあ、こういったものは素数ではないということが分かってますので、この情報をキャッシュに入れておいて飛ばせば、上のこちらの V1 よりも、We're going to continue on. And a 5 should be placed here and a 7 here. About the 7, we have before this 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. If the 7 isn't a multiple of any of these previous numbers, then it's a prime number. We look at all the previous numbers to determine if a specific number is a prime number. If it isn't a multiple of the previous numbers, then it's a prime number. This is how we will proceed 
but this may still be difficult to understand, so let's get to writing the code. First, we'll write is prime and store cache get x. That's what we need to find out, and we're still in the initial stage, so there's nothing in our cache. Next, our condition is if is prime is false. In that case, we'll continue. At first, we're still in our initial stage, so there's nothing in our cache. So we'll move on to our next line. Next, about this x. Let's say our number is 50. So we first look at 2. This 2 is a prime number, so we store 2 in primes append. Then, for this 2 in cache, we say it's true, since it's a prime number. Then, we say for y in range, and x multiplied by 2. In this case, it's 2 times 2, so 4. Our range is 4 up until 50, and increasing in multiples of 2, meaning all even numbers. Even numbers larger than 2 won't be a prime number, so we store false in cache y. In this cache, we already have noted that even numbers are false. So even if we have an even number for x, for example, let's say 4, we'll insert 4 for x, so we'll get cache get 4, and we'll return false for this if statement. That means that we'll continue to the next loop. So with even numbers, we don't need to check one by one to see if it's a prime number. And in this loop, after x equals 2, x will be 3. Regarding 3, 3 isn't included in this cache, so we'll append 3, and after that, we'll insert it in here, and multiples of 3, like 6, 9, 12, will return false. After 3 will be 4. 4 is an even number, so it means it meets the criteria for the if prime is false. Next is 5. 5 is a prime number, so we'll include it in our list for prime numbers, and include data that multiples like 10, 15, 20 should return false. Repeating this process for numbers up to 50, then all we need to do is return primes, and then we're going to go down and print our version 2. So here we're going to change this v1 to v2. Let's run our code, and when we do, we get the same numbers for v1 and v2. This v1 and v2, what's the difference in speed? We can do that by importing time. Then we'll write start time time. Then print time time minus start. We'll repeat the code now for version 2 for this. I'll copy and paste to modify for version 2, and let's run our code to see the difference in speed. When we do, on the right we see 7.5 and 2.4. Version 2 is much faster. Now, how much difference in time exists between the two versions? Let's look into this further by adding i equals 0 in our first for loop. We have the inner loop here and we'll add i plus equals 1, and we'll write the same line under our else statement. Then we'll print i and also v1 for version 1. We'll repeat the same for our version 2. We'll first change our print statement to version 2, then i equals 0, and inside this for loop we'll say i plus equals 1. We want to see how many times the loops run, and when we run our code, we see that the loop is run 365 times. For version 2, it's 62 times. We were able to confirm that the number of times our for loop is run is less for version 2, and therefore version 2 is the faster code. Now I'll delete the lines containing i, and if you're able to write your code like this, that's great. And also, we're returning our output as a list, but you can use a generator for this to increase the speed. We'll test this using a generator by adding another version. This version will be v3. We'll remove the line for returning the primes in a list, and also remove this line and include yield x to return x as is. Then we don't need to return our output in a list, so we'll delete this return primes. And also for our output, we'll scroll up and after list, include generator. Next, we'll scroll down to our version 3. And for our output for version 3, we'll include generator with integer. None and none. So our output will be generator. Now to see the number of times the loop is run in v3, we'll copy and change this to print i for i in generate primes, since you want to use list comprehension for our results. 
and we'll rewrite this to v3. This time we want to see the results for v3, so let's run our code. When we run our code, we see on the right 7.9, 2.69, 2.5. We see that using generator makes the code run a little faster. So comparing three versions, we see that v3 is the fastest. If you can write the code for this, then that's great. There are many more solutions to this problem, and some are more complicated and involve a deeper understanding of mathematics. Being able to write a code that is really complicated for this might not be that necessary. But to test yourself on whether you understand general coding, being able to use something like cache and being able to run a code faster than our top code with v1 should be enough. And if you are asked to write something like this v3 or need to include codes that refer to multiples of a number, but you forget to do that, the interviewer may give you advice or hints. If you're able to communicate well with the interviewer and in the end be able to write a code like this, then that should be enough. Here on the right, I have a diagram indicating prime numbers. Prime numbers are numbers that have only two factors, one and themselves. One is an exception and it isn't prime number. Two can only be divided by one and two, so it is a prime number. The same goes for three. It can only be divided by one and three. Next, we have four. Four can be divided by one, two, and four, so it isn't a prime number. Five factors are one and five, so it is a prime number. Next is six, and it can be divided by one, two, three, and six. So there's four factors, so it isn't a prime number. We can repeat the process and look at each one of these numbers, but this diagram shows all the prime numbers in yellow. The squares that aren't in yellow are the numbers that aren't prime numbers. On the left here, we have a problem with this list of numbers as the input. When we pass in these numbers as our input, we want to see if these numbers like 1 and 2 are prime numbers. We want to create a function that converts these values to a boolean value, returning either true or false. That's our problem that we want to solve. I have prime number written here, and below I have some prime numbers listed. When these prime numbers are included in our input, we want to return true. And down below we have non-prime number, so numbers that aren't prime numbers. In that case, we want to return false. We want to write a code that will make this possible. Let's get to writing our code. Our function name will be is underscore prime. Naming a function that's easy to type and remember will make it easier to write the code. Our input will be number with data type as integer. Our output will be bool. This isn't the way to write it for Python 2, but in Python 3, this is the way to write it. Regarding the function name, in an actual coding interview, you might be asked to write the code on a whiteboard. If you abbreviate and say def f for the function name, the interviewer might assume that you're not used to naming function names. A function name that's simple and easy to understand is recommended. Other than this f, if you name the function judge or p for prime, or maybe pri, it's confusing. Instead of confusing function names, using names like is prime, since this is a function for determining if a number is a prime number or not, is much better. Next is regarding our input. We might have a number like 10 as our num, and we need to see if this 10 can be divided by 1, 2, 3, and so on. We'll look at each number to see if it's a factor of 10. This is probably the easiest way to solve this problem. There are other ways to solve this problem, so we'll name this as v1 for version 1 for this approach. First, we have if num lesser or equal to 1, since any number that's lesser or equal to 1 isn't a prime number. We'll return false for this. Next, we need to look at each number greater than 1 and see if they can be divided by other numbers. For this, we'll use a for loop. We'll write 4i in range, then 2 up to num for storing values in i. I'll open up my terminal and say python3. We have our interactive shell and we'll use list comprehension to see how this all works out. We'll write i for i in range 2 up to 10. We get the values 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We don't include the 10, but stop at 9 to see if there are any factors. If there is a factor, then that means that it isn't a prime number, so we'll just need to return false. Now going back to our code, we ran the loop and now we can divide the num by i. If the remainder of the quotient is 0, then it isn't a prime number, so we'll return false. 
In the end, if a number doesn't meet any of these conditions, then it is a prime number, so we'll return true. Now let's test this out. We'll write if name underscore underscore main. This is a basic code in Python. And next, the print statement is pretty simple too. We'll write is prime v1 and run using the number 10. And when we do run this code, 10 isn't prime number, so we see the word false down below. Let's test the code out using one of these prime numbers here. Let's use the number 5. So we'll rewrite this and run the code and we see the word true down below. So we were able to confirm that our function is working properly. But this is simple code and in an actual interview, you probably won't be asked a question requesting you to write this code. This code is a code that would be best if you could write fairly quickly. Next, let's say writing this code is easy for you. It's too simple, so you may be asked to write a unit test by an interviewer. So from now, let's try writing a unit test. First, we'll write import and import unit test. We want to call the code to the left, so we'll write from main, import, and the function we just created, which is, is prime v1. We'll import this. Later on, we want to create another version. So for this time, I'm going to include as, then is prime. Then we'll say class, and we can name the class anything, but we'll say prime test, unit test, test case. First, we'll say def test is prime okay. We want to test the code to see if it can correctly determine if a number is a prime number or not. For this, I'm going to copy this prime number list and write for i in and paste the list here. Then we'll use self assert true and is prime i to see if these numbers all return true. That's how we test the code out. Next, def test is prime no and then for i in then insert the non-prime number list here. Similar to last time, we'll do self assert, but this time we'll do false and call is prime and include i. And let's say you want to test negative numbers. In this case, we'll say def test is prime and then negative. In this case, we'll write self assert and it'll be false. So we'll write false, then is prime and let's say negative one. And one other point, we have integers for num, but if we include a string, we'll get a type error. So is testing that out necessary? That really isn't the purpose of this interview question. So you could ask the interviewer, should I confirm using raise type error exception, or should I create handling exceptions for when the values aren't integers? If you are going to create a condition for this, it would be if type num is not int. In that case, you would return false. If the interviewer says displaying type error is fine, then the code as is, is fine. When you're having this discussion with the interviewer, the interviewer may ask you to write the unit test to test for a type error here. To be prepared for a situation like this, being able to write a type error unit test may be useful too. For example, we write def test is prime raise type error. Then in the next line with self assert raises. By using this with statement, we can check whether what we'll be writing below will probably be caught. This is the unit test to test this. An interviewer may test you to see if you're familiar with this area too. So continuing on, we'll write type error and is prime, then we'll pass in string. Type error will be displayed when we pass in string, so we'll be able to catch this here and pass our unit test. You may be asked during interview about how to write the code for this section of the unit test. Now let's continue on with our unit test and confirm that it works. We'll write if name, then main. Next, it's unit test, main. Then we'll run our code. Let's run our code and we see on the bottom here, ran four tests. Then down below, OK, meaning we passed all four tests. Just to test our unit test, let's include one here. When we enter one and run our unit test, our results show failures one, indicating that we failed one test. In an actual interview, you may be tested on whether you can write the code for unit tests like this. It may be a good idea to know how to write unit tests too. Now that we've passed our unit test, 
we have is prime v1 here. But an integrator may say that the performance isn't that great. Let's say you were able to write this, but an interview may ask you to rewrite it so that it performs better. This is a common request in coding questions in the Silicon Valley and other areas. Being able to write the codes for this V1 and unit test is something that isn't special. Writing the code that will increase performance is the next step, and this step may be a little advanced. There are many ways to write the code for this, but this may just be a question of whether you're familiar with the code or not. For this reason, it's questionable as to whether this is a good coding interview question or not. So next, let's look into another way to write the code and name it v2. Regarding our speed in v1, when we look at all numbers from 2 up to let's say 9, we have to work on this one by one. Our goal with v2 is to reduce the number of times we need to look at the numbers. Down below, I'm going to write something that will be like a hint. For example, let's say our input is 36. 36 is the product for 1 times 36. Other variations are 2 times 18. Then we have 3 times 12 is another solution. We also have 4 times 9. 5 isn't a factor of 36, so next is 6. 6 times 6 is 36. After this, instead of 4 times 9, we have 9 times 4. The numbers we previously listed are reversed from here. For example, we'll change 3 times 12 to 12 times 3. Same with 2 and 18, we'll reverse the order to 18 and 2. So the bottom half here is just a process of reversing the numbers from the top half. We only need to look at the numbers up to this 6 times 6 and don't need to look at the numbers after the 6. Let's think about this a little more. I'm going to write square root n, meaning the square root of 36 is 6. Of course, you may have values like 37 or 38, but the key point here is that you only need to calculate up to the square root of n, and you don't need to look at the numbers after that. This will increase the performance. And this is the section we want to be able to write. It would be great if you knew how to approach and write the code for this during an interview. But even if you didn't, an interviewer may give you some hints like this. When the interviewer gives you this information, will you be able to write the code? It's okay if you aren't able to immediately write the code when asked to do so. What's important is that you have the ability and knowledge to write a code when given hints like this. This may be a skill that an interviewer may be looking for. So continuing on, we'll start off with if none and say less than or equal to 1. This should return false. Next, we want to use square roots, so we'll import math. And then I'm going to create some space here. So I'm going to hit return, and I'm going to start writing from here. For this time, we'll say for i in range. Previously, if you recall, we wrote 2 to none. But this time, it will be 2 to math square root and store none. When we have numbers like 37 and 38, this might result in decimals. So we'll include math floor to round a number down to the nearest integer and return the result. Then we'll add 1. When we use this range, we can't stop here at the 4, but need to look at this too, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values. When we don't add 1, that means we'll stop at this 4, so that's why we add 1 here. This may be difficult to understand, so I'll copy the range here and open up my terminal. We'll import math, and for this num, let's store 37. We'll print, then i for i in range, and run our code. The numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are printed. We see that our results will look at the numbers up to this point. Now, just like before, all we need to write is if num percent i, then 0. And if condition is met, return false. If the condition isn't met, then return true. That's all there is to it. We created version 1 and version 2, and let's say we want to also know which version runs faster. For this, we'll import time and import random since we want to randomly create numbers. Then down below, we'll use list comprehension to say numbers, then random. Rand int with range 0 to 1000 to randomly select numbers within this range then 4 in range, 
and let's say we want to run it 100,000 times. We'll want to display the start time, so we'll say start equals time time, and then for num in numbers, for our loop, and store num in is prime v1. I'm going to erase this and write print v1. Then I'll write time time, which is the end time, and subtract start. This is how to calculate the time it takes to run v1. We'll do the same for v2, so I'll copy what we wrote for v1 and paste and rewrite this v1 to v2. So we'll be comparing v1 and this v2 to see which runs faster. Let's run this and find out. We see the results here. v1 took 0.38 and v2 took 0.07. This confirms that v2 takes less time to run. And we haven't run our unit test for v2, so we'll run it this time with v2. We'll write this to v2. We'll run our unit test, and our results show that we passed the unit test. This confirms that our function works properly. We just created is prime v2 using square roots. I'm going to erase this section. And in this highlighted section, we use square roots. But this time, our problem is to write the code without using square roots. You might be asked this during an actual interview. This means you can't use math, so here's the solution. We'll write i equals 2, and while i times i is lesser or equal to num. And same as before, if num percent i equals 0, then we'll return false. Then i plus equals 1. If we write the code in this way, we don't need to import math. Let's test this out by running our unit test, and our results show OK, so we passed our unit test. There may be times when you're requested to write the code without using import math. The approach is the same as using import math, but how it's written is different. And if you're able to write this, that's great. We just completed creating v2, and now let's go one step further. You might be asked to create an even better code. Now we'll name our new function is prime v3. This time, let's look at our prime number graph for some hints and to figure out how to approach this. We have this row with this 2 containing numbers 2, 12, 22, and so on. Most of these numbers aren't prime numbers. The same goes for the row with 4s and also for the row with 6, 8, and 10s. We see that 28 and other even numbers with 2 being an exception aren't prime numbers. At the beginning of the code, identifying all even numbers other than 2 as being non-prime numbers, and then looking at odd numbers, will result in a faster working code. You might be asked to write a code that will take this approach in an actual interview. So how should we write the code for this? Let's do this by rewriting our code for v2. We'll say if num equals 2. This is an exception, so we'll return true. Then if num divided by 2 equals 0. If it can be divided by 2, we know the number isn't a prime number, so we return false. Most numbers will meet this condition, so it's going to return false. Moving on to our next code, we already addressed 2. So our starting number for this will be 3, and we only need to look at odd numbers, meaning we need to increase the number by 2s. For example, we'll look at 3, 5, 7, 9, and other odd numbers. I'll change this section i equals 2 to 3, then change this to increase by 2s. And I'm going to comment this out and run our unit test. Before I do, we'll look at our right section and rewrite v2 to v3 and run our unit test. And now we see that we've passed our unit test. One more thing, I'm going to comment out this section and use this bottom code and run our unit test. Our results show OK again, so we've confirmed that this code works properly. For our v3, we want to see how long it takes to run the code. So we'll rewrite this to v3, and also this too. Next, we'll switch to main.py and run our code. When we do, we get v1 as taking 0.36, v2 as 0.05, and v3 as 0.037. So v3 takes about half the amount of time compared to v2. v3 takes the time to run the odd numbers and not the even numbers, so it takes much less time to run the code. This completes our code for v3, and let's try creating one other version. This we'll name as v4. For this v4, before we start writing the code, 
let's refer to a Wikipedia page. This is Wikipedia's primality test page. Primality test is an algorithm for determining whether an input number is prime or not. Trying to understand this is difficult. So here are some of the key points. It says n is divisible by 2 or 3. If n can be divided by 2 or 3, it's not a prime number. In addition, we also check through all the numbers of the form 6k plus minus 1 lesser or greater than root n. If 6k plus minus 1 isn't divisible, it's a prime number. This is probably confusing, so here's the graph with prime numbers. We have the 6. Remember the 6k plus minus 1. So 6 minus 1 is this 5. 6 plus 1 is this 7. 5 and 7 are prime numbers. Next we have 6 times 2, which is 12. We look at 11, 13. Next is 6 times 3. 17 and 19 are prime numbers. In most cases, 6k plus minus 1 will be a prime number. But let's look at 6 times 4, which is 24. This 23 is a prime number, but this plus 1, which is 25, is not a prime number. Regarding this 25, it can be divided by 5. And when it can be divided by another number, it's not a prime number and we need to return false. Now let's look at numbers less than root n. For example, this 36. We have this 36 as n, and 6 times 6 is 36. So numbers less than root n means up to 6. 6k plus minus 1 is 5 and 7 in this case. If it can't be divided by another number, that means it's a prime number. This is probably confusing, so let's write the code for this to make it easier to understand. I'm going to write 6k plus minus 1 to remind us of the equation. Here, we're going to write the condition if it can be divisible by 2 or 3. This is the first condition we're going to check for. Then let's change our num to lesser or equal to 3. I think we're okay with this section. It's the next section that may be confusing. We want to see if the number can be divided by 5 or 7. First, let's work on the 5. 6k plus minus 1 means we need to increase by multiples of 6. At the beginning, i equals 5, so if a number can be divided by 5, we'll return false or if num percent i plus 2. If a number can be divided by this, then we'll also return false. This i is 5, so this will be 5 plus 2, which is 7. We're deciding if the number can be divided by 5 or 7 at this point. If it can be divided, then we'll return false. If it can't be divided, then we move on to the next 6k plus minus 1, which would be 6 times 2, so 12. This i will be 11, and i plus 2 will be 13. If it can be divided, then we return false. If it can be divided, then we return true. For this bottom section 2, we'll start from 5. And same as before, we'll say num percent i plus 2. We'll determine if it can be divided by this. Then this i plus 2 will be rewritten as i plus 6. Now that we've gone this far, for the unit test, We'll rewrite this to v4 and perform our unit test to see if it works properly. Our results show OK. And again, we want to test our bottom section, so we'll comment out and run our unit test. Again, our results show OK. And one last thing, we want to see how long it takes to run v4. We'll copy the statement for v3 and rewrite this to v4. We'll run main.py. When we run it, we have a speed for all versions. This confirms that v4 is the fastest running code. In this lecture, we introduced a couple different ways to approach this problem, and I hope you found it to be very helpful. First, let's go over our problem. Ramanujan is referred to as one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, and he developed this idea of the taxi cab number. And our problem this time is to write a Python program to test whether it's correct or not. Here we have the number 1729, but there's a story behind it. Ramanujan got on a taxi and the taxi cab number was 1729. The driver told Ramanujan that this number isn't that interesting, but he thought this number was fascinating. That's the beginning of this story. And this 1729, it can be written in the form of x cubed plus y cubed, and in this case, 1 cubed plus 12 cubed, but it can also be written in the form 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. Both of these solutions equal 1729. 
These two are the only possible solutions for 1729. And in addition, there's no smaller integer that can be written as the sum of two cubes. This is the beginning of the story behind 1729. This is Wikipedia's page and we'll scroll down with TA1 and TA2. We have 1729 that can be derived from 1 cubed plus 12 cubed, but also 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. A number with only two solutions in this format is this 1729 and is the smallest number meeting this criteria. Looking to our left, after this 1729 is 4104. This number can be derived from 2 cubed plus 16 cubed and 9 cubed plus 15 cubed. Both of these equal 4104. 1729 is the first one that can be picked up and is the smallest. That's why Ramanujan was fascinated by this number 1729. And this is the famous story. Let's look to our right again and we have TA3. This number refers to a number with three solutions. For example, we have this rather long number. We can get this number with 167 cubed plus 436 cubed. We see there are a total of three possible solutions. The smallest number possible with three solutions is this number. Continuing on, TA4 refers to a number with four possible solutions. And this is the smallest number with four possible solutions. This time we want to write a program that will test to see if this is really true or not. So now let's discuss what kind of code we're looking for. First, let's look to our left. For example, up here we have the equation 1729 is TA2 and it equals 1 cubed plus 12 cubed and also 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. If 1729 is the smallest of the number with two solutions, then we want our input to be 1. In our list here, we only have 1 and all solutions are stored in this tuple. If we change our input 1 into 2, then that means we also want the next number following 1729, which is 4104, along with the two possible solutions. This input 1 and input 2 are there to specify which result we want, and that's going to be our first input. Next is this 2. We have 1 cubed plus 12 cubed and also 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. And as you see here, we want the two solutions that will result in 1729. That's what this 2 is for. And at the very bottom, we have input 1 and 3. In this case, we have 1, so meaning we want the very first number, but we have 3 as our number of solutions. So that's why we'll list 167 cubed plus 436 cubed and two other number combinations. We have a total of three solutions, and these all result in this number. We want to create a function that will make this possible, and that's our problem for this lecture. So in order to do this, we'll write from typing import list. We want our output to be a tuple. Next, we'll name our function as taxi cab number. We'll write max answer num as the first part of our input, and this is an integer. Next, we'll write match answer num. That will tell us how many solutions there are. This will be an integer and there's two. For our output, we'll return a list with tuple. First will be a number like 1729. So it's an int with a set of numbers that will be cubed to make 1729. For example, if it's x cubed, then x. If it's y cubed, then y. That's how we want to return our results. Then we'll prepare a list for our results. And next will be got answer count. And at first we'll say it's zero. About this zero, this input is one and two. We have the number 1729 and the two solutions. We only need to find one number that will be 1729. And in order to count how many that will result in, we specify this as zero. Next, we'll say 1 as our answer. We want to figure out a x cubed and y cubed that will result in 1729. But the result of our calculation will start from 1. So that's why this is 1. Next, we'll run a while loop for got answer count. And at first, this will be 0. If our max answer num for our input is 1, then we'll return the loop until we're able to find 1. Next we'll say match answer count. 
For this, we want to specify as 0. On the upper right, we have 1 cubed, 12 cubed, and also 9 cubed and 10 cubed. We need to find two solutions, and this is the counter for counting this. Next, we'll write 4x in range. This x refers to the x in x cubed. Our range will be 1, and for up to, let's say for hard-coded data, 100. Next, we'll say 4y in range, and y is a number that's different from x, so we'll start from x plus 1. And just as an example, we'll choose up to 100. This is just a hard-coded value. Then for our if statement, we want to say if x cubed plus y cubed matches our answer, then match answer count plus equals 1. We want to save our x and y value, so we'll go up and include from collections. And from here, we'll import default dict. And then going down, as a memo, we'll store our list as default dict. So we've specified our memo, and how do we make use of this? We'll write at the very bottom, memo and make answer our key. Let's take 1729 as an example. The x and y combination that will result in the 1729 is added here as a tuple. And that's how we include the x and y. Next, after we exit the for loop, then we'll say if match answer count. And we want a 2 for this, so we'll say match answer num. We'll pass this in for the match answer num for our input. If we can find two of these, we can move on and say result append answer and memo which contains the x and y that's stored. We found the values for x and y, so we'll say got answer count plus equals 1, and then all we need to write is answer plus equals 1, and increase the value. For example, when our answer is 1729, we found our solution. But until we do, we'll run this while loop along with this for loop and find our match. At the end of our code, we'll return result, and that's our code. And as you see here, I specified this number as 100. And this is a hard-coded value, but you'll need to think about until what number you need to look at. Let's think about this a little more. As an example, let's say we have a cubed, and that's equal to 1,000. If we take both sides and make it to the third power, we can figure out a. The cubed and third will cancel self out, and we have a equals 10. For our problem, we have x cubed plus y cubed equals 1729. Let's think about from what range we should test x. We'll test it from 1 up to a certain number, and y will test from 2 up to a certain number. We need to figure out this shaded number or the max number. This is this 100, which I specify for my hard-coded data. And let's try to calculate what this max value should be. For example, x cubed plus y cubed is, let's say, a thousand to make it easy to calculate. Now, please forget that we even have y cubed and think we just have a zero here. I'll write zero here. So the left side will simply be x cubed. We'll take both sides and make it to the third power. Then we'll have 10 for the right side. That means x's max value will be 10. What if this x is a number like 11, then 11 cubed will be more than this 1000, so we don't need to test this 11. We only need to test from 1 up to 10. We calculate in this way to figure out this max number. So this answer here will be this 1000 in our example to the right. And this answer to the 1 third power will be used for the max number for this x and y range. Now let's get back to writing our code. We'll write max param storing in pow, then answer, then one third, meaning to the third power. Then we'll enclose this with int to make this an integer. We use the range for this section, so in order to test it to the last value, we'll add one. This is how we figure out max param. All that's left to do is the same max param for the max value for the x in range and y in range. Now we want to actually run our code. So we'll write if name, then underscore main. 
we'll print taxi cab number with parameter 1 and 2. When we run our code, we see on the right side our number 1729. This number has two solutions, 1 cubed and 12 cubed, and also 9 cubed and 10 cubed. In our print statement, we have this 1. But let's change this to 2 and run our code. When we do, we have 1729, but we also have the next number, which is 4104. We see that 1729 is the smallest number that can be expressed as the sum of two cubes. And this confirms that Ramanujan's taxicab number is correct. Now on to our next step. For input 1, 3, we have a rather big number. Let's write a code to see if we can test this too. We'll copy and paste from our previous code. We'll rewrite this to 1 and 3. And when we run this, it takes time to run our for loop. So it'll take a long time to reach this big number. We have 1 as our answer here, up above. But let's change our answer to this big number. And let me comment out of this upper print statement. And when we run this code, we see the solutions fairly quickly. The starting point for our answer is important. If we say answer is 1, it'll take a long time to return our results. So if we want to run the code for 1 and 3, changing this value for answer may be a good idea. For example, let's include another argument, just like this, and also include another parameter. For this, we'll include start answer, and this will be int equals 1. For the answer, we'll specify as start answer. And when we do make these changes and run the code, the results are quickly returned. We'll uncomment out now and run our code again. When we do, we see our results properly displayed on the right side. If you can write codes like this, that's great. And now that we've solved our problem, what did you think of it? This problem is difficult because the problem itself involves x cubed and y cubed, and that may be confusing. It's the problem itself that may be confusing for some. Once you write the code for it though, the code itself isn't that difficult. The key point here may be to use this POW to figure out how to find the max value. If you can come up with this idea, then I think you're prepared to answer this question in an actual interview. First, let's go over our problem. This time we're going to test Fermat's last theorem using Python. This is Wikipedia's page, and scrolling down, we have this equation, which is also known as the Pythagorean equation, and this equation is x squared plus y squared equals z squared. If you remember your elementary school days, you may have learned about this. If we have a triangle like this, with one side that's 3, another that's 4, then the side that's across from it will have length of 5. This relationship between the sides is what's Fermat's last theorem. For example, let's say that this 3 is x, so x equals 3, and squared would be 9. Let's say y equals 4. 4 squared is 16. We'll name this 5 as z, and when we square this 5, we get 25. This 9 and this y value of 16, when we add these together, we get 25, which is the value for z. This is Fermat's last theorem. This relationship can be expressed as x squared plus y squared is z squared. When all these values are squared, we can find an integer for these three values of x, y, and z. If x is cubed or to the fourth power or the fifth power, and also the same for the y value, and also for z, this won't work. For example, x cubed plus y cubed is z cubed doesn't work. There's no combination of integers that'll make this work. If the power is greater than 2, Fermat's last theorem is saying that it doesn't work. So from now, let's use Python to test out if this is really true or not. Let's get to writing our code. I wrote a memo here with Fermat's last theorem. First, we have the equation x squared plus y squared is z squared. When we plug in numbers, this can be 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. And also 6 squared plus 8 squared equals 10 squared. This is the kind of solutions that we want to create. In this case, 
x is 3, y is 4, and z is 5. Let's look down below, and let's skip this input, but look at this output. In this section, x is 3, y is 4, and z is 5. And for this equation, we have 6 squared here, but 6 is x, 8 is y, and z is 10. That's why we have 6, 8, 10 here. That's what we want returned as a result. And regarding this input, this input 10 means we're going to test the number up to 10 for x and y. This means that for this 3 and 4, the max number possible is 10. And the value for z, we won't know. For x and y value, we need to run the program up to the value of 10. And regarding this 2, for our input, this simply means squared. When x and y's values are each less than 10, and when these values are squared, it should equal z squared. And these are the possible solutions. Let's go down below. We have input 10 and 3. This means x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed. This won't exist, so you want to return as an empty list. The same goes for the value to the fourth power, and also for the fifth power. It should return an empty list. We'll want to write a code that will show exactly just this. So let's get started. We'll write from typing import list. Our return value will be tuple. Our function name will be Fermat Last Theorem. We'll name this as v1 since it's version 1 and start with a code that works, but that's not too great. Later on, we'll also write a version 2, which will work better. For the beginning of our input, our max number is x and y's max value. Then we'll write square num, and sorry for the incorrect spelling, this means square number. For our output, we'll return a tuple inside a list with integer values for x, y, z. This will be our function. Then for our result, we want to prepare a list. And then if square num is less than 2, like for example to the first power or negative number, I didn't discuss earlier, but in this case, we want to return an empty list. And continue on, we'll look at x and x squared. We'll say for x in range, from 1 to max number. This value will be passed in from this max num, which will be a number like 10. This is a range, so in order to test up to 10, we'll need to add 1. And in order to figure out our x value, we'll test from 1. Then we'll look at our y, we'll write for y in range. We know that x and y are not the same value, so this time we'll say x plus 1 as our start for our range, and then test up to max num plus 1. This is how we can figure out y. Next, we have z. We'll write for z in range. We know that z is a value that's different from x and y, so we can start from y plus 1. Now regarding the max value for z, let's say our max num is 10. That means the maximum value for x would be 9, so it'll be 9 squared, and for y, it'll be 10, so 10 squared, and the sum of these two is z squared. That means that after calculating the sum of this left side, in order to figure out what z is, we need to raise this z squared by the 1 half power. We'll raise by the 1 half power on this side too. Then this will cancel itself out and we can figure out z. We need to calculate the maximum value that's possible for z. And in order to do that, we'll do max num minus 1, which is this 9. This value squared plus max num squared will raise it to the 1 half power, and this becomes the max value for z. This is probably easier to understand by looking at the actual code, so let's continue writing. When we're going to figure out the max value for z, we'll say max z. And first, we have max num. We'll subtract 1 first. After this calculation, we'll square it. This is x squared. Then we'll add max num squared, which is y squared. And taking the sum of these two, all we need to do is raise it to the 1 half power. So we'll enter pow 1.0 and then divided square num. This means to raise it to the 1 half power. After that, all we need to do is make it an integer, so we'll enter int. Then we'll make our max value in our range as max z and test it out. We've written the code for figuring out x, y, and z. All we need to do is say if pow x square num, this is x squared, and we'll add 
pow y square nang, which is y squared. The sum of these two should equal pow z square nang, which is z squared. If this condition is met, we'll append result as a tuple with x, y, and z. Then all there is left to do is to return result. Now we want to see if this works properly, so we'll write if name, then main. Then our print statement. And this is our first version, so we'll enter v1. When we call this Fermat last theorem v1 function, we'll make our input 10 and our n as squared. When we run our code, we see on the right side v1, and we have the values 345 and 6810. Now let's change our input to, let's say, 20. When we run the code for this, the code is run with the criteria of x and y being less than 20. These are the possible solutions where x and y is less than 20. We've confirmed that this works with square numbers, but how about numbers cubed, for example? Let's run our code with this and we return an empty list. Let's try to the fourth power. When we return it, we also return an empty list, meaning that there are no solutions. If we change it to the fifth power, we get the same result, which is v1 and an empty list. We were able to confirm that our results match what we have here. Now that we've tested our v1, let's work on v2. For v2, we want to rewrite this section of the code regarding z. We want to remove some of the unnecessary steps here. Here, our range for z is y plus 1 up to max z, but we really don't need to start from y plus 1. If we know the values for x and y, we can figure z out. That's all we need to know. So I'm going to copy and paste a section from v1 and rewrite this to v2. And the first code we'll write is for x in range 1 up to maximum plus 1. This section is the same. For y, we'll say for y in range x plus 1 up to maximum plus 1. And now on to z. As long as we know x and y values, we can figure out z. That's why we'll say pow sum equals pow x up to square num. This is x squared. Plus next is y squared, so we have pow y up to square num. With this, we can calculate the sum of x squared and y squared. For calculating z, we'll say pow pow sum raised to the 1 half power, meaning 1.0 divided by square num. Then we make z an integer, and to make sure z is actually correct, we want to use pow and take this z and make it squared number. If this z pow is the same as pow sum, then we'll append result and include x, y, and z. And one last point. Some of you may wonder while writing the code for figuring out z, this z may be an integer, and unless it's a float, then it's already the answer, right? Well, let's look into this a little more. Let's say if not z is integer. So if z is not an integer, then we'll continue, meaning we'll continue and go to our next loop. What are we checking here? Let's say z is 5.1 or 6.3, or a number with a decimal point. These are integers, and in Fermat's last theorem, z is also an integer. When we raise this to the 1 half power, if it's a decimal point answer, then we're asking the code to go on to the next loop. That's what this continue means. Let's say z is 5.0. This is an integer, so we're saying it's okay to continue. And also, at this point here with result append, you might say we can figure out x, y, and z, and come up with our solutions. But even with this, there's a problem. Let's look at our pow for z. Let's say our square num is 6 squared or 7 squared. When we use this pow, there's a slight chance that a calculation error will occur for z. For example, this is a very exaggerated example, but let's say z is 5.0000 and so on with lots of zeros, and then ending with a 1. This z will be recognized as 5.0. This 5.0 is an integer, is what Python will think. And if we bring result append up here, this will end up being our solution, which is a problem. That's why we'll remove this result append, and we'll also remove the commented outlines. 
This is our code for V2. And one other point, when we're figuring out this power sum, we have x squared and y squared. But if we exceed the value that a program can handle, then we can't correctly calculate z. We also need to take that into consideration in our code. So for this, we'll say import sys. And going down below, after calculating pow sum, we'll say if pow sum is larger than sys max size, and this max size varies depending on whether it's 32 or 64 bit, but if this exceeds the value that a PC can handle, then we'll raise an exception. So we'll write value error. And this will return x, y, z, square num, and also let's say pow sum. So if the value exceeds what our PC can handle, then we'll throw in an exception. So this is what our completed code looks like. And all we have to do is return result and change this print statement down below to v2 and change this 5 to 2 for squared and then run our code. When we do, we see the same results for v1 and for v2. And let's also see how long it takes for each code to run. For this, we'll import time. And for our start, we'll store time, time. After v1 is done, we'll print v1, then time, then time, time, minus start. We'll confirm how long it takes for v1 to run. Then after v1 is done, we'll work on displaying the time it takes to run v2. We'll copy the lines from v1 and rewrite v1 to v2. And let's run our code again. When we do, we see that it takes 0.003 for v1, and for v2, it takes 0.0002. We were able to confirm that v2 works much faster than v1. And just in case, we'll write 4n in range from 2 to 10. We'll include this in our for loop and change this to n instead of 2. We'll test if we return an empty list for values raised up to the 10th power. When we run our code, we see that values squared return results, but after that, we see all empty lists. To sum it up, this top section of n squared return results, but when n is cubed and to the fourth and so on, we don't have any results. And with this, we can say that Fermat's last theorem is correct. This brings us to the end of our problem with Fermat's last theorem. Let's briefly review what we wrote. With v1, we figured out x, y, and z, and ran it using a for loop, on and on. And this works fine, but knowing how to write a code that runs faster, or coming up with the idea to raise an exception, or take into consideration when z isn't an integer, may set you apart from others. If you can write a code like this, then great job. First, let's go over the problem. We have here Caesar cipher. In this lecture, our problem is to write a code to create Caesar cipher and to decode the results. This Caesar cipher, as it's written here, is also known as Caesar cipher, the shift cipher, Caesar code, and it's a code that was used during the Roman era, and it's a simple code. Implementing this is also pretty easy. Now let's get into what kind of code it is. We have a visual on the right side here. For example, let's say I want to send a message A, B, C to my ally. When I shift this alphabet A three places over, then I get the alphabet D. Then next, the B will become E and C will be F. This means that we'll be sending D, E, F to the receiver of this message. The receiver will next shift back the alphabet three spaces, so shift it back to A, B, C. This is a simple code where an alphabet is shifted a certain number of positions down the alphabet, then decoded. The concept isn't that difficult. It's just a process of shifting and replacing and decoding. A decoded will be X, this B will be Y, C will be Z. Having this visual in your head may make it easier when actually writing the code for this. Now let's start writing our code. First, we import string so that we'll be able to use alphabets. Then we'll name our function Caesar cipher. For our input, we'll write text string, then integer to represent how many positions we'll shift in our alphabet. 
Then for our output will be strings. And to our results, we'll store empty character in our variable. Then we'll say for char in text and take every character and shift it. About this character, we want to differentiate between upper and lower case. First, we'll start with uppercase. We'll store our string ASCII uppercase into alphabet. Then we'll say L if char is lowered, meaning lowercase. We'll store our string lowercase in alphabet. Then we have else. If we aren't dealing with upper or lowercase, we can decode it. In that case, we'll just take that result in char and continue meaning moving on to the next loop. In this loop, we've included both upper and lower case. So in our next step, we'll be using this to shift. But before doing so, let's confirm what's been included in our alphabet so far by print. We'll say if name underscore underscore main. For now, let's input uppercase A into our Caesar cipher, then shift three. When we run the code, we see on the right side a list of uppercase letters. Next, let's change this uppercase to lowercase a. When we run the code, this time we see a list of lowercase letters. This alphabet stores all, which would be 26 alphabet characters in all. Now that we've gotten this far, the rest is simple. We're going to use alphabet index. And for example, let's say we have an alphabet A. First, we'll figure out what index number that alphabet is. Then all we have to do is add shift, meaning how many positions we need to shift. We'll store this in index and then say result plus equals alphabet index. This should work for the alphabet A. So we'll test it out by writing return result. We want to print out our results, so we'll change the bottom line here. And when we run our code, we see the alphabet D right here, which is three positions shifted from A, which is correct. But now regarding this section, this time we used A, but let's put Z. We run the code and it returns an index error saying string index out of range. This happens because shifting three alphabets from Z doesn't exist. We want the code to make another round in the alphabet for this. So how do we do this? We can do this by dividing this by len alphabet. There's 26 characters in the alphabet, but if we divide by 26 to compute the index, we'll get a remainder. That means we can make another round in the alphabet. We'll run the code and see that Z is now C. We were able to confirm that our shifting technique works well here. Now this time, let's change this Z to, let's say, attack Silicon Valley in caps and then change the lowercase on purpose and say by engineer. Let's run our code and now we see this list. This confirms that we were able to successfully shift characters in both upper and lower case. We were able to code our text. So as you see here, this is a simple code. It's very easy. So an interviewer may ask you to do something similar but without using something like string ASCII uppercase or importing string. Let's just pretend we've been asked to do so by the interviewer and try to write the code for this. This section here will comment out. And now let's think about how to approach this problem. We'll say if char is upper, we won't be using string ASCII uppercase. So instead we'll say ord then character. We're going to use the code pointer for Unicode. To this, we're going to add shift. For those of you who aren't familiar with ORD, I'm going to explain what it does. On the bottom, I've written ORD. Then let's write uppercase A. Then the result shows the Unicode code point. For uppercase A, it's 65. And now for B, when we do, we get 66. Then C, we get 67. Let's look at this further by opening up Wikipedia for a list of Unicode characters. There's a Unicode control codes chart showing the numbers we just returned. I'm going to scroll down. If you look towards the very bottom, we have ASCII and uppercase A. We have the number 65 here. We have from A all the way down to Z, which is 90. Now on to lowercase A. Lowercase A is 97. 
So as you see here, Unicode code points are listed in order. If you refer to these numbers in the same way we use index numbers, you can write the code without using the library. Right now, we have similar to above, right here, that we commented out, a line where we're adding shift, but we have word A being 65. So before we divide, like in our commented out line, we're going to subtract word A. We subtract and then divide by len alphabet, which we know is 26. We know len alphabet is 26, so we'll just go to the top and write len alphabet equals ord uppercase Z minus ord uppercase A, and then plus 1. That's the same thing as saying 26. That's why we can write len alphabet. With this, we'll return the same results as this index. We're subtracting ord A here. So we're going to add ord A to reverse it back to its initial Unicode code point. And here we'll add char to return it to a character. Then we'll write result plus equals. And about this character, for example, let's say down below char 65. When we input this Unicode code point, we now see uppercase A. So this time we're inputting the Unicode code point and replacing it with character and storing that in our result. This is the way to write the code for this situation. Next, just like before, we'll write L if char is lower, meaning lowercase. I'm just going to copy and paste from above, but this time instead of uppercase A, we want lowercase A, so we'll replace with lowercase A. Then we'll write else. For example, we may have a space. In that case, we'll simply just take that character and return as our result. Looks good, so let's run our code. To our right, we have our code that's properly written. This confirms it is possible to write the code without using string import if you're able to use Unicode code points. This may be quite useful, so if you can write the code for this, that's great. We haven't covered the decryption part, so that's what I like to work on from now. We encrypted, so I'll store this in E. Then we'll print E and then on to decrypt. So we'll say D for decrypt, then Caesar cipher. We'll take the encrypted letters, and this time instead of 3, we'll write negative 3, since we're going backwards in the alphabet. Then we'll print D. When we run the code, we see our result attack Silicon Valley by engineer. And we've now confirmed that our function here works correctly. We were able to code and decode our message. Now what we want to do is create a function for decoding. That's the second part to our problem. Let's get right to this. When we want to decode, all we need to do is calculate how many positions we shifted when we encrypted, so it shouldn't be that difficult. How do we approach this? We'll first say Caesar cipher hack, and we'll input our encrypted text, and for our output, we'll be using a generator later on, so I'll omit this section for now. First, we want to use len alphabet again, so we'll store ord uppercase C minus ord uppercase A plus 1, and that's the length of our alphabet. You don't always have to write this, and you can also write len string ASCII uppercase and also get the length of the alphabet. I'm going to write both of these here. Now we'll write for candidate shift in range from 1 to len alphabet plus 1. So this shift, do you think we should do it once or twice or how many times? This len alphabet plus 1 means we'll run this up to 26. And the shift that we performed, we'll just need to revert that. So here, we'll say reverted and store an empty variable. Then we'll say for char in text. Next, we'll say if char is upper for when the character is in uppercase, then again, we'll store string ASCII uppercase in alphabet. When the character is not uppercase, but is lowercase, then we'll now use string ASCII lowercase. And now onto our else statement. If the character is not an upper or lowercase alphabet, but another character like space, we'll put the character as is in reverted and then continue. 
After you've written this much, then we'll write alphabet index to pick up the character and shift it in the opposite direction from before. For example, let's say that a character was shifted three positions. Then we need to shift back three positions for this. We'll store this in index. Then we'll write reverted plus equals alphabet index to revert the alphabet back to the original position. But there is a possibility for index to be less than zero. In that case, we'll need to add index plus equals len alphabet. For example, let's say we have the character A. If we subtract from A, our index will be out of range. When we do have a negative number, we just add the length of alphabet and make the alphabet do move one more round. That's what these lines are for. After running these lines with a for loop, we use yield and take the number for the candidate shift and revert it and return them. Going back up now, about the number to be returned. We'll say from typing import generator tuple. We'll use this and for our output, we'll write generator. And inside the tuple, we want to return how many positions we shifted and an integer. Next would be the generator send type and return type, which is none and none. We've written all of this, so let's see what we get so far. Let's see if we can decrypt a message. Below our if, here with our line with D, we have negative three. So we're decrypting, but let's erase this section and include the value in Caesar cipher hack. This will return in a generator, so we'll say for shift num, then decrypted string will be returned. We'll run a for loop for this. Then when we print, we'll use an f string and say shift num. This will be two digits, so let's say 2d, and then decrypt it since we want to print the decrypted value. Let's run our code, and when we do, on the right side, we see all possible shift patterns. When we look at this third line here, attack silicon value by engineer, we can confirm that our decoded alphabets are included in our results. The other values don't form any words, so you can figure out that attack silicon value by engineer is the original message. If you think of all possible patterns for our output, you'll be able to easily decrypt the code. So this is our code, and just like before, there may be cases where you can't use this string, so let's do that from now. I'll comment out these sections. I'm going to comment out this entire section too. I want to use ORD again. So once again, we'll use if char is upper. Then we'll store ORD character and subtract candidate shift to store an index. And if index is less than ORD uppercase A, then index plus equals len alphabet, then reverted plus equals character index. Next, we'll say if character is lowercase, then once again, index will be ORD character, subtract by candidate shift. And if index is less than ORD lowercase a, then index plus equals len alphabet and reverted plus equals character. If the character isn't upper or lowercase, we'll say reverted plus equals character. Let's run our code again. And when we run our code, we see the same results. And we're able to figure out that our third result, attack silicon value by engineer, is the original message. The approach here that's commented out may be easier to write. But if you're asked to write the code without using strings, then it's possible to write the code in this way. Learning how to write your code like this may be useful. The problem itself is pretty easy to solve, especially if you're allowed to write it like this. But if you don't know Unicode code point, then that means you're unfamiliar with ORD and char, and you may not be able to answer the question. So this is one area that I would recommend understanding really well. Let's get right into the problem. The problem this time is to write the code for Visionaire Cipher. This is a method of encrypting alphabetic text, and if you recall, we previously went over Caesar ciphers. Decoding Caesar cipher is pretty easy. 
So think of this as a code that was created after Caesar Cipher. Here on Wikipedia, there's information on Visioneer Cipher. Let me explain more while referring to this page. Let's say we have a plain text message, attack at dawn. We want to encrypt this message. We'll use this thing called a key, in this case, lemon, lemon, le. We use this key to encrypt our plain text. I'm going to zoom in on this section. And first, let's look at this first alphabet in our plain text, which is A. To encrypt this A, we look at the first alphabet in our key, which is L. We refer to this key to figure out our first alphabet in our ciphertext, which is L. Now on to our next alphabet. We have T. The corresponding alphabet in our key is E. We use this E to come up with this X. Continuing on, we're going to encrypt this T. The corresponding alphabet in the key is M. Using this, we figure out that our ciphertext should be F. The point here is that we need to generate a key that has the same number of letters as our plain text. And that's how we're able to arrive at our cipher text. When creating this key, we use keywords such as lemon here. The letters in lemon won't match the number of letters in the plain text. So we add on the same word until the number of letters match the plain text. That's why after lemon, we have another lemon and then LE coming after it. To sum it up, we need the same number of letters in our key as our plain text in order to generate our ciphertext. We use keywords such as lemon and keep on adding on the keyword until it matches the number of letters as our plain text. Next, let's look at how A and L generates L and T and E generates X. In Wikipedia, there's a table called the Visioneer Square. I'm going to scroll up to that table and this is the table and we're going to refer to this to figure out our ciphertext. Let's go over how to use this table. For example, let's say we want to encrypt the alphabet A and our key is A. Then our ciphertext is A. Next, let's say we want to encrypt B and our key is A. Then our ciphertext will be B. If our key is B, then we get C. If our key is C, then it's D. When you look at this very closely, we see on this A line, A, B, C, D, E, F. Then when we're below, it starts from B. Going down one more row, the list starts from C. And we have C, D, E, F, G. So we see that as we go down one alphabet in our plain text, we shift one position in our alphabet. We have this list A, B, C, D, E, F up to Z. And as we go down the rows, we start from a point that's one letter shifted from before. We should be thinking about this table when writing our code for this. We have this table here and trying to memorize this table to write our code is quite difficult. So when creating our Visioneer code, we see here in Wikipedia an equation showing how Visioneer code can be expressed. This C stands for ciphertext. It's our encoded message about this I, let's say A is zero. Think of this I as index number. Thinking of it this way may be easier to understand this code. When you're trying to figure out the ciphertext, we have this M here, which stands for message, meaning our plain text. Let's say that this is A for attack. We take the index number for A, then add K to this, which stands for key. In this case, let's say key is L. We take the index number for L and add it together. And then we divide by 26 and take the remainder of that to compute our ciphertext. And regarding decrypting our ciphertext, we take the index number of the C, the ciphertext, and subtract from index number of the key, then add 26. We divide that by 26 and take the remainder to compute our original message. This may still be a little difficult to understand and memorize, so I'm going to explain further with some visuals. Let's say we have A, B, C, D, and Z. This is our original text, and let's say our key is hello, and we want to encrypt our message. If you recall, for the visionary table, we had A, B, C, D, and so on, then Z. Then at the top, we had A, B, C, D, E going horizontally. Our key is hello, so I'm going to include H and L and O here. Let's assign index numbers to our alphabet here. So we'll have 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Z is the last one, so it's 25. We'll do the same for these letters. H is 7, L is 11, and O is 14. By assigning index number to each alphabet, 
it makes it easier to understand. So let's say we have the original text, A, and we have H as our key. Let's look at the process for encrypting this. This A is assigned index number 0. We have this 0, and then this H is assigned a 7. We add these two, and our sum is 7. We divide this by 26, and our remainder is 7. We take the alphabet and figure out what the seventh letter is. And the seventh letter is H. Next up, we have B, and the key for this is E. B's index number is 1, and then E's index number is 4. 1 plus 4 is 5, so we take 5, and F is the fifth letter in the alphabet. So this will be our ciphertext for this letter. We'll repeat the same process using this C and L. C is 2, and L is 11. 2 plus 11 is 13. We divide by 26 and get remainder 13. This number is N in the alphabet. And next, we have D and L. D is 3 and L is 11. 3 plus 11 is 14. And 14th letter in the alphabet is O. Last, we have Z and O. Z has an index number of 25 in the alphabet and O is 14. The sum is 39. We take this number and divide by the letters in the alphabet, which is 26, and take the remainder. So this will be 13. 13th letter of the alphabet is N. So we'll write our ciphertext letters here. It's H, F, N, O, N. We're done encrypting our letters. And the equation for encrypting, if you recall, M, I plus K, I, then mod 26. Now let's look at when we want to decrypt. For an example, let's take this F. F's index number is 5. We take this 5 and subtract the keys, in this case the E's index number, which is 4. We divide by 26 and our remainder is 1, so it's B. Now how about this Z? N is 13. But before that, let's review our equation for this. It's CI minus KI plus 26, then mod 26. This 13 will be placed for this CI. The equation will be 13 subtracted by KI, which is this 14. 13 minus 14 is negative 1. We add 26 to this, which is 25. 25 mod 26 gives us this 25, which is Z. When we decrypt, the equation is this. These letters, think of them as index numbers rather than letters in an alphabet. And this will make it easier to write the code for this. All we have left to do is to write the code for this, so let's get started. For this, I have opened two interactive terminals, visionaire.py and main.py. I have two just to make it easier to understand. And if you prefer, it's fine to do this in just one. First, we import string. This time, we want to store string ASCII uppercase in alphabet. We can include lowercase letters too, but just to make it visually easier to follow the code, we'll use only uppercase letters for this. Next, we'll name our function generate key. When we have a message, we need to create a key that has the same number of letters as our message. Our keyword can be lemon or hello world or just about anything. This keyword will have to be repeated to match the number of letters as our message. We're going to make our message simple. So this is just an example. We're going to say our message is A, B, C, D, E, F. Our keyword will be cat, C-A-T. To match our message, we have to have one more set of C-A-T. We're going to be writing the code for this section from now. In the end, we're going to be storing our keyword in key. It's like inputting our keyword cat as our key. Then we'll write remain length and say that we'll store len message minus len keyword. Then for i in range, remain length. And all we have to do now is write key plus equals and key i. We'll return key and that's all there is to it. Let's do this in our main terminal. We'll write from visioneer import generate key. Then if underscore underscore name, then main. We'll write generate key, then input the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, and our keyword cat. We want this to be printed out, so we'll write print and run our code. When we run our code, we see on the bottom C-A-T-C-A-T. -A -T -C -A -T. 
we were able to display our key that's the same number of lengths as our six letter message here. This generate key function works, and now we'll move on to our next function, which is encrypt. Our message is a text string, and our key is also a string. Our output is going to be an encrypted text string. We'll prepare a variable for our result, and we want to run our message using a for loop. We're going to take our index number and our character and say in enumerate and pass in our message. And onto our next line, if character is not in the alphabet, like a space, we'll just return that as is and then continue. In our example on Wikipedia, our message didn't include any spaces. In our code here, we've included how characters that aren't included in the alphabet should be left as is without encrypting. Now we're going to be working on the equation that we just went over. We'll say alphabet index and retrieve the index number of the letter. Then we add the index number of the letter used as our key. We take the sum and divide by the length of the alphabet, which is 26. We just divide and then we store this in index. This index will be our result. So we just say result plus equals alphabet index. That's all there is to it. Then at the end, we return our result. Let's actually encrypt our message from now. For example, let's say our T is attack Silicon Valley. Then down below, we'll insert T. Our keyword can be anything, but let's say hello. Then we'll store this in K for key. We'll encrypt with what we just created now. We'll import encrypt and we want to store what we encrypted in E. So we'll say T and K. Then we want to print E. Let's run our code now. When we run our code, we get an encrypted message down below. And now let's decrypt. I'm going to scroll down and create some space. We'll name our function for this decrypt. Our argument will be cipher text, which will be a string. Then include key, which will be a string. Our output will be a string. And just like before, we'll write result. Then for i char in enumerate cipher text. And just like before, I'm going to copy from above and paste the lines down below. When we have spaces, we're not going to decrypt, but leave as is. Then we'll say index. And just like before, we're going to follow the equation that we went over. We'll say alphabet index char. This time alphabet index key i. If you recall, this difference may be a negative number like when we looked at z. So we add len alphabet, then divide by len alphabet. The remainder is our index and therefore result plus equals alphabet index. This is all that's needed for decrypting. So now we'll return results. And let's go to our right side, main.py. And now we'll say from visionaire import decrypt. After we import this, we'll say D for decrypt. We'll write decrypt and E for encrypted text and We'll pass in K for key. We'll print D and run our code. When we do, we see below our encrypted letters and attack Silicon Valley. We've confirmed that our decrypted letters are properly displayed. We've confirmed that both our encrypt and decrypt functions work properly. The important lines in our code are these two lines. If you can understand how the equation should be written in our code, then it won't be too difficult writing down the code for this Virginia cipher. I'm going to comment out of these two lines, and let's say that an interviewer asks you to create the Virginia cipher using Unicode code points. Let's work on this problem from now. We covered how to answer this question in my previous lecture for Caesar cipher, so I'm just going to quickly write the code for this. First, we have our message i. We'll make this our code point, and then we add the index number for key to this. We calculate the sum and divide by len alphabet. With this, we can figure out the index number of the alphabet. So all we need to do is add 
or A. Since we're starting off with the alphabet A, this will be our character. So we enclose this with character, then say result plus equals. And now let's run this. Running the code, we see that we were able to encrypt. Right now we completed encrypting our message, and now let's rewrite the code for decrypting. We'll also say ORD cipher text I and subtract ORD key I. We'll add len alphabet. Then we'll enclose this and divide len alphabet to compute the remainder. The remainder will be the index number. So to make this a Unicode code point, we add ORD A to say that we're going to start from uppercase A. We'll enclose this with character. Then all we have to do is add result plus equals. Now let's run our code for this. After running our code, we see that we were able to decrypt and encrypt. If you can write codes like this, then you should be good with your interview question. The code itself for a Visioneer cipher isn't extremely difficult. The function for generate key and encrypt. As long as you remember the key points like this line, it should be okay. And for decrypt, understanding how to write this section is the key. If you can understand the algorithm and explanation covered on Wikipedia, it will make it much easier to write the code using Python. The important thing is to understand algorithm and how the ciphers are coded and the concept behind how the ciphers work. Also as a side note, for this, I created a function. We created three functions here, but instead you could create a class method. You could create a class and inside that, you could use method for this. Instead of generate key, you could call it by naming it self generate key. The important thing is to write codes like this that's easy for you to understand and learn from it. In this lecture, we'll be looking into Enigma machines. Our problem will be to write a code to implement this machine. This may come up in interviews for software engineering, and this will also check how solid you are at object-oriented programming. That's what this Enigma machine problem for this lecture will test you on. And here's the Enigma machine we'll be coding on the right. An enigma refers to something that is mysterious or hard to figure out. And this machine was originally used by the German army to send confidential messages to each other during World War II. And this machine will take any message that you type in, then encrypt each message and print it out. In this lecture, we'll not only be encrypting, but also decrypting the message. And Wikipedia explains several aspects of this machine structure, but understanding all of this might be a little difficult. So instead, I summarize this into a visual on a PowerPoint. So let's check that out from now. On the left here is a photo of an actual Enigma machine. And as you see here, there's a keyboard section towards the front. Let's say we type the letter A using this keyboard here. The letter A will be encrypted into a different letter like D, causing the letter D to light up on this light board here. The keyboard portion here is called the plug board. And above here, I have rotor one, rotor two, rotor three written. This represents the contraception here, which contains three rotors containing the letters of the alphabet. These rotors are located right here on the top. To its left, we have something called a reflector, which is represented by this green box here. So how does the machine encrypt the letter A that we typed in into D? The A that I typed here will be this A on the plug board. And this letter A will be changed to B. The machine is wired to be able to switch up the letters freely, like changing A to B or changing this B to A, and so on, like switching C to D and D to C. So we can freely change from one letter to another, like C to A. We can wire this plug board to work in this pattern of letter changing, which would create one instance of message encrypting. For example, if we encrypted A to show up as B, if that is the case, we would have to decrypt B to return to its original letter A. However, this encryption from A to B and decrypting from B to A is quite simple, making it easily memorizable by enemies. That's why by using rotor 1, rotor 2, and rotor 3, 
we're making the encryption much more complex. So the process behind our encryption is first, our A becomes B, then transitions over to the B on this rotor, which has another wire system to change the letter value. So we change B to C, then C to D, and then D to A. Now we move over to this reflector here, which will cause our A to exit as B. And as it makes this returning path, B becomes C, then B, then C. Looping around here, the letter outputted will be D. When decrypting this, we set up the same rotor system. So when you type D, it will return back the blue path, then come back through the orange path and be outputted as A. So now D is decrypted into A. If you change the wiring of the plug board too often, it's difficult to try to decrypt it every time. So it's generally recommended to change the wiring once a day. So changing the wiring once a day or so is what's most common. And here we have rotor one, rotor two, and rotor three. And we have this combination of pairs that you change for rotor one. These combinations are specific to rotor one, while rotor two will have an entirely different combination. And then looking to the right, we have rotor three, and this will also have a different combination. We currently have three rotors in total, but you could have five rotors. And let's say today you're gonna to put rotor one here, and then rotor two here. But on a different day, you switch rotor five in rotor two's place, enabling us to change the combination of rotors each time. So in this visual containing rotor one, two, and three, we can always change the combination and order of these rotors. So even if rotor one, rotor two, and rotor three were stolen, it would still be difficult to decrypt our messages. And to the right, we have reflector. And just as the word implies, this is supposed to reflect letters. Let's say A is directly reflected back as A. The A did not go through encryption. So if A comes in by outputting the A as B, we can ensure the letter to be encrypted or decrypted while being reflected back the path. In this case, I made A and B the opposite pairs, but we can pair A and C and also B and D just to switch things up in the reflector. So regarding this reflector, you can freely create the letter combinations. We already encrypted our letters with quite a complex combination of paths, but in Enigma machines, these rotors here can also rotate. So you might be wondering, when do these rotators rotate? If I type A into the plug board, this rotor three here can rotate to make A move down here, making A here, and then B here, C here, and D come to the very top. We shift one letter. And in this case, we only shifted our letters once, but if you change the offset to two, once you type A, A will be shifted down two spaces, which would mean to the C position. So the number of spaces you shifted can be changed easily. Once rotor three rotated a full cycle, we now rotate rotor two a single space. So this is how the rotors work. When rotor three rotates a full cycle and rotor two ends up gradually rotating a full cycle, when rotor two is done with the full cycle, we now shift rotor one a single space. So every time you type, the rotor will rotate, making the encryption even more complex. Moving to the next slide, we'll transform to a situation where this A located in rotor three has shifted one space down. Moving on to our next slide, A is now located here, and B is located here, C is here, and D is up here. Although the wiring system on the inside doesn't change, for this inputted letter down here, previously the path connected to this letter stretched all the way up. Now in rotor three, the bottom letter is connected to B. For example, I type in A for the second time, and let's trace the path for this. A is inputted, then change to B, and following this orange path, we reflect over C and D, and goes back down the blue path. Once we've returned all the way, we come back to D, and our final destination being the letter C. Going back to the last slide, in the last slide when I inputted A, our returning value was D. When we type in the same A in our second try, referring back to our next slide, now our returning value is the letter C. Even if we typed in A twice, it doesn't mean the letter will be encrypted into the same letter, making our encryption quite complex. We'll be moving on to creating this encryption using Python, but it might be hard to process jumping straight into the code, so I'll be showing you another visual first. 
So this is just an image to help you approach implementing our machine into Python. For example, here we have our plug board, which will be considered an entire class object. The rotor 1, rotor 2, and rotor 3 up above will also be created with a class object, and reflectors will also be created with a class object. Then all of these class objects will be put into Enigma machine, another class object. So please think of our class object, Enigma machine, containing all these other class objects. And another thing, when changing up the letters, for example, B to C, we'll be using the method name forward. Forwarding refers to moving from the left side to the right side. And then when we're changing from A back to D, we use the method name called backward. So try to visualize that as we create our code. And another thing, the words index zero and index one relate to situations like with our A and rotor one when transferring it over to rotor two. If you use the letter A, you can't use the letter A because rotor 1 or rotor 2 might already have gone through a rotation. So when you express that the letter is at the top, we refer to index 0, like in Python lists. When transferring letters to the right, we pass in the index number of the letter to maintain the accuracy of our program. This is the approach we want to take. When we want to rotate our rotors, here we have rotate offset equals 3. And in rotor 3, we have rotate offset 1. When offset is 1, it means that we are shifting our letters down one space. As for this offset equals 2, when we have offset 2 for rotor 2, this A here will be shifted down two spaces. So try to visualize this process when seeing the term offset in our code. On the very right is our reflector. For example, A will reflect back to B by using a reflect method. And another thing to note, when forwarding or backwarding, I have a dictionary created here on the left. I'll be using a dictionary to keep track of the letter change through key values. For example, for rotor 1, let's input index 1. Rotor A's current list is in the order of A, B, C, D. This is what's included in rotor 1. We have this listed here on the left as a list. So index 1 of this list would be B. And when we forward B, B becomes C, which is recorded in this dictionary here, named forward. Now we can easily know that B should become C. We can easily figure out what a certain letter should be changed to. When backwarding, we input index 0, and the index number of this A can be confirmed in this list here. This is A here in our list. When we backward A, we'll go down here and see that A should be changed to this D here. And we see here on rotor 1 this D here. So the backwarding and forwarding can be organized with a dictionary like these on the left, which is what is implemented on Rotor 1. And also these plug boards are programmed with the same ideology, so effectively using dictionaries and index numbers will allow us to shift to the next letter smoothly. Hopefully you can visualize this as we move into our next step. Now you may begin coding using the hints I just provided. And in just a moment, I'll be reviewing the code I came up with. Now let's return to the code portion of our video. So here I created two files, enigma.py and main.py. To make this easier to see, I'll separate the code for the Enigma machine to be here and to the right where I'll be testing out the code in main. So feel free to change this format if you prefer maintaining a single file or if you want a separate file for every class object. This format is just what is the easiest to look at for me. Anyways, now let's go ahead and start coding. We'll exit from Project Explorer and jump right into the code for enigma.py. To make it easier to visualize, I'll have this visual accessible as we write our code. We have our plug board on the bottom here. First, let's start with creating this plug board using our code. First, we'll import string and then we'll have alphabet. We'll be storing this into a global variable as string ASCII uppercase and use it many times. Next, we create a new class called plugboard. So we'll write class plugboard and adding in object. We don't need this detail in Python 3, but style guides like Google Pep 8 often recommend adding this as default. So although we added object in here, Python 3 users can skip this step. Now we put death in it self, passing in map alphabet as a parameter. For example, for our ordered alphabet, A, B, C, D, we'll be switching A to B. 
and this B to A. This parameter lets us refer to the letter being switched in. In the plug board, we first need our own alphabet string, which will just be storing the standard one inside our global variable. Next, in self forward math, we put in a default empty dictionary. And in backward map, we put in an empty dictionary as well. Now we have these empty dictionaries, and next we want to start mapping this map alphabet. But before we do that, we create a separate method called mapping passing in map alphabet. And let's say that this map alphabet contained a string like B, A, D, and C. While our self alphabet stores the standard order of A, B, C, D. We want to make it so that when A comes in, we switch to B, and when B comes in, switch to A. So how will we do this? We'll do this by inside self forward map, we store it in as a dict, iterating with zip, which we go through self alphabet, and map alphabet. And as a result in the dictionary, A is paired with a value B, and next, the B key is paired with value A. And as you can see here, we made these two strings into a dictionary, making key A value B, key B value A, and this is done through our code here. This is a little small, but the mapping for four shown here is implemented through our code here. So here next, we put self mapping, passing in map alphabet. And we just finished mapping forward, but we also need to create a version where B is the key and A is the value. So in other words, a backward version. We're gonna create self backward map. We're still using a dictionary, but this time we retrieve a key value pair with four maps item, iterating it with four key value except reversing its order. Now the backward mapping in the opposite direction is complete. Now we want to call our code in main, bringing main to the right using split. And to call our functions on a plugboard instance, we first import plugboard from Enigma. So that's what we're going to do. From Enigma, import plugboard. Now we put if name underscore underscore main and inside we put plug board, passing in the letters B, A, D, C, setting it to plug board to initialize as a new object. Now we print plug board forward map and also plug board backward map. So I'm going to rewrite this to backward and let's try running our code with this. And when we do, we see the pairs below. For forward mapping A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C. The backwards mapping or the reverse version has the following result, which confirms that our code is working properly. Our code is working fine, so now we want to add another method, which is mapping forwards using index numbers. We'll call this function forward, and first we take the index num of self alphabet, taking each character from our own alphabet string. So let's include char at the beginning here. And now we need to forward the characters. So we put self forward map char, which allows us to retrieve each char we are changing. Now we return self alphabet, passing in the index by using the index function on char. First, we retrieve the value based on the index number, change the value, then return the index of the value that was changed. We're using the same process for the backwards version. So we're going to create that by copying and pasting these lines and changing the name to backward. We change this line here to backward map and our function is all set. And now let's return to main, first importing alphabet and erasing these lines of code. This time on our plug board, we're calling forward, passing in not the alphabet letter, but the index of our letter A, which is zero. This zero will be an encrypted index. So that's what we'll write and we store that value into encrypted index. We also want to see what character our A changes into. So we print the value at the encrypted index of alphabet. Now we're going to write decrypted since we now want to decrypt the characters. The index number of the encrypted version of alphabet will be expressed by plug board backward passing in the encrypted text. Now we print the value by passing decrypted. Let's see what's going to be printed with this. For our results, 
we get B, then A. The character A using our forward function was encrypted, and now the new value B was printed through this line here. That's why B is printed here. To decrypt B, we change the character back to its original by calling plugboard backward and storing the value at that index into decrypted. So that value is printed as A. Now going back to our visual, we have plugboard here at the bottom, and we just performed the plugboard's forward and backward feature using index numbers, so we're done creating the plugboard portion of our machine. Now we're going to move on to creating rotors like this rotor 1 and rotor 2 into our code. So now let's open up some space for our new code, starting from this line here. We'll create a new rotor class. And since we want to use our forward and backward function from plugboard, rotor will inherit the plugboard class. And starting with death in itself, we pass in map alphabet and offset, which will be a parameter representing how many spaces we're shifting the characters. First, we put super, initializing with map alphabet. We're going to initialize with this and going a little up, Inheriting the lines and plugboard here, we just initialize these three variables, including forward and backward. And going back to our rotor class, we save self offset as offset. Then self rotations will be initialized to zero, which will tell us how many spaces we shifted so far. That's the purpose of creating this attribute. And next, we're adding a method called rotate. And for this, our default offset value will be set as none. And if not offset, we set offset to self offset, the value we just initialized to. And now we have self alphabet set to self alphabet so that we can rotate its value. Let's say our offset is 1. This offset here will be 1, so we iterate from index 1 to the end of the front. And after that, we iterate from the first value of self alphabet, which would be A to our index number and offset. We place this in the back and that's how we created the rotation. Now we'll put self rotations plus equals offset, then return self rotations, which will tell us how much we rotated. So this is the kind of method we want to create. And now when decrypting this, we want to return to the rotor's original value so we set self rotations back to zero again, returning self alphabet back to alphabet as well. So this method returns all the values to pre-rotation. Let's look back at our visual to check what we've created so far. So we just created this rotor one here. This visual is a little small, so let me zoom in. And we just created this rotor one here. And now what we want to do is try calling our rotor one code from main. So copying and pasting this code down here, we have plugboard written here, but this time we're working on rotor. So let's change this plugboard into rotor. So first we're going to import rotor, and then down below we're going to change this plugboard to rotor, and also change this plugboard into rotor. Let's comment out these lines for now. And let's change all of these lines below to reference our rotor. So I'm going to replace this plugboard to rotor and rotor. And now running the code, our rotor inherits the plugboard. So we get B and A, the same results as before. Since we added a rotate method, after we run this code, let's call rotor rotate to shift our rotor. After we rotate, we're running the exact same code here to see what happened. And now running the code, we get the results B, A, B, A, showing that none of our values changed even after rotating. The default offset value of rotate is zero. So you can see here, when initializing, let's try setting offset to one. And let's try running our code again. Now when the letters are first encrypted, we get B, which is decrypted to A. Next, when we encrypt the same letter A, we get Z. So after our rotation, our letter A is encrypted to a different letter as pre-rotation. So now the rotor portion of our code is complete. And next, we'll be working on creating our reflector, as shown here on the visual on the right. Getting back to our code, we're going to write under the code for our rotor. So let's open up some space here and start our code around here. 
we're going to start with class reflector object, creating a new class. And as usual, we're going to start writing with death init self. We pass in map alphabet. And for this, we don't need to map forward or backward in our reflector. So we simply put self map, setting it to dict and passing in zip with alphabet and map alphabet. And regarding making a map, let's look at our visual. And looking at this visual, we see this A and B. The pair can be A, C, and also A and D. If D, then D and A. In any case, the path it takes to come and return must be exactly the same. They must be in pairs, and we'll try this in our code along with some error handling. What does this mean? We'll put for x, y in self map, calling for items. This is how we'll bring all x and y's. And inside, if x does not exist in self map y, in this case, we raise a value error, returning x and y. This might have been confusing, so let's go ahead and on the right, we'll import our reflector in main. So we're going to add reflector after rotor and comment out this portion of code. On the bottom, we create a reflector and passing in A, B, C, D. If we switched A with B, we get B, A. And switching C with D, we get D, C. Now let's run our code. And when we do, we get a result with no errors. However, in the next line this time, let's say we switched A with B, but on top of that, we change this B to D and then change this to B. Commenting out the line above, now let's run what we have. And now we get an error raised since A and D are not paired correctly. What this means is, let's uncomment this line, and the original alphabet order would be A, B, C, D. If A and D are paired together, the letter corresponding to D here must be A, not C, or else our reflecting path won't work. So this error will tell us whether our letters are paired properly or not. And now that we got our error check set up, I'm going to close this bottom screen. We're adding another method called reflect, which will also be based off of index numbers. Once we've written that, in reflected char, we'll store self map, then this time alphabet index num, and this will retrieve our alphabet value. For example, let's say this index num is 0. Alphabet 0 will be A. The letter paired with A will become the value of reflected char. So if A was paired with B, it'll be B. Now we return alphabet index reflected char, which will return the index of B. Again, this might make more sense referencing the visual. In our reflector here on the right, if the index of the number of A comes in, the index number of its corresponding pair, B, will be returned. So our code just made sure that will happen. And now let's check if our reflector is working properly. So let's set our reflector up as R. And for the contents, let's change this to B, A, D, C. Now we'll call R reflect, passing in alphabet index A which will return the chart A's index of 0. Its corresponding pair is B, so B's index number should be returned. So let's print the letter by printing alphabet's index of I. Running the code now, we get our letter B. So B, the correct corresponding pair of A, was returned through this line. Here, A and B are swapped to become BA. But now let's try putting C in here. We'll change this to C. And we're going to run the code. The corresponding pair of C, D, is returned. We are done creating our reflector here, which means we have finished making our plugboard, rotor, and reflector so far. Now all we need to do is to make our Enigma Machine class, which is where all of our objects so far are put into. So let's begin creating our Enigma Machine in this space here. We'll start off by putting class Enigma Machine as an object. And let's close off main for now to reference our visual as we code. I'm going to keep the visual on the right here to make this easier to understand. So starting off with death init self. 
and in our parameters, we pass in our plugboard, rotors, and reflector, so the three class objects we just made. In self plugboard, we just store our plugboard. Self rotors, we pass in our rotors, which will be in the form of a list. And in our self reflectors, we store our reflector. First off, we put def encrypt, which will pass in some kind of text like ABC, for example. After the text goes in, we'll just be going through our machine like so, and then returning back to our plug board. So underneath encrypt, we make a method named go through, which accepts a single character. And for now, let's make this pass. Now we're going to go back to encrypt, and this time we're going to call self go through on each character in text. So we pass in C, putting for C in list text. Using go through, we're encrypting each character through the machine and bringing it back to our method. Ultimately, we return and join all of this encrypted text. This is what we want to do. And calling encrypt passing in some text like ABC or hello world, the characters will be passed into here. This is what we've created so far, and now we're going to begin writing in the code for our go through. Let's say the character A was passed in. We are calling char upper to change that character into an uppercase. Next, if this char does not exist in the alphabet, for example, let's say it's a space, we just return a space in that case. So no need to encrypt characters that aren't in the alphabet. Now we put in alphabet index, and say a is passed in as char. We want to take the index of a, so we put index num in front. First off, we have this a, and we need to forward a and change it to b. So using this index number, we call self plugboard forward, passing in index num to save our new index number. So here we would have saved the index number of b. Now we pass this into rotor 1, and then rotor 2, then rotor 3, changing the value each time. So here we put 4 rotor in self rotors, which would be these 3 rotors we passed in as parameters. Taking each of those rotors, we call forward, passing in index num, updating the value of index num each time. In our example here, we have three rotors in total. So this will be allowing us to retrieve the index number coming out of the third rotor, which is stored in this index num. Once that's done, next will be our reflector. So we put self reflector reflect, passing in index num. The method will return the index of the reflecting pair. So in this visual, the index will change from the index in orange to blue. Now we need to go back through rotors three, two, and one. We need to go back through these, so we'll put four rotor in, this time the reverse version of self rotors. And then from the back, we're now backwarding it, so we'll call rotor backward on index num, changing the value of index num each time. And we just backwarded three times from the back, so we're currently at this index number. Now we'll put self plugboard backward, passing in index num, saving this index into index num. We just reached this A on our keyboard, so we return this character by putting alphabet index num, storing it, and returning char. Now all we need to do is return the encrypted result back to the caller. From here, we'll use go through. And for example, we'll use the character A. It's now able to go through the machine, turning into C. But now we need to look at rotor 3. We want to shift the offset of rotor 3. And we'll do that by coding below here. We'll put for rotor in reverse, passing in self rotors. We'll write like this. And if rotor rotate, returning a value for how much we rotated, is not divisible by len alphabet. If that is the case, then we'll break. And regarding our reverse self rotors, our four loop starts from this rotor three on the back. This is where we start. We rotate rotor three here, and the first rotation will return 
one here. One is not divisible by the length of our alphabet, 26, so we break in this case. So now we shift rotor 3 whatever value of offset we are at and wait for the next input. If rotor 3 finishes a full cycle from A to Z, this if statement wouldn't run. So we move on to the next rotor, which is rotor 2, and call rotor rotate. So once rotor 3 makes one full cycle, rotor 2 increases by 1, and after rotor 3 makes multiple cycles, rotor 2 will make a full cycle, and then rotor 1 will shift one offset down. So shifting values from the back rotor is what this for loop is in charge of. When encrypt is called, we use go through to change the character and return that value here. Since our encrypt method is finished, we're now moving into decrypting. Here we'll put death decrypt self, again passing in text. Before decrypting anything, we always need to reset the rotors into its original position. So for this, iterating through the rotors, we put rotor reset, resetting all rotors to their initial position. Now we just run go through with the following code here. This decrypting might seem confusing at first. Looking at our visual, for instance, having A change to B, go through the full process and returning as C will fully encrypt A. But when decrypting this, we use the same rotor positions and this time pass in C, decrypting it back to A. By putting the rotors in the same exact position and same number of rotations, passing in the character from the other side will decrypt it back to the original character. So this line is using go through to this time decrypt the character back to what it was. We just completed our Enigma machine class, so let's call it back in main. And let me bring it back to the right, and let's get started. We'll erase all our previous codes. And for this, we're using the random module, so let's import random. After we import random, first off is our plug board. Here we want to put random letters of the alphabet. So up here, we'll put get random alphabet. This time, we'll just be using lambda. And here we'll use our join method, joining random sample that passes in our alphabet with the number of letters in the alphabet. And once we pass this in, for 26 iterations, a random letter from alphabet will be picked out, which is what we're putting in here. Next, we'll put get random alphabet here and run the code, creating a plug board out of that. We'll save this plug board as P. And just for clarity, let's print the contents of get random alphabet here. Running the code, we get a random combination of the alphabet picked out containing 26 letters. We save this to make our new plug board. And next will be our rotors. In R1, we store a rotor passing in our get random alphabet. The offset value of our first rotor will be set to 3. Next is rotor 2, and for rotor 2, let's set the offset to 2. For rotor 3 on the very right, let's set the offset to 1. Now we're finished setting up all three rotors. Our next task is reflectors. May seem a little complicated. In R, let's store a list with the alphabet. This will be the alphabet we're using for our reflector. But first we need to get all of its indexes. To do that, we put I for I in range len alphabet. Let's try printing indexes. So running the code, we get the indexes of all the letters in the alphabet here. We now want to take each pair of index numbers and swap their values. To do that, we put 4 in range. We'll write that here. And to retrieve each pair, we put len indexes divided by 2. And that's all we need to do. We'll change this to an int. And this for loop will run 13 times, which is half the length of the alphabet. To take out the alphabet letter we want to swap from indexes we pop out random rand int, passing in 0, and len indexes minus 1. This pulls out one index inside indexes, saving it into x. Let's do the same thing with variable y now. And let's print x and y to check with later, 
to make it easier to understand. And now let's run what we have. When we run our code, we get 20 and 2, 8 and 11, 10 and 16, and so on. We'd be swapping the corresponding letters of these indexes in order to create our reflector. So we were able to retrieve x and y here. So our reflector's x value and our reflector's y value will be swapped to y and x. So this will be written like so. Now in our reflector, we set up join r, saving this to reflector. So we'll write reflector, and now our reflector is complete. In case this join r was confusing, let's try printing join r and run the code. And below we see the string of characters that we set up into the reflector. Now that all objects in our Enigma machine are complete, let's put machine here. First, importing Enigma machine at the top. So we'll include Enigma machine here. We'll set this up as Enigma machine, passing in first our plug board, and then our rotor one, two, and three as a list. And finally, our reflector. We now created our machine, so now we have to create a string that we want to encrypt. For example, let's say we want to encrypt the message attack Silicon Valley. Let's say this is the message that we want to encrypt, and then in machine encrypt, we pass in S. To simplify, let's save this as E for encrypt and print E. Now, this will allow us to see what string attack Silicon Valley was encrypted into. Let's get rid of the extra print statements here, and let's run the code. When we do run the code, now attack Silicon Valley is encrypted into this string here. Now, let's try decrypting the string. For this, we're going to call machine decrypt, passing in our encrypted code, and then after that, printing D. Running our code, the top line is the encrypted string, and the bottom is our decrypted string. Our message attack Silicon Valley is correctly printed, which proves that the Enigma machine that we coded is working properly. Now that our code works properly, let's review our code one more time. You can see that it's not too complex. At the top, we made our plugboard class, creating a dictionary for mapping that allowed us to create the methods for forward and backward. In our rotor class next, we inherited map alphabet. Here, for demonstration purposes, I set this to zero, but to always shift values as a default setting, this to something like one might be better. And next, we have our rotate method. If you wanted to set offset to zero, we would have to change this to if offset is none. You can set it so the method can run on its own when offset is, say, two as well. And next, we have our reset, which resets the values back to its original position. So this part is not that difficult. For our reflector class then, we just made a method to return the reflected character. And the Enigma machine class constructed these fields, setting up the encrypt and decrypt methods to pass in our text as a parameter. The go through method might be our main problem for this lecture, as it might be the hardest to understand. If you're able to visualize this visual, and think and have an object-oriented mindset, you should be able to write this code without too much trouble, I hope. And whether it's in our head or written out, how you structure this, think in an object-oriented way and implement this into Python will be a big part of solving this smoothly. The different methods you use to implement this will be the key. So instead of coding this Enigma machine in a single chunk from top to bottom, Looking at this visual to the right and deciphering what parts will be brought in as a class object while you code will make the job of writing this code much easier. Let's get right into this lecture. So this Tower of Hanoi. I think some people have heard of this mathematical puzzle. And in this lecture, we're going to be solving this Tower of Hanoi using Python. To the right, you see a picture of a model set of the Tower of Hanoi. And it might be hard to get a clear image of how this puzzle works just by looking at this picture. So I've prepared the actual Tower of Hanoi, and I'd like to explain what it's all about and how to solve it while using my set. I purchased this for a little over $10. So you see all the disks in one tower here. 
and you want to move all the disks to the other tower. When you do this, you can't move multiple disks all at once. The rule is you can only move one disk at a time. When you move the disk, let's say you move this yellow here. Then you move the orange here. And then next you have this red. The red disk is bigger than this yellow. A bigger disk can be placed on top of a smaller disk. That's another rule. So this kind of move is not allowed. What you need to do is first move this yellow over here and then move the red disk. Then you have the green, but can't move it to another tower, so you place the yellow on top of the green, and then move the orange to the middle, then the yellow to the middle, and green over here. When you attempt this using all the disks, it's hard to understand. So first, let's remove these bottom disks and start off with these three disks. Our goal is to move these three disks to this tower. When we do this, we move the yellow to a different tower. And then move the orange, then yellow, then the red. Then move back the yellow, move the orange, then move the yellow. This is how to solve this puzzle. And when you want to move the three towers to a specific tower, it's easy to do. For example, let's say you bring the yellow disc here to the middle. When you do that, you'll be able to move the three discs all to this tower. So let's try it. First, we move the yellow, then the orange, then the yellow on top of the orange, then the red, then the yellow, then orange, then the yellow. And now you see that we have all three discs in the middle. We have three towers, and you can easily move all three discs to a tower of your choice. I'm just going to grab the three discs all at once just to explain, but you can easily specify which tower you want all your three discs to end up in. You can control in what tower your disc will end up in is one important concept to remember. Now let's add one more disc and try to solve the puzzle. When we want to solve this puzzle, we need to bring the discs, including the green, over to this tower. To be able to move this green over to this tower, the three upper discs need to go to the middle. Then we can move the green over here and I'm just going to grab all three discs at once instead of showing you each step. But if you move these discs on top of the green, then you've solved the puzzle. Now let's add the purple. So let's move back the green and the three other discs. We're now going to start from here. This time we need to bring the purple to this tower. That means that all the other discs here need to come to the middle. Then this purple can move to this tower. So we focus on moving the green and smaller disc to this tower. And in order to move this green disc to the middle here, these three smaller discs need to come to this tower. If we bring these three discs here, then we can place the green here, and then place the three on top of the green, then bring the purple here. That's how to solve this puzzle. Next, we want to bring all these discs on top of the purple. The green here is at the bottom. To bring the green here, the smaller three need to be placed here. Then we can bring the green here, and then the top three here. Problem solved. Now we're going to use all the discs, and start off with all the discs here. In this case, how do you approach this problem? Let's say we want to bring the bottom disc to this tower. That means we want to bring all the other discs to the middle. Then we'll be able to move the black over here. To move this blue on top of the black, we need all the discs on top of the blue to be placed in this tower. Then you'll be able to move this blue. So repeating this process, we want to move the green here. So you bring the disc smaller than the green to the middle, then move the green here. We repeat this process and hopefully right now you're thinking this can be done using Recursion in Python. I hope this explanation and visual was useful and I'm going to bring all the disks over to this tower. And here are some pointers. It might be easier to understand using just four disks, so I'll remove these other disks. When you want to bring this green disk to this tower over here, the upper three disks need to temporarily be placed in the middle tower, like so. So now we need to think, how do we bring these three disks to the center? That means that we want the red to land in the middle. 
That means the upper two need to move to this side. That's how you need to think. And I'm going to move back these discs, but when you want to bring the orange to this tower, you'll just need to bring the yellow here. I'm going to show you how to solve it right now. The red comes to the middle, the yellow here, then the orange, then the yellow, then the green over here. And next the yellow, the orange, the yellow, the red, the yellow, the orange, and then the yellow. So you've got all your discs in this tower. Now that you've gotten a visual of how this puzzle can be solved, I hope this makes it easier to write the code for this. We're going to get into writing the code, and first we'll start off by writing death Hanoi, and then number of discs. If we're working with three discs, then we'll write three as a parameter. Then regarding our source, we want to make this a string. What does this mean? For example, let's say our first tower is A, then the middle one is B, and then the next one is C. Let's say you want to move all the discs from A to C. That's how to visualize this, and regarding the source, we'll input an alphabet like A. Then next is going to be des for destination. We'll write string for this since we'll input an alphabet like C. Next to our middle tower. To make this easy to understand, we'll name it center for now. We'll change it later though, but for now let's write center and that will also be a string. We want to call this function using recursion. So first we'll say if the disk is smaller than one, we want to simply return. Next we'll write print, then f string, since we want to see how it moves. We'll write move disk from source to dest for destination. With what we have now, we want to run the code, so we'll say if name main, then enter Hanoi. We'll just use one disk for now, and we start off this disk at tower A, and we want to move it to tower C. We don't have to use center for this, but we'll write B and run the code. When we run the code, we see on the right, move disk one from a to C. When we only have one disk, just this code will end the process, so this is fine. Next, let's look at when we have two disks instead of one. What do we do when we have two disks? I'll write the code for this here. Again, we'll recursively call Hanoi. For this example, we'll change this to two at the bottom and then go up and say Hanoi disk minus one. Then now, source center, meaning bring it from the source to center, then our destination. We'll be using the destination temporarily, but for now, don't worry about this. So when we have two disks, this disk minus one means one. This one disk will move from A to B. After this move is completed, then we bring the second disk to the destination. And then we'll say Hanoi disk minus one, which means one we're going to bring it from center to C, or our destination. We'll also write source. When we run this code, then we see on the right side, first, move disk one from A to B. I have the visual for this. So we're bringing this top disk from A to B. Then for our next step, we move two from A to C. We bring the orange to C. Then we move one from B to C, meaning we bring this yellow to the destination, which is C. This is a solution to this puzzle when we have two discs. With just this amount of code, we can solve the puzzle for this Tower of Hanoi. Looks pretty simple. And now onto three discs. We change this to three and run the code. We see on the right side the solution to this puzzle. Now let's change this to four discs instead of three. We see on the right, explanation with the moves that need to be taken to solve this puzzle. It may be difficult to understand this code, so let's get into this further. For this explanation, I'm going to change this back to 3 and run the code again. We see on the right side the solution to the puzzle. Let's look at the actual Tower of Hanoi. So I have three discs here, and we want to bring the third disc, the red one, to Tower C. 
To do that, we need to somehow bring the upper two discs to the middle. The red disc move is shown on this line. We have print F move disc 3 from A to C. So looking to the right, we have move 3 from A to C. This part represents this move. So before we do this move, we first need to move the upper two discs from here to the middle tower, which is B. That's this top section here. Our source is A, this is A. When we're going to move this from A to B, we need to use our destination to bring these discs to center. That's the way to think about this. And after you bring this and run this section, this red is able to move over here. We have Hanoi disc minus one, so these two discs can move from B to C, which is the source. This is the way to think when you're trying to solve this problem. So I'm going to repeat the steps one more time. We start from the beginning. So we have three discs from source to destination. To bring the red over here to the C, we need to bring the upper two to the middle. At this time, we're recursively calling these two discs from this Hanoi line, which is right here. This disc minus one, which is two, we are recursively calling this with this Hanoi. So this time this orange disc is this move two from A to B, which is right here. When we're calling, we're saying for the disc to move to the middle. So this movement of the orange moving to the middle is shown in this section. At this time, disc one is in the way so we bring disc one from C to B here. Before moving the orange, we move the yellow, disc one here. Then we move our disc two. Then we're saying for this disc one to move back from C to B, like so. And that's gonna be this section on the right. Then to our next move, move three from A to C. So our third disc, which is the red, moves from A to C. You might still think that this is confusing with this explanation. So I would recommend doing this Tower of Hanoi yourself and making sure you understand each move. If you don't have the actual puzzle, then drawing the puzzle on paper to understand how recursion works with this puzzle may be helpful. Now let's look at our code in more detail. On the top line here, you wrote center, but that may not always be the case. So let's replace the word center with the word support. If you can write a code like this, that's great. The code itself is short and simple, but if you don't understand recursion, this can be confusing. If you're not too familiar with recursion, then please review this section and become familiar with it. During an actual interview, Let's say you're not able to write this recursion code. If you're not familiar with this Tower of Hanoi, writing the code for this using recursion is quite difficult. So the interview may explain what Tower of Hanoi is and show you a code like this. And then you may be asked the question, after we run this code, what will our result look like? The interviewer may say, let's say we input three and want to move from A to C using B. This is the code for this. But what will happen when we run the code? We have the results on the right side, but you may be asked to write these moves on a whiteboard. I'd like you to actually try this. Let's close our solution. When we have three A, C, B, it may be confusing to figure out where to start. This is another possible question format that an interviewer may ask. So when you have this code, I think it would be a good idea to practice actually writing the printed out results on a piece of paper by hand. And I hope this helps with your understanding of recursion. Let's do a little more. We have this Tower of Hanoi code, but instead of printing it out, you may be asked to create a list. When you have this Hanoi function, instead of printing out, let's try to place it in a list from now. First, I'm going to copy this top section and paste it. Then we're going to name our function, get Hanoi movement. For our output, we want a list and inside the list, 
we want to return with tuples. So we'll say from typing import list, then tuple. We'll import this and place it at the top. For this list, we want to include tuple. And for our tuple, we want the disk number to appear first, then the source and destination will be our output. That's our function name. We'll return a list for our result and this function here. We can create it using an inner function. So I copy this from above, but I'll include an underscore here, meaning it's an inner function. And in place of this print statement, we'll say result append disk source and destination. And inside this function, we're going to write Hanoi calling disk source destination and the support. Then we'll return our results. We want to call the function. So this time we'll be saying get Hanoi movement. Now let's make the disk four and have the disk move from A to C using B. The results will be displayed in a list. So we're going to say for R and print R. When we run the code, we see the results in tuples like so. If the results don't appear the way you want it to appear using print, then you can use this result or use the yield statement in a generator. If you can write your code like this, then great job. For example, let's change this to a global variable. So I'm going to comment this out. In this case, this result will be a global variable and can be rewritten. So this Hanoi function is fine, but making this result into an inner function so that it can't be rewritten by other codes. And within this inner function, use recursion to loop. If you write your code this way, this will work well. You do have the option to use class, but if you want to use this code as is and put it in your result, then not using a global variable, but creating a function like this. And within the function, using the result to generate result and return result may work best. First, let's go over our problem. This time on the upper right side, we have this triangle. This triangle is Pascal's triangle. And we want to write a code that will let us print out this triangle. First, let me discuss the concept behind Pascal's triangle. We have a row of ones on the left and right side. Now let's focus on this two in the middle here. Two is displayed here because we took this one and one and added them together. That's why we have this two here. The number in between is the sum of the two numbers above it. And now going down one row, we take the sum of one and two, which is three. And that's why three is displayed here. Let's look at the number one row below. We have one and three, that makes four. And then three plus three equals six. So that's why it's displayed here. Three and one makes four. So that's why we have a four here. For example, we have a four here. This is a four because we have this three and one. But what if it's a number like this one where it's the most right number and it only has one number above it? In that case, we don't add, but simply take the number from above. The same goes for the left side. We look at this one, but it doesn't have any number to the upper left. In that case, we simply take this one from above. Now that we've covered the concept, how do we approach this problem? We'll think about how to create this triangular shape later. For now, first you see that we have this one on the top. This is one list. We create another list for the second row. And then for the third row, we create another list. We're going to create a list for each row. Now looking at our triangle from the top, we have one number for the top row. For the second row, we have two numbers. Then we have three and four. So as we go down the rows, the number of values increase. With this information, we can, for example, create a list displaying the number of values. For the first list, we have just a one. For the second list, we have a one and a one. For the third list, we're going to initialize and say one, one, and one for now. And now to the fourth row, we're going to say one, 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 and one. For now, we're going to initialize the row by inputting all ones. And then our next step is to enclose this in a nested list. 
Once we've done that, going back to our first list, this will be assigned at zero for its index number. And going down our list, we have a one, two, and three for the index numbers. So you see that we've assigned numbers to our lists. And once again, looking at our top list, this one stays as is. For the second row, we have a one and one, and that's fine as is. Now to index number two. For this one, i equals zero, i equals one, and i equals two. These are the index numbers. We'll skip the i equals zero and look at when i equals one. We want to access the two numbers from above. The index number for these are zero and one. So at this time, when we take this index number two and subtract one, we can access this list. And next, if we take this i equals one and subtract one, we can access this index number zero. Then if we take this i equals one and make no change, we can add these two numbers and rewrite this to two. This last number is not in between two numbers, so we can skip. Let's look at index number three. Just like before, we'll write out our index numbers. So zero, one, two, three. We don't need to look at index numbers zero and three. Let's look at this i equals one value. Just like before, we'll take this three and subtract one to look at this index number two. We have the values one, two, one. This value here is i equals one, so if we subtract one, we can access this one. If we use i equals one as is, then we access this two. We add this one and two and get three, so we rewrite this to three. Next, we have this i equals two. If we take this i equals two and subtract one, we can access this two. If we use i equals two as is, then we access this one. Two plus one is three, so we rewrite this to three as well. That's the way to approach this problem. Now that we've discussed the problem and understand the concept behind it, let's get to writing our code. First, we'll start off with from typing import list. Then we'll name our function. So we'll write death generate Pascal triangle. And now to our argument. We see here in our pyramid to the right that we have one, two, three, four, and so on for the number of rows. We need to input how many rows we need. For this, we'll say depth and input as integers when we call our function. And then for our output, as we mentioned before, we're going to be using a nested list, so we're going to have a list inside a list. Our list is going to contain integers, so we'll write int, and this is going to be our output. Then in our next line, we'll say data. We want to prepare the section for our nested list where we initialize using one. First, we'll write the outer part of our nested list. We're going to create a list with input as one. For example, for our first row, one is fine. Then for our second row, we have two ones. We increase the number of values by one, so we multiply by i plus one, and then say for i in range, depth. For example, let's say that depth is five. In that case, at the beginning, this i equals zero. So zero plus one is one, so we're only going to make a list with one, one. Then in our next for loop, this i will be one, so one plus one is two, meaning we'll make two of these ones. This may be difficult to understand, so let's print data to first look at what we have. We'll say if name, and then main, like we always do, then the function name, generate Pascal triangle. Let's use five for this example. Then on our right side, we see our results. We see one, one, two ones, and then three ones. This confirms that we were successfully able to initialize. Let's delete this print statement and move on. Now we're going to focus on these lists and we're going to start looking at this list with three ones. First, we're going to say for line in range and look at index number two and then say depth. We're going to be looking at this from this list here, which is index number two. After we execute the for loop, we'll say for i in range and we'll run this from one up to line. Right now, line is two. So the range is from one to two. Referring to this list to the right, think of this comma as index number one. From index number one to two means we'll only be processing this middle part. And as we mentioned before, we do this by first taking the data line minus one and access the data that's one row above. 
then say i minus 1 and add the value i that's on line minus 1. That's how we process it. Then we take this and replace this into data line i. Now that we've gotten this far, let's write return data and print out the data we get. Let's include 4r, which stands for result, and then in, and then say print r and run our code. We have our results to the right. Let's look at the index number 2 list. The sum of this 1 and 1 is 2, and 2 and 1 added is this 3. We are able to confirm that the numbers for our Pascal's triangle is correctly printed. The list we created looks fine. We're done with that part. And now we have to display these numbers in a triangular shape. We'll do this by writing def print Pascal and say a list of integers that we created as our data. Our output will be none. And now we're going to focus on the intersection. First, we're going to say for index, then line in enumerate. We're going to use enumerate to run our data. Let's run this with what we have so far. So we'll say print line, and we're going to take this print r and rewrite this to print Pascal and pass in the results of this. Let's run our code now. And now we see on the right side our results. It looks the same as before. And now that we confirmed that, this line includes integers. So now we're going to use list comprehension and say for i in line and make this a string. So we'll say str_i. After we create a string, we'll use the join method to combine elements of the list and run the code. When we run the code, we see the values displayed as a string. That looks good, but the values are all connected together without any spaces. Looking at our code, when we're creating a string, we're going to use a method called center. As an example, let's input 6 as our hard-coded value for our space and fill the remaining with spaces. Let's see what this does. When we run this, we see to our right that we have spaces in between our values. When we want to display this one, we have six designated for our center. So that means we have six characters and in the middle, we have this one. After this one is placed, we're asking it to fill the remaining with spaces. We have spaces here, but let's change this to asterisk to make it easier to look at. We ran the code and we see asterisk in between our values. Using this center method makes it possible to display a correctly shaped triangle. We just completed including spaces. Now we're going to move on and look at how all the ones here are lined up vertically. The further up in our list, the leading one needs to be located in the middle. Let's get to writing the code for this. For example, we just created this join function. Let's store this in numbers for now. And then this 6. Let's change this to width. And then up above, write a line for storing 6 in width as our hard-coded value. Then write print. We want to include spaces in the beginning of our strings. And here we're going to say multiply int width divided by 2. This width may become other numbers like 7, but for now, let's make this integer and multiply len data. For example, let's say we have a data with 5 lists, and then we're going to subtract index. This index here we got from renumerate, so at the beginning this will be 0. Then this will be 5 minus 0, and this becomes 5. Then this part will be 6 divided by 2, which is 3. That means we'll be creating 15 spaces. After we complete this, then we pass in numbers. Let's run our code with what we have so far. And as you see on our right side, our results appear in a correctly shaped triangle. Let's go over what we just created. You see here that we're using 6 characters. For the next number, we're also using 6 characters. If we want to display our number right in between two numbers, we have to shift the number 3 spaces, since 6 divided by 2 is 3. This is this section here, int with divided by 2. This is how you get 3. And we take that and multiply by len data minus index. The further up we go in our rows, we need more spaces. So this would be 5 minus 0, 
phi minus 1, and so on. As the index increases, the number of spaces decreases. Then we display our numbers, so that's how we're able to properly display our triangle. In this example, I specify the width as 6. But let's say our Pascal's triangle is much bigger, and we're dealing with numbers that are bigger than 6 digits long. Then we have a problem. So let's drastically change our width. Before changing that, let's first change this 5 to an 8. When we run our code, we see numbers that are 2 digits. What we need to do is find the value with the greatest number of digits and then include spaces to the left and right of the number to determine the value for our width. To include this step, we'll say max digit. And how do we approach this? We'll say data minus 1. This is the last row, and the max value will appear in this row. Using max, we'll retrieve the max number, and to see what we have so far, let's print max digit. When we run our code, we see 35 here. 35 is the max number in this triangle. We're going to take this and create a string, and then compute the length of it. Let's run our code again, and now we see 2, meaning that this max number is 2 digits long. And now let's change this width, that's 6, to max digit plus 2, and run our code to see what we get. Looking at our results on our right, we have a triangle that looks fine. But let's change our 8 here to a 10. When we run our code, we now have numbers that are 3 digits long. Because of this 126, you're getting a triangle that's a little longer on the right. That's because here, where width divided by 2, we're taking an odd number and dividing by 2, which results in a remainder. That's why we're shifting a space as we change rows. For the width for this string, we want to make it an even number. For example, let's say our max digit is 3. 3 plus 2 is 5. When this is 5, we have a problem when dividing by 2. To avoid this, we want to make this a 6. We'll do that by including max digit divided by 2. We're going to take the remainder and then adding it to get an even number. If max digit were an even number, then this would be 0. In that case, we'll just add two spaces. If max digit is a 3 or an odd number, then this would be 1. Then this max digit is a 3, and then plus 1, plus 2 would result in an even number. That's how we solve this issue. So if you rewrite this line to what we have here and run the code, we see we have a 3 digit number, but our triangle is properly displayed. This is our code, and if you're able to write your code like this, that's great. This Pascal's triangle problem, when you look at it the first time, your first impression may be that it looks difficult. If you look at each row as a list though, you don't need to be writing a long code, just this. And when you want to display your results in this particular shape, you need to be careful with the spacing and the shape. Using this string and center method works great for this. This method is one that's very useful. So please review this code and try writing this yourself. First, let's go over the problem. This problem is very similar to Pascal's triangle. First, for our input, we have 5 and 20. This 5 is asking you to prepare a triangle with 5 lines. This 20 that's next to 5 means that the number should be randomly selected, but the maximum value of integer should be 20. Any number equal to or less than 20 is allowed for making this triangle. Now let's look at the output. We have this list. This is the first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and fifth row. The numbers are randomly arranged and are all equal to or less than 20. We have a list like this, and next our first row contains 7, which is this. For our second row, it's 6 and 3. That's why we need the 6 and 3 in our second row of our pyramid. We need to do the same for the other list and create a pyramid. Then at the very bottom, we have min path equals 12. How did we get this 12? In order to understand this, we'll look at our very first row. We see that 7 is at the very top. Then one row below, we have 6 and 3. We want to take the path that results in a minimum value. Instead of choosing the path with 6, the path with 3 is smaller, so 7 plus 3 is 10. 
we do the same with the row below. From the 3, we have the option to take 0 or 15. Then going down, we go to the 0, and then go through the 1, and then the 1. So it's 7 plus 3 equals 10, 10 plus 0 equals 10, 10 plus 1 equals 11, 11 plus 1 equals 12. So the min path is 12. That's our answer. If we take a different path, for example, 7, 6, 6, 4, and 6, then that results in a value bigger than 12. So this path will not result in a min path. And when I started off with 7 and had the option to take either 6 or 3, if I had taken 6 and that resulted in a min path, then the code should be choosing that path. So the point is not to choose the lesser value in a row, but I think there are many paths possible, but we want to figure out the path where the sum will result in the smallest number. We want to look at all the paths and figure out the min path. That's our goal with this problem. Now let's move on to writing our code. First, we'll start off with from typing import list. We want to generate a list. So we'll write generate triangle list. We want our list to include depth using integers and the maximum number to be generated also as an integer. Our return value is a list, including a list of integers. So that defines our function. Then we can write this in one line. But we're going to write return. Then using list comprehension, first we're going to import random. Then include random randint. Then say 0 to max num. And we're going to generate the numbers here. Then 4 in range. Let's say you want to do this 10 times. Then random numbers will be inputted 10 times. And depending on the row, the number of times will differ. So we'll say i. Then we'll recursively call with 4i in range. Then from the first row up to depth. If depth is 5, then plus 1 will be 6. Then we can run this for range 1 through 5. So this is fine. We want to see how this all works. So we'll write main to see our results and we'll print generate triangle list and input 5 and 20. We'll run our code and we see 5 rows worth in our list. 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. We've confirmed that this generate function is working properly. Now we want to create the section where we arrange the numbers in this triangular shape. The code for this is the same code introduced in our previous problem, so I'll make the explanation brief. We'll print triangle, we'll put data, and it's going to be a list with a list containing integers. Then our return value is going to be print, so none. Then we'll write max digit. We have this list here, and we want to retrieve the max number. Last time we knew that the number in the bottom row contained the max number, but this time we don't know in what row the max number is. It could be in any of these rows. In this generate triangle list, we have max num. So we know what the max num is, but let's go over this to understand how to figure out the max num. We'll use list comprehension and look at the numbers inside the list. We look at the first row and 7 is the biggest, then the second row and 6 is the biggest. We'll look at each row separately. First, with list comprehension, we'll write max l for l in data. We'll look at each row to figure out the max for each row. For now, let's write print max digit and then data so we can input what we retrieve into data, then print data. After displaying the list from above, we'll pass in the data from triangle and run the code. So let's run our code. And when we do that, we see on the upper right, we have one number, which is this four. Then we have 20 for the second row. 20 is bigger, so we have 20 here. As you see here for all rows, the max number from each row is displayed here. Then we'll enclose this with max and we'll be able to pull out this max number 20. Let's run the code to confirm. And we see 20 is displayed here. Now we'll enclose this with string. And once that's done, we'll enclose this with len and be able to figure out the max number of digits. Let's run it and we see the number 2. This means that we're going to use this 2 to display our output in a triangular shape. This section is no different from last time. We're going to first say max digit plus max digit divided by 2. 
If this is an odd number, we want to make it an even number. We're going to make the width an even number. Then say for index, line in enumerate to retrieve the data. Next, we'll say numbers and make the numbers into a string. By using join, we'll get each number and then say center. Then width, then space to fill in the remaining space. Then for I in line to position the number in its appropriate space, then we'll print and the more we go up in our triangle, we need to fill in more space. So we'll say int width divided by two, then multiply by length data minus index. This will make it possible to include space the further up you go in the list. Then add numbers. When we run this, we see on the right that after our list of numbers here, our triangle is displayed properly. Next, we want to figure out the min path. We want to create a function for this. So this section is the main portion of this algorithm problem. I'm going to make some space for writing this code. And this section is the main portion of this algorithm problem. First, we'll say def sum min path and make our function this name. First, this will be triangle and it will be a list with a list containing integers. This is a min path, so the return value is also integers. This is how we create our function. So how do we approach this task? In the beginning, I showed you an example like this, but using these numbers, I want to explain a little more from now. So I'm going to scroll down to an empty space so I can explain. And referring back to our example, the top value was seven. Then it was six and three. Our list looked like this, and continuing on, we have the third row with 6, 0, and 15. I want to explain using these three rows. We have a list containing these three lists. The index number for each row will be 0, 1, 2. And within these rows, we have index number 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2. Within the rows, we also have index numbers. Then we want to figure out the path that will result in the minimum sum. But there are many possibilities like 766, 760, 730, 7315, 730. There are many paths possible, and we're going to make a tree showing the sum of the paths. So on the right side, we're going to make another tree. The first row for this tree is 7, and it's good as is. In the next row, while we're making the tree, we're going to take the sum of 7 and 6. At this time, when the index changes from 0 to 1, when i equals 0, there's only a number, this 7 right here, that's located on the upper right. So we'll do 6 plus 7, which is 13. Next, we look at when index number is i equals 1. At this time too, there's only one number located on the upper left. So simply 7 plus 3, which is 10. Just like this, you create a tree where you add the sums. Next, we're moving on to the next row. When we're looking at i equals 0, there's only a number located on the upper right. So in this case, the line number is 2. We subtract 1, and when i equals 0, looking at line 1 for i equals 0, the sum of this number is 13. So we have 13 here, and what we do is add this 6 to 13 and we get 19. Let's skip the middle section for now and look at the right side. When looking at the second line, the last index is i equals 2. At this time, we take this i equals 2, which is 2 minus 1 from the upper line, which will be this 3. We'll take the sum of this, so we'll take 10 and add 15, which is going to be 25. Then we're going to look at the middle number. There are numbers both to the upper left and upper right. The upper left is 6, the upper right is 3. When accessing these numbers, we calculate by doing line number minus 1. And for this, i equals 1. When we do 1 minus 1, we get to the upper left. i as is would be this upper right number. We have access to both the 6 and 3. At this time, we have the sum of numbers in our tree, which is this 13 and 10. 
At this time, we want to take the lesser amount, so in this case, the 10, and add it. When we do that, we'll get 10 plus 0, which is 10. We'll do the same for 3, for index number 3. We have 4, 20, 1, and 8. Then, for the tree on our right side, we have 19 plus 4, which is 23. Then for the right side, we take the sum up to this 15, which is 25, then add 8. So we do 25 plus 8, which is 33. Now we're going to look at the middle too. At this time, when we look at the left side, it's 20. We take the upper left and upper right number from 20, so it's 19 and 10. 10 is smaller, so we do 20 plus 10, which is 30. Then we have this one. The numbers to the upper left and upper right are 10 and 25. 10 is smaller, so we do 10 plus 1, and that results in 11. At the very end, we're going to choose the number that's the smallest from this bottom list. So looking at this fourth row, the smallest number is this 11. So the sum of the numbers in the min path is 11. This is the approach that should be taken. And now that we've discussed the concept behind this, let's start writing the code. Let's go back to where we were with our function sum min path. First, we have this list for our triangle. We're going to make a copy of this list with the name tree sum, which refers to the tree with the sums of the numbers, which we discussed just a little while ago. We're going to use a while loop and create separate lines. For the lines, we're going to refer to this as j, and say len triangle. We're going to put 1 and len triangle into this. And if not len triangle, if it's empty, we want to return none because that's one possibility. So up here in this from typing section, we're going to say optional. And scrolling down to the bottom, we're going to say either return none or integer. Now let's continue on with our code. First, when the line is smaller than our len triangle is the situation we're going to look at. And during this, we're looking at the values inside it. First, we're going to say line and then the number j in our triangle. If j is 0, then this. If it's 1, then this. If 2, then this. We don't have to do this for the first line. So we're going to start off with j equals 1. This will be the index number 1 or the second line. We're going to start looking from here. Now we're going to say line path sum. Later on, the sum of the numbers will be created on the right side, and we want to specify what kind of numbers will be put in for this. So that's why we have the line path sum. And now to line. We want to take out each number, so we'll use enumerate, and first say index number i, and the value. Next, we'll say if i is 0. Looking at the right side, we're going to start looking from index number 1. So that'll be this line with 11. At this time, there's only a number located to the upper right. So we'll say line i, which is this 11, and the sum of the number in the 0 spot for this tree sum j minus 1. Tree sum is what we copy from here. And j1 means 1 before this j, which refers to this 20. And that's in the 0 spot, so that's this 20. For now, we'll say some value here. Then we'll use elif, and when i is at the last spot, len line minus 1. In this case, this refers to this 7. At this time, the sum value is line i plus tree sum j minus 1 i minus 1. For the second line, we have i equals 0 and 1. If we do 1 minus 1, it's 0. So it's the upper left. When we're at the most right side, like here, and want to figure out the upper left, we need this tree sum j minus 1 i minus 1. And regarding this top index, this if statement is fine. But when we're at the third row, we have a middle value. What do we have to do when we want to work on this middle value of 15? 
So we refer to this 15 as a value that's neither the most left or most right. And if you recall, we're going to take the sum of the 11 or 7 from our tree sum. For this, we'll write min path, and then first min tree sum j minus 1, which is the sum of the values one row above it, and also i minus 1. And then tree sum j minus 1, or the value one row above it, and we're looking at the value i. We're going to take the smaller of the sum of the values. After min path, we're going to say sum value line i plus min path. Then we move on to line path sum. We're going to append and write sum value. We have this line path sum and we added the values that we computed here one by one. Once this for loop is done, then we take the value j for tree sum and replace it with the sums. So we'll write line path sum. After that, we say j plus equals one to move on to the next line. Let's see how this all works out. So we'll write print tree sum and print it. Moving down, we're going to pass in data to sum min path and then run the code. When we run it at the very bottom, we have five. That's the first row. Then we have eight and seven in our next row. This five and three added is this eight and five and two is this seven. Same goes for the third row. We have 0, 4, 2 here. And when we add the sum of the values in the upper row, that's what's displayed here. When we continue on with this up until the last row, then our list that's displayed last contains the min path. And now we have this tree sum. We're referring to the very last one, so we'll write minus 1. And we want to figure out the minimum value of the last list, so we'll enclose with min. We'll replace the print with return and last we'll scroll down and say print min path equals sum min path data. Now that we've done that, let's run our code and see what we get. And now on the right side, we see min path equals 36. This 20 may not be the greatest example, so let's change our max number to 9. We run the code and we get min path equals 8. That's this 2, 2, 1, and 1, and 2 added, which is a total of 8. We see that the min path is correctly displayed. This approach is similar to the approach we took for Pascal's triangle. If we put the numbers in a list, then we'll be able to create a triangle and also figure out the min path with a code such as with this. So practice writing codes like this and see you in the next lecture. This brings us to the end of this course. We covered a lot of information in this course. If you feel some parts were confusing or want a refresher, please go back and review the lecture again. Now that you're at the end of the course, you might feel some of the content introduced at the beginning of the course is easy to understand. And I hope that's the case. Since we're at the end of the course, I want to show you some parts of Silicon Valley, specifically San Francisco, which is where many of the high-tech companies are located. This is Jun Sakai showing you around San Francisco, which is where his office is located. He's talking Japanese, so I'll be translating what he says in English. That building is Salesforce, and I think I'm gonna head over in that direction. I'll introduce some other companies while on my way heading to Salesforce. So that building that you see over there is Slack. I think I want to get a little closer to it. So this is Slack's office. Slack's office is a glass building and it looks really cool. It's about seven stories tall and has some kind of large hall or meeting room on the top. I'm going to cross the street and get closer to Slack's office. On the left-hand side, you can see NASDAQ. So this is Slack's lobby area. I can't go in. And this is Slack's logo. So this is Slack, 
and I want to show you something else next. So now I am right below Salesforce building. It's like this. Look how high it is. I'm going to get closer and go right below it. So now I'm right below Salesforce's building. This is the famous blue cloud logo. This is Salesforce's office building. But you see the buildings around here, they also are owned by Salesforce. Can you see the blue cloud logo right over there? That one too is Salesforce. So around here, there's many people who work for Salesforce. I've actually been to the very top of this Salesforce building. A former colleague of mine used to work here, so that's why I was able to get in. You're free to bring in guests to the very top. And you can see great views of San Francisco from the top. So if you're ever in the San Francisco area, it's a great place to visit. Here in this building, there's Zillow and WeWork. It's a pretty building. And there's WeWork's logo. It's a pretty nice building. This is JP Morgan's building. I'm right below it, so it sort of looks like this, but it looks very contemporary. And across the street, here is the big accounting firm, Deloitte. This is Deloitte's office building. It's a very big building. It says right over there, Deloitte. I hope you can see it. And in front of it, there's some kind of design, architectural design. So this isn't an office building, but this is Market Street. This is a big street in San Francisco, and many tourists come here. You don't see too many tourists today because it's a weekday. I'm gonna show you around Market Street too. So there are many offices along Market Street. When I first started working in the Silicon Valley, I worked for a company that was located in that building. It was a startup and I used to work in that building. Now I'm working in a different place. I wanna show you more, so I'm gonna walk a little more. So the light signal changed, so I'm gonna cross. You see bicyclists like this just zipping by. That's McDonald's. And as you see, streets are busy with cars too. And in front, there's Ghirardelli chocolates. I think you can buy these at Costco in Japan. These chocolates are famous here too. So next, I think I want to show you LinkedIn or some other office. So I'm gonna walk around. This is another famous accounting firm, and it's called KPMG. This building is also very tall, as you can see. So in front of me, it's sort of like a hill. It's very like San Francisco. If you go straight, you'll see LinkedIn. So I think I'm gonna go over there. So this is LinkedIn. Can you see their logo? It's an I-N. I'd like to head over there from now. I think I wanna get closer so I can see LinkedIn from right down below. You can see their logo right there. As I've already mentioned in this course, algorithm is useful to anyone from candidates applying for a position for an IT job and for engineers who are already working on IT projects. Thank you for taking the time to take this course, and I hope this course provided you with the motivation and knowledge you need for your career and learning. You have lifetime access to this course, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.